What's up, everybody? Oh, hopefully you can still hear it. There we go. How are we doing? How are we doing? How are we feeling? I'm feeling good. Uh, the first thing, first thing, you guys know, generally, I do the, the, the just chatting, the yap, 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 <laughs> do the housekeeping before we actually start the, the stream, the critical role, all that. So, housekeeping, first thing, <laughs> is that starting effectively, we are moving housekeeping. <laughs> Because I'm a VOD frog, I don't watch a lot of people live, I just watch the product after the fact, and I'll tell you, sometimes, especially with more clickbaity titles, I can't tell what the fuck a stream is about. <laughs> sometimes. I can't tell if I'm gonna wanna watch it. And so, I think, from now on, for the retention of it all... I'm going to jump pretty immediately into comment review, takeaways, that sort of stuff. Pretty quickly, like right after we, we go live. And then, uh, and then after the ad, after the, after the on the hour ad, we'll, we'll do maybe more of the, <laughs> more of the chat and more of the yap and, uh, <laughs> And, and, uh, and that way, you know, more people are in when we do that sort of thing. Um, so, with that in mind, first things first, let's do, let's talk comments. If I can pull it up, I can't pull it up, it's already open. Because <laughs> I'm a smart and intelligent boy. Uh, let's see. Okay, so, first things first, first comment. That's tough to admit. Actually, it's not that tough to admit, but people like to say that this sort of thing is tough to admit, so I'm gonna say it. <laughs> I was wrong. I was wrong. You've all convinced me. Unironically. <laughs> uh, A-R-O. I believe that PC death being a factor that the players have some influence over, but which also feels out of their control as a deliberate design choice. It's a, it's a choice that I like, but I could see some tables wanting to have more control. I think at this table, especially with Liam's real life situation, the topic of death sometimes feeling out of control was intentional. Which I absolutely believe from the bottom was, was intentional. Um, but... I very distinctly said that I, I wouldn't do it at my table. I didn't like it. Blah, 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 blah. We've had a lot of conversation about that. And I'll say, I think at least on the control front, I think I've kind of been convinced that I like the lack of control more. I said that I was, you know, in favor of more of like a... You know, they make these offerings, it auto-succeeds, and then they roll to see, like, you know, if the offering disappears or not. Basically, that there's a risk in losing the offering, not a risk in if the uh, offering works or not. And once we, once we kind of got down to it, once we started talking uh, more explicitly about the control aspects and, and themes, the more I started to think that I actually do like <laughs> the lack of control. Like, specifically for death. Even though I run a, a, a game where I, I consider the players having a high degree of control to be a generally uh, beneficial thing towards the rest of how I DM, and it, it, it's certainly part of my tone. Um, where, you know, they have a lot of control, they have a lot of awareness, uh, and then I can present very complex and difficult puzzles to them, um, that I might not be able to present if things were more vague or more ambiguous or if they had less control. But, the more I thought about it, for death, specifically, even within my tone, 
I think that it fits. I think the idea, and and I almost think that it's, I don't want to say uh, more interesting, but it's something that I'm I'm really, the more I think about it, the more attracted I am to the idea and how it would fit into my tone and my games of life is very, you know, controlled. When, when you're dealing with life, when you're dealing with people, with challenges, with the environment, it's controlled. You know what you're going to get. You know how the world is going to react to you. It is a very... Um, it, it, it's it's a it's a very controlled environment and death is not like i i actually think that the specific dichotomy and and i also think that this totally like i don't think you need to go the opposite way you know if you're <laughs> if you run maybe a more high chaos game like i would say matt does but i think even within my tone which is which is much less chaotic i would say than than matt's I think that the lack of control within the death mechanics, while still having it be influenceable, as people have pointed out, is is a is a feature is a is a is a cool feature of the system. Um, I'm still not down with skill checks. <laughs> I would I would most likely make it. Um, I would most likely make it uh, either a a straight d20 roll, or I would give them advantage or, or advantage. Maybe nah, probably never disadvantage because that would feel bad. But I would probably give them advantage, like Vax was given, if they do something particularly interesting, um, and then uh, and then just have it be a, a d20 roll, and. Um, yeah, but I but the more I come around on it, you know, I've talked about like the 2D matrix of like the DC versus the um the actual D20 roll and how you influencing that DC. And I've, you know, very distinctly said when you're making rolls to affect the DC of a different roll that is obfuscating the the final roll, it is taking control away, it's taking awareness away. And I think for death, that works. I think there are good, solid tones there that I like. So yeah, <laughs> I wanted to uh, I wanted to highlight um, that uh, in no small part because uh, I I don't think I would have if I had just been reviewing the death mechanics on my own. If I just said, "Hey, I want, I want more, I want different resurrection mechanics for my home game," I don't think I would have ever come to this conclusion naturally. Um, I think you guys kind of, kind of got me there. So, I just wanted to point it out. I, I, I think again, still don't agree on the skill checks, but I think the lack of control is very interesting. Um, so, with comment review done done and dusted uh takeaway <sighs> this is where i gotta be critical i gotta be critical because i think last episode I I'll, I'll i'll tell you what spawned my my thought process for this for this takeaway I have not really been noticing that we're at 1.25 speed since we switched over it to it for the role playing sections. Even in the section in um, Vasselheim that I was so critical of in the bar sequence, uh, I I honestly I didn't feel <laughs> I didn't feel um, the slowness, and sometimes. People will just have slow episodes. Sometimes that just happens. Uh, and I said it last episode. I was like, you know, sometimes I might maybe bump up the speed a little bit. But I was kind of thinking about, like, what the difference was. Like, what really, like, activated that within my brain of, like, man, I really want to skip through this. And so that that's the, that's the kind of the thought train I was thinking down. And I think that once again... I think that we are seeing the sort of sluggishness 
of them not having any sort of timer. I think it, it is what it kind of comes back to in this arc. Uh, like, to, to compare it to Atla, because we talked about Atla last time with Keyleth, there is no master the four elements before the comet comes back and Sozin is invincible, right? There's That is a very distinct timer. And even within Avatar The Last Airbender, where there is that timer, where that timer's always looming in the background... They goof off plenty. It's not like we don't have low stake, what you would consider like the equivalent of low stakes role play in Avatar. We very much have that. But there's always a background pressure of the timer to spur them back into action, to give them, even in a small way, a little bit of a sense of urgency to spur them into action and to remove this sort of sluggishness. And I just feel like in this past episode, v Vox Machina felt like aimless. <laughs> like they were just sort of doing whatever, whenever. Like the party, uh, and I think it's Grog and, and maybe Keyleth or maybe Grog and Percy, um, kind of make a joke out of it about going to the Pyra of like, oh, it's just like checking it off the list, whatever. Because <laughs> that's kind of what it feels like. Um, so, I was thinking about this and I was like, okay, Mega. You're throwing this shade. What would you do? What would you do? What would you do different? Other than just saying generically, have a timer, blah, blah, blah. What would you do? How would you do it? So I wrote it down. <laughs> if it were me, right now, let's say I, you know, I can't change anything about the past. We're we're rolling with right now. I would have Allura via either message, um, you know, some sort of like sending spell or or something along those lines, um, or direct appearance. You know, she just shows up. Um, come to the party in a panic, saying that she has discovered something in the library. I couldn't remember the library's name when I was writing this, uh, <laughs> and I didn't look it up. Um, as bad as things are now, they are only going to get worse. The soul anchor in Thordak's chest is actually still tied to the elemental plane of fire. He just found a loophole that got him back here, and maybe finding something within the plane of fire to uh, bring with him. Which, by the way, great heist sequence. Stealing from a dragon? Uh, hello, Hobbit. Did I hear you calling? <laughs> so if, you know, he has something that they can steal that will weaken him or, like, start this process of dragging him back into the elemental plane of fire. Great heist plot hook. But, regardless. So, he is the soul anchor. It's a loophole. Whatever. The longer that the anchor remains outside of the plane of fire, the harder it will be to send Thordak back there. And it's it'll be like by the end of summer, you know, whatever time frame Matt wants. Whatever time frame you want. By the end of summer, it will lose connection entirely. But the worst part it won't just unbind itself. It's not just going to, like, deactivate. It needs to be anchored to something. It's a soul anchor. So, it will anchor Thordak to our plane. He will grow in power, and it will be impossible to banish him to any other plane. The soul anchor working against us there. I think that this sort of setup sets a timer... But it also doesn't go too far. Like, to go back to the Atla example, right? Like, they make it very clear that, like, the comet will essentially make Sozin invincible. Um, <laughs> and they can do that because, you know, they're writing a television show. They don't have to worry about the characters failing because they choose if the characters fail. Um, so you don't want to go that far. You don't want to make Sozin. But... This timer is still impactful because it removes an option for dealing with Thordak. Like, assumingly, Allura, and now we know the Pyra, 
uh, know, theoretically, how to send him back to the Plane of Fire. That is a potential option right now for Vox Machina to deal with Thordek, is to send him back to the Elemental Plane of Fire somehow. Um, but introducing this timer, while it is not a apocalypse, end-of-the-world timer, it is this feeling of your options are shrinking. The longer you take, the less options you will have. The harder things will get. Uh, it keeps them focused, keeps them moving forward. Even if they don't plan on sending Thordak back, I can picture very distinctly a conversation between players of like, look, even if we're not going to do that, we might as well you know, try to resolve things before the end of the summer just in case our other plans don't work. It's essentially, even if it was going to be their plan B, removing a plan B is still a significant, like, itch for the players to scratch. Um, it could also add a brand new sort of route slash option for Vox Machina that is simply delaying the timer. This is something that you see within some fictional situations where there are these timers that the ultimate solution, it's going to take more time. And that's what, you know, maybe Allura comes to them and she says, you know, we're figuring it out, but we need a little bit more time. And they say, Allura, we don't have time. Don't you know the soul anchor? And she's like, figure out a way to, to extend it. Give us more time. Give us more time is a very common thing within movies, you know, books, whatever. And so introducing a timer adds that as a potential direction for the party to investigate, a potential route of just give us more time, right? And I also think that if they end up really liking the Fire Ashari, which it seems like they generally do, like if they really like some NPCs in there, they generally like Vasselheim, so they like being on Isilra, um, or in Othansia. Um, it gives them, it gives a very easy direction to go with with the Pyra of like, oh, the Pyra can help you delay the timer, right? It could even involve like a trip back into the elemental plate of fire or something to like refresh the connection, you know? Um, and just thinking about, you know, they love having guests. They love having guest episodes. Great guest episode fodder of the uh, going into the elemental plane of fire to refresh the connection and give you more time or whatever. Uh, the guest player could very easily be from the Fire Ashari or from Vasselheim and act as kind of their like guide through the elemental plane. Very cool way to make the um, guest player feel very impactful. You could literally like give the guest player a map that they have to like guide the party with. Just some options, just some options. Um, but I think they need something because right now they are they are so aimless. Um, they're just spinning their wheels, and and I I it's really I think it's it's starting to really take a toll on the tone of the arc in general at this point. Honestly, um, I've skipped ahead many episodes of CR because the pace was just too slow, and I mean. It's it's really tough because, like, you don't need to, like, I fully agree with the concept that, like, you, you, the characters need rest, the players need rest, so you can make this as long a timer as you want. Like, end of, end of the summer, end of the year, it can be slow, but there has to be some reason to do things. In fact, they even kind of invoke the lack of timer with, uh, you know, when they're talking about the fire Ashari, it's like, oh, well, we need to, you know, we need to hurry. And they are like, well, do we? <laughs> you know, if there, it's been a few days, if there are survivors, you know, if there are going to be survivors, there will be survivors. A day isn't going to matter. And that attitude of a day isn't going to matter is kind of, like, definitional to the arc so far. Of, like, why do they need to do anything now? A day isn't going to matter. 
And that is fine sometimes. Um, but I don't think, number one, it works very well in an apocalypse plot. I, but that's debatable. That's arguable. Uh, but number two, it really encourages a sense of analysis paralysis within a group that's already very prone to it. And in a group where there are so many voices in the room because there are so many people in the party, you know? Um, so I think that, like, for this group, like, we talk a lot about, like, oh, I think it works for Vox Machina. I think it doesn't work for home tables, what, what have you. I actually think that this is maybe a situation where Vox Machina is even, like, it affects them even more. <laughs> like, them having so many players, them being conscious of their performance, like, I think that this is something that I think would affect a home table as well. Like, I, I'm giving this, you know, I'm going into this because I think that this is good home table advice. But I think that it 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 affects Vox Machina even more than your traditional home table, um, which is you know not not um, typically how a lot of these things are. Um, so it's kind of interesting. I don't know. What up, John? Ella, how we doing? Uh, there was an episode scheduled for today. There was. So okay, this is this is kind of my bad. Um, and and that's pretty much all I had for the takeaway. So we can kind of you know do some. Some a little bit of housekeeping, uh, and then we'll we'll go to an ad in like eight minutes, and then uh, and then we'll come back and do kind of full housekeeping. Um, no, ad starts in six minutes. Oh, a little bit, little bit early. Uh, what up, Seronis? Um, so the uh, this is more a criticism of the show as an entertainment product than as D and D play. I agree with that sentence. It is more of a criticism of the show. I still think that within the context of a D&D actual play, you will get more enjoyment and investment if you have a if you don't have this sluggishness. Like I think that things will matter more and and feel more impactful. Um but I do think that that and that's sort of um, that that's another layer to this of I think it is more impactful like just in terms of like TTRPG impact I think it's more impactful to Vox Machina as a party and then on top of that I think it is even more impactful on it as a media product um, but even within the context of like playing a game I still think that this is something that is impactful. Um, to like the enjoyment um, of of any given storyline, um, I think this arc is a little similar to Avengers Endgame. The dragons won already. VM just needs to restore the status quo. No deadline, but the sooner the better. Yes, yes, and I I I actually I I think that's a decent point, and I think that it does highlight maybe a um. A difference or maybe a problem uh it's it's sort of the opposite problem of atla right there's a in in atla they can write this very like oh the story will basically be over if the timer runs out right because they know what's going to happen um they know they know that the characters will succeed avengers endgame is sort of the opposite where you can there doesn't need to be a timer because they're going to write these characters and they're going to write exactly how much time they spend spinning their wheels and they are going to make them go out and do things you know so i think that that sort of like non-timered environment like in in endgame can work because you don't need the characters themselves to actually decide to make the plot happen. <laughs> if that makes sense. Like you you don't you 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 can it, there's there's more control uh over their own like kind of internal pacing, if that makes sense. 
Um, so I, I think that's a, that's a decent comparison, but I think that Avengers Endgame doesn't work quite as well as a story that you tell in a, in a, in a TTRPG setting. Um, I think it's a good comparison though. I think it's a very good comparison between like, especially to define what type of apocalypse story this is. I I think that's a really good comparison. Yeah. Uh, I don't think I'd like this pace at my table as a player. My ADHD can't stand it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but I can imagine a table where a slower pace is enjoyed. A slower pace can certainly be enjoyed. But I think what we're starting to run into in this is a pace so slow that it feels like doing things sooner doesn't matter. Like, it fe- like there's no... Um, there's no pressure to decide any which way. Kind of doesn't matter. You just got to do stuff. Like, this is, this is being a little bit hyperbolic. This is taking a little bit to the extreme. But there's no real evidence that they couldn't fuck off into the woods or into the Feywild for six months. And that that would have a substantially bad impact with on the Chroma Conclave situation. Like, they could just say bye-bye material plane for six months and like we can infer that like matt would make some sort of consequence for that because that's very extreme but we don't know what it would be (laughs) it would be totally unforeshadowed we have no idea because there's been no consequences presented to us for taking your time at all um which is it, it it I think it just lowers the uh emotional impact a little bit. Um my uh oh wait, despite what some people might think there's no script. <laughs> yeah, exactly, Dr. Hoovy. Yeah, despite what some people might say. Um oh we got a minute left. Uh, my table is a slow game about every fourth session, and uh, and of the four, one is usually super full. I like that. That sounds like a great pace, Mustang. That sounds like an amazing pace. For the Chroma Conclave, it's been like half. <laughs> Especially, like, it's it was, like, really jam-packed, and then it was, like, really, really slow. It's very clustered. Um, already Resurrection. My taste is weird. I usually go for Grim Bright. I like grittier elements, week-long rest, harder resurrection. Oh, uh, interesting. I can see that, yeah. Uh, I would love a super duper laid back campaign right now, TVH. The rest of the world, life is stressful enough. That's totally fair. I don't think an apocalypse story works for that tone. <laughs> I think that's a totally fair thing to want, though. Uh, in all fairness, theoretically, they could spend six months in the Feywild and only have like six minutes passed. Well, okay, the Feywild was a bad choice. See you in an ad. Goodbye. <laughs>
All right, we're back, we're back, we're back. I also think I realized <clears throat> I'm. N I don't want to. Uh, I don't want to. You know, watch any CR. But I think I might occasionally like talk. You know, to like talk to chat during ad breaks. Um, but but not do. Uh, not well, actually. But then they might come back and not know what we're talking about. Mm, damn, it's hard. Because now I'm just, now I'm a little impatient. I really wish the reason that I have, I'll talk about this. The reason that I have, you know, three minute ad breaks is because of Twitch. It's the, it's like the, if you do them an hour apart and you still want to not do pre-rolls, uh, then they make you do uh, three minute ones. Um so that is that is the uh, situation. It's also weird. A lot of times that they're they're desynced, like what the ads manager tells me is happening versus what the chat says is happening. So it's sometimes hard for me to tell when the ad is actually done. Um, but yeah, yeah, Mustang, it's odd. Um, but uh, I'm pretty sure it's on my end. But Truffle won't open. Oh no, that sucks. Uh, that would be. Yeah, that would be. I mean, I know that it's like working to some degree because this is all working, but that sucks. Um, let's see, let's see, let's see. Ten years can turn to ten minutes just as easy as ten minutes can turn to ten years. Yeah, true. Um, uh, isn't it only four or five days since the Chroma Conclave is attacked? Yeah, I think I think you're about right. Yeah, which is, I think, highlights even further. So, uh, just in case the ad was still running, uh, isn't it only four or five days since the Chroma Conclave has attacked? I believe you're right, and I think highlights even further that if this was a movie or potentially a uh, television show, that this might feel less slow and sluggish. Um, but generally, and this is also the reason... This is <laughs> the okay. So this is actually sort of why. Let me let me pull out uh, the whiteboard. So this is kind of hitting on the same factor um, as we were talking about the other day with experience leveling of time, and and it's something that I've said it, it forever. I hate when when um, really like objective time is used especially within short bursts in D&D. &D. Um, and that is one of the things that makes timers tough, but I think if you put them in terms of like seasons, like I I said like when the summer's over, a little bit more vague. <laughs> um, but uh, time is really, really rough for D&D &D because, oh, why did I do a B for D&D? Because when you are playing D and D, even if you're going at a at a relatively slow pace, things are happening like every other day, like huge things that wouldn't happen at that pace in real life at all, ever. <laughs> even if we go back to G Herkub's comparison of Chroma Conclave to Avengers Endgame. A lot of the events that you see within Avengers Endgame, there are time skips between them, like between scenes. Sometimes there are days, weeks, months between scenes that you see, but as a viewer, there's no time, <laughs> right? Those, those go very directly between. It's the exact opposite, exact opposite for a TTRPG because like, and and so maybe this is a better a better thing to say TTRPG time, uh, TTRPG time is very very different from like something like movie time, because movie time is compressed from the perspective of the audience. It's compressed. It's shortened. So you can take things that in fiction happen very far apart and put them very, very close together. TTRPG time is almost the exact opposite, <laughs> most of the time, where 
things that happen very, very, very close together happen very far apart for the from the perspective of the viewer. And I'm not even talking about the viewer of like an actual play. I'm talking about like players, DMs. Uh, from the player's perspective, something that happened yesterday in fiction happened a week ago, two weeks ago, maybe a month ago if something ca if someone canceled. <laughs> so, and I mean, this concept of like TTRPG time is actually a very big root of a lot of advice that I've given. Like how I think that um, DMs should remind their players of things that their characters would remember, but they wouldn't. That goes back to TTRPG time. Th ways that you need to control the pacing. Reasons that you need timers to push your players forward. Because, yes, the Chroma Conclave within the fiction happened less than a week ago. Like the, their invasion of Amon. I'm pretty sure for the players, it's going on like two months. <laughs> if, I'm, if I'm thinking about the, the timelines right. So... You can, uh, and it's, this is also one of the reasons that I do really like, or sorry, let me go back to one, one more thing. This is also one of the roots of like one of the issues with XP leveling and where people, you know, talk about like, you know, how these random people came to power so quickly. Outside of the fiction, most of the time, I think that XP leveling probably feels appropriately paced. <laughs> like... Most of the time, it, you know, to go from 1 to 20 is going to take you two, one to two years out of game time. But it could very easily be a month or two months in game time. Just because of this fucking TTRPG time dilation that we got here. Um, this, this, like, time extension. Um... Now, there is a way that you can sort of combat this, and I sort of talked about it when we were talking about XP leveling, which is downtime. Downtime can be a way to stretch back out TTRPG time so that it more closely mirrors um, real life time. But even it's, it's very, it's, it's hard, it's very sticky, it's, it's, it's not a one to one solution. So, even though within the fiction, it's been four to five days out of fiction, we're going on one to two months, you know. Uh, and this is, this is why this one to two months time is why we need some sort of timer to push them forward and why you might feel, even though in fiction it hasn't been a lot of time at all, why it might feel uh, slow or sluggish out of game from the perspective of a viewer. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, intense jet lag. Yeah, exactly. And this, this, this gets even weirder because sometimes uh, in earlier levels, some of this TTRBG mit time is mitigated by travel. So travel time, travel montages uh, can alleviate some of the issues with TTRPG time. But once you get higher levels, as, as uh, Saronis laid out, rested a day in Amon, teleported to Whitestone, teleported to Vasselheim, wind walked to the lock, teleported to Whitestone, teleported to Pyra. <laughs> At lower levels, not possible at all. <laughs> so at, at lower levels, this, this travel time aspect can make up for some of the TTRPG time weirdness. Um, but at higher levels, when you can just teleport everywhere, like you have no, no defense against it. You have no natural defense within the system uh, against the TTRPG time dilation. <laughs> I'd use Whitestone as the sword of Damocles. Uh, one to procrastinate? Okay, but remember uh, that the word of your safe haven gets around? Absolutely, G. Herkub. That's a great option. That's a great option for a timer. Is So you can either... I think there are kind of two levers you can pull as a DM very generally. Four timers. 
for timers, you can either lower safety. Safety. Especially, this is especially within an apocalypse plot. So within non-apocalypse plots, I think it, it's, you know, maybe a little bit different. Um, you can either lower safety or you can raise danger. Uh, danger slash maybe risk. Um, so... That is, a, G. Herkub's solution is a great option for lowering safety. It's like, okay, and attacking something that they care about. Um, so lowering safety versus rain, raising danger risk. And you could even kind of view it as raising the risk, right? These are kind of two sides of the same coin. Um, but I think that that's an absolutely, a totally fair uh, version of a timer. If you don't want to affect... Thordak at all, yeah, you make it very clear to the players that the longer they wait, the more likely it is. And this, you know, that's a reasonable, like, assumption the players could make. But I think when it comes to a timer, you can't rely on them to make said assumption. You can't rely on them to, to, uh, what's the, uh, what's the aphorism? Um... If you're trying to give a clue to your players, you have to give it to them three times. The first time they'll miss it, the second time they'll misinterpret it, and the third time they'll actually get it. <laughs> so, sort of like the um, you know the death tomb, whatever. Um, if if that is going to be your timer of Whitestone is going to get progressively less safe, you need to you you maybe you can maybe for one of those three. You can just take, you know, like, oh, they might just assume that. But you probably got to give it to them at least two ways. <laughs> uh, beyond just the natural assumptions uh, that they, you know, that they might make or that they could make. Um, uh, zuz, 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 uh, Twitch is weird. I was in the stream a while ago and the streamer was like, oh, there's an ad and then there just wasn't. Dude, I don't know, man. It, Twitch is very weird. Twitch is very, very weird. Um, ad breaks can be for random shit like magic mage dresses. <laughs> Maybe I'm in the minority, but I'm not. I feel it's not sluggish. Five days and already a big item upgrade and three allies gathered. I'd say, I don't know. For me personally, each individual, it's like episode 45 felt sluggish or felt slow. And episode 40, um, 44 felt slow. And from what I remember, episode 42 felt pretty slow. Um, so it's like, at this point, I feel like every other episode is is pretty slow. And I don't think you can necessarily judge it based on in-game time. You have to judge it in terms of what they've accomplished during sessions. Because that's the type of time that the players are experiencing. Um, Xandra has a hard calendar system that I do not understand at all. <laughs> Yeah, uh, should I also say live tables handle time very loosely? I remember Matt Colville had a video about this. He talks about realizing his 15-year-old fighter was 45 by the end of a campaign. Yeah, a lot of tables do handle time very loosely, which is why I'll, I'll, I'll sort of maybe reiterate a little bit more 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 clearly to, to get a more, like, concise point. Um, when you're thinking about pacing uh, your story... I think you have to think about it in terms of sessions, not in terms of in-game time. Or you have to think about it in terms of out-of-game time in general, uh, because in-game time is so weird <laughs> and is so abstract and will absolutely uh, not be consistent throughout your, throughout your story. Um, do you, uh, you do know that Alexandria has two moons? I think they mentioned it. It's not something that I like really onboarded, but I think they mentioned it at some point. Um, how does one push a party uh, a party level 11 to 13? I think Pike is 11 to fight a CR 20 dragon faster without TPKing them. I think you you put a gentle timer, right? Like when I'm talking about timers, again, you don't have to do the the Sozin comet thing. Uh, you just put a gentle pressure on them. So right now there is zero pressure and figuring out how much pressure you need to put on your players is going to be a table by table um, analysis, so to speak. Um, 
it's it's not going to be consistent by any means. Um, so you, you you have to figure out how gently you can push your players in a way that will not stress them the fuck out and won't TPK them, um, but will get them to act and get them to uh, uh, not allow things to fall off, if that makes sense. Um, so I think that some, uh, even, even a, a very gentle way to do it is having someone in Vasselheim talk about hearing about Whitestone. Uh, like how Whitestone is a safe haven. If word has traveled across the sea that there are refugees in Whitestone, that is a very that is a pretty. It's a very light, but it's a clear um, symbol that word is getting around, and that the dragons might hear about it. Um, alternatively, I think that the uh, the kind of situation that I presented with Allura of the uh, of of Thordak just being bound to this plane. Again, that's not a Sozin type of thing. Thordak will still be able to be dealt with, but it gives the party more options, and it gives them some sort of time frame in which to act within. Um, and you can make that time frame whatever you want. So you can make it end of the month. You can make it end of the season. You know, you, like, you can do all sorts of things. But just having the timer in the background, whether or not it's even really a threat, helps give the party something to just, it's just a tiny little pressure on their back to where when they stop, when they plant their feet, they just have a little bit of pressure <laughs> trying to push them, push them forward, push them to act. Um, so that's, that's, a, uh, that, that's what I would say. Even if you said this will fucking happen a year from now. That is a year might as well be. It'll never happen. You know, like a year might as well be. that will never happen, but it gives them the feeling that they need to act. Right. So like, just as we talked about, like time is so ambiguous, um, that like a year basically means nothing, but they can, uh, they, they it still is a tiny bit of pressure. If they need even more pressure, you can make it accomplishment based. Uh, so you can say it's not going to be time based, but it is based on some ritual that Thordak has to achieve. So Thordak or Umbrasil or Rayshawn, they all have to do something specific in order to break the connection. Like ritual magic is a is a very established thing in Exandria at this point. Um, it very well, very easily could be that Thordak needs to accomplish some sort of ritual, and you don't know what it is. You don't know what he needs to do it, but you know that he's working on it, and that is even more vague. It's not time based. It's really completely up to the DM at, as to how fast that progresses, um, but. It is at least like, oh, they are working towards something. Things will get worse if we just leave them to their own devices. Because that's really the thing you want to impress, is if we do nothing, things will get worse in some appreciable way. That's, that's the main thing that you need. Um, that's the main thing that you want the timer for, that you want to accomplish with these timers. Just because it, I say it's a timer doesn't mean it needs to be time-based. Uh, it just needs to be something that gives them the sense that if they do nothing or if they waste time, if they went and fished in the river all day, <laughs> things will get appreciably worse. If they, for example, go and drink in a bar all day, things will get worse. Now, you can have it be vague, you can have it be a long timer so that they might still choose to do those things because, you know, they're grappling with their emotions around the entire event, but then that creates drama. You can have Vex, exactly what happened in the bar sequence, Vax, or Vex, saying, Laura Bailey, saying, hey guys, there are dragons, like, we need to be doing something. But her words have no bite, because why do they need to be doing anything? Nothing will get appreciably worse because Vax Machina spent the entire day drinking in the bar. <laughs> But if you know that it will, even 
by a fraction of a percent, it'll get just that much worse or just that much harder, or they will be just that more bit more rushed. It gives Vex's words some bite, and it actually makes it real interpersonal drama if someone wants to spend all day drinking in a bar because they're running away from their responsibility. That's a fair thing to do as a, as a player that, you know, maybe wants to create some dramatic tension. That's a totally fair thing to do, but you need the opposing side to actually have something backing them up, which right now there isn't. Not a dramatic reveal, really. Um, yeah, not, not a huge dramatic reveal, but well, whatever. Uh, it's five days in game. How are they hearing about it? Uh, I don't know. I think it's my brain. I understand the sessions feel like nothing, but the players are having uh, fun playing a game and rushing in game time. Uh, it's always a... So this, this comes down to uh, could they be having more fun? Like, I agree. If players are having fun, that is the most important part. We want to avoid bad D and D, <laughs> but this is very much when I when I'm talking about these timers, when I'm giving this sort of critique, this is how do we take it from good to great? I don't think that like what we're witnessing is like bad D and D. I don't think that the players are coming out of it being like, man, what a terrible session. Uh, but we're I, I you know we're we're talking about and thinking about. How can we take and elevate uh, what is what is good into something much much better? Um, and so, if you if your if your brain is struggling with the like, how do they hear about it type thing? That's just off the top of the head, top of the dome. Um, you could absolutely go after the Thordak needs to accomplish something uh, because he can do that as quickly or as longly lengthily. As the uh, as the DM wants him to, um, as long as it makes some feasible sense, um, uh, could definitely have some Wyvern riders scoping out other big cities. True, also true. Um, actually, Mister Steg, that's a great point. Uh, when they're out at the a very easy way to m make the players feel like Whitestone might not be safe if they take too long, without putting any sort of distinct timer on it is while they are out at the Giant Fortress, which is uh, a location that's close to Whitestone, but still a decent chunk away. It's like a three-hour walk, I think, was established. Um, you have them see the Wyvern Riders from the Giant Fortress, and they have to decide how to deal with them. Because they have long-ranged magic, they have the capability to fly, they could try to catch the Waven Riders' attention to distract them away from Whitestone. Like, you, as the DM, present the Waven Riders far enough away from Whitestone that they won't see it if Vox Machina interrupts them. But if Vox Machina doesn't, there's a very clear implication that, like, they will see it. And the Waven Riders have been established already as servants of the dragons. So, Mr. Stake, that is a, that is a fantastic way that you could go about uh, doing this. And I think that still works with the five days in game type thing is like, okay, they've established their hold. Now they're sending out scouts to try and lock down any outlying settlements, especially big ones like Whitestone. Um, but there, 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 are some, there are lots of options for how to do that. Um, here's a vague but ominous timer. Do this before the next reality phase shift. <laughs> that is a vague but ominous timer, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, still pre-episode, still pre-episode, still pre-episode. Which, speaking of, so I don't need to be on this one anymore because I'm not drawing. Speaking of, housekeeping, housekeeping. We've gotten, we're an hour in now. If, if you're watching the VOD already, you're probably hooked. <laughs> housekeeping, uh, number one, general tone, general plans that I'm thinking for the for the channel, for the content, all that, all that business. Um, I want to go into an era of stability. <laughs> that is that is what I am I am looking for. Uh, I want to make the generalized uh, streams better, more smooth. Uh, I I like scheduling out all the things ahead of time. You know, I'm I'm gonna be looking for sort of a uh, quality of life <laughs> uh, features era. Um, 
within the next, you know, uh, week, two weeks, three weeks. Um, the other thing with that is finishing up Baldur's Gate 3. I'm probably not going to start another st- another game. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm probably just not going to introduce anything too new for for a little bit. Maybe a week, maybe two weeks, whatever. Just going to take it just a short con- just a short pause on anything crazy new um, to be able to really work on solidifying what I have um, and making it better. Um, with that, uh, the other thing is going to be trying to um, not improve necessarily, but but give a little bit to the critters. Give a little bit to the critters because I think that all the technical issues and while I'm experiencing the technical issues going out and, you know, approaching new things, playing gigantic, uh, Minecraft, interactions, Kukuro, like trying all of these new things, uh, I don't I don't necessarily think it took away from the Critical Role streams, uh, but I do think that they were the most impacted by, you know, scheduling changes and and this whole suite of of things that I've been working on for the past month, month and a half. So I want to give back to the critters a little bit. Maybe do some, uh, try to get the critical role streams as solid as I can get them, as well as maybe throw in the occasional uh, bonus stream uh, within the next like week or two. So instead of starting a new, you know, story-based video game uh, like Baldur's Gate, uh, do some actual critical role bonus streams, <laughs> which I have been teasing for for months and haven't done in months. Um, so actually do some bonus content, finally do the uh, the Battle Royale episode, Q&A, things like that. Um, so going into, into that a little bit. Um, the other thing is that especially for the next month, but potentially in general for the channel, uh, the thing that I've realized that one of the things that stresses me out the most about content creation, which... Honestly, a lot of stuff doesn't stress me out. I really, 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 really like doing this. Uh, <laughs> but probably the number one thing is the tech issues. But the number two thing is like breaking news chasing. Um, not to say that I don't want people to tell me about breaking news. I love being aware of it. Uh, but I do want to generally put out there that I'm not going to prioritize stuff just because uh, it's new and it's hot, even though that would be better for the channel, probably. Um, so, like, I I really I really loved the um, Sablewood Messengers uh, game that I ran. Uh, I really enjoyed it. I don't think I, like, under-prepped for it, um, but I do, like, like, out of what was necessary for, like, the DMing stuff, but I could have worked with the players more. Like, for example, the players both picked like the same domain card with reign of blades um i think that the players handled it beautifully in game of like making it feel different and whatever but mechanically it was still the same um and that's the sort of stuff that if i had not been trying to get the stream out the door if i wouldn't have been trying to capitalize on like hey you know dagger hearts hot right now uh, that's probably the sort of thing I would have caught, and I think it would have led to a better experience for them and like a better stream product in general. Um, so that's also why when 1.3 came out, uh, I said I'm not, you know, I'm not going to review it until this week, just because I would have had to move things around in the schedule. And even speaking of moving things around in the schedule, I had to cancel Critical Role to have the Dagger Heart stream. Even though I only do Critical Role twice a week. Theoretically, there are three days that I could have scheduled it if I had been willing to push it out a week. Because that Wednesday was the only day that worked that week for the players and I. And so I did it then, which led to a Critical Role stream being canceled. So, in general, I absolutely still want you guys to tell me, you know, if there's critical news or if there's breaking news that you think I I might not be aware of, uh, but just in general especially for the next month, 
know that I'm not going to uh, prioritize it quickly. <laughs> We're going to be working a lot on stability, on reliability, on um, making it solid and enjoyable and not slapdash. Not to say that I'm not like proud of the things that I've made. I am. Again, I really, I thought that Sablewood Messengers went awesome. Um, but I could, it could have been better. I could have made it better. Um, and I want to make all my stuff the best that it can be. So that's what we're doing. Um, even more specifically, I think potentially this weekend, I don't want to commit to it. Potentially this weekend, I'm going to do a bit of note recap. Like maybe like a 30 minute stream, 40 minute stream where we go through the critical role notes. Um, and again, I really don't want to commit to it. I don't want to say, oh, it's going to be a weekly thing. Don't want to commit to that. But I am potentially think I'm, I'm thinking more about the notes because I really love the notes. I love the way that I'm taking them. But by the end, especially of like a full episode, I'm pretty wiped. Um, and organizing the notes is something that I need <laughs> not, not like a, not like a lot of brain power for, but like an amount. <laughs> and sometimes by the end of the stream, I'm kind of wiped out. I've given what I can give and I'm, uh, I'm not like mentally really solid on, on organizing the notes. So I'm thinking about the, the note taking. And does it belong in a different stream? Should I reorganize? Should I organize last episode no episodes notes at the beginning of a stream? I don't know. So I'm thinking about it. I'm I'm thinking about it. Um, or do I just do it off stream? Because it won't. It doesn't take that long to do off stream. Uh, I just haven't done it off stream yet because I'm trying to figure out if it fits anywhere on stream if it if it makes sense anywhere on stream and if i have the the mental energy for it at the end of a stream i'll still definitely do that um but as we've gotten into the full episodes that's become less and less the case <laughs> um so uh pretty much anything is a great dropout show breaking news is a great dropout show i love breaking news i love the, i love the episodes that are uh, written by Grant and uh, make a joke out of the fact that they are written by Grant. <laughs> Those are my favorite breaking news episodes. <laughs> uh, anyways, uh, we had two to three, full, uh, two full episode weeks become two half episode weeks, so it's cool if we get some more occasionally. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, Ron. I agree. I agree. Um, we're we're behind the thing that we should be at. Um, so, I think that's pretty much it. I'm gonna turn off the music. Going to pull up my time codes. Uh, first things first. Let's grab that and let's throw the time codes into the note for today. Boop. And uh, let's get rolling. Uh, sixteen. Why can't I hear it? Because the tab's muted, of course. Code of Critical Role, where a bunch of us nerdy ass voice actors sit around and play Dungeons and Dragons. My name is Matthew Mercer, I'm the Dungeon Master, and for those uh, returning, uh, good to see you again. For those for the first time, welcome, and hopefully you're not too lost. Um, so Sam is on his way right now, beating the usual traffic from coming in, you know, right wherever he comes from, being a professional, <laughs> having a career that's functional and perpetually busy. Ugh. Here, get your soon, Sam, quickly, please. Um, being a professional that has a work life Balance? Ew, gross. <laughs> How dare. Drive safe. Uh, don't drive with okay. children in the street. It's a problem. Apparently that was confusion from last time. Oh. People thought he was actually like, driving into children. Like, he had problems with children in traffic. He thought children in traffic. Yeah, it's just the sidewalk. Uh, so keep your children out of traffic, if you don't mind. As a general critical rule request. PSA. PSA, okay. yeah. Um, the battle. So yeah, so uh, before we get started in this, uh, first and foremost, I want to say hello to our guest for the evening, Mr. Chris Hardwick. <laughs> Be here. Glad you could join us for tonight's game. Also very excited to be here on Ravenclaw Appreciation Day. The best house, of course. Yes, that's true. Uh, would be on measure as man's greatest treasure. Hufflepuff. Indeed, indeed. Of, of course. I mean, okay, so this is the guy that I know. 
which everyone confirmed last time. But uh, of course, the guy that hosts Talking Dead and Talking Etc. is uh, is a Ravenclaw. It all makes sense. It all tracks. We see it. <laughs> Who do you think you are, Sam? Ashley? I agree. <laughs> no. Slytherin, Slytherin. Ravenclaw's pretty good. Pretty good. <laughs> You're between. Uh, oh, my good. You mean the best. Yeah, no. There you go. I think. I don't know. Well, I'm oh, sorry. Okay. There's no. I would really oh, shit, love to. Man. Oh, this is I'm so, so awkward. I'm sorry. <laughs> did, did, wait, There's no. You. Can you stand you. near the bear? Is this, his name is Trinket. Can all right. you stand near the is bear? Is this how I was fired from the show? <laughs> <laughs> we thought we would do it on the live stream yeah. just to really help capture well, the traffic that that would bring. Good luck. Good luck. I think you're going to do great. Uh, these guys will take care of you. I've been working with this guy for the last couple of years on Sanjay and Craig. He's, yeah. Uh, he he's, gets all businessy. Like he's very. He's a responsible adult in the workplace. <laughs> Bye, Echoes. Then he comes here. Then yeah, I come here. <laughs> You're not. I can't wait to see this You're the same. other side. Where am I supposed to sit? Right here? No, we're, we're, yeah, we're going to bring you a chair. We're going to bring you a chair. Is, bring you a is chair. that true? Is that? I don't know. We're gonna, I are we scooting over? over, but I need both. <laughs> I just, my legs this is are the most awkward wider thing. than. <laughs> we're going to bring you a chair. I want to like give you space for. Yeah, there's really no. Can you just rappel down that? There we go. This is so awkward. I love it. I love it. Perfect. No, no, no. I've got the half table at the end here. It's great. Matt, I don't like having people on my right side. Is this weird? Yeah, you know, well, if it becomes a problem, just raise your hand and scream. We, we can scoot a little bit. It's already yeah, a problem. Oh, we, don't, we, we don't have to. I'm kind of, I'm raise your hand and scream is the best version of the Red X I've ever heard. <laughs> I think it works perfectly for a Call of Cthulhu game. You just, you just fucking... Ah! <laughs> and that's how you let the other <laughs> players at the table know that you're uncomfortable. <laughs> Technically, the end. This is on Chris. Look at how far the bench is on our side. It's a professional show. I think you should plug in the table between here. Like, right next to the table. That's a little further. Very well oiled machine. Critical role. How you guys be? Thanks for joining us this week. The utmost of presenter equality. We promise to you on a weekly basis. Thank you for joining us. No, no. High presenter equality is also what I promise all of you. And that's and that's the way that me and Matt are the same. <laughs> me and Matt are different in a lot of ways. But the presenter equality, I tell you what, we <laughs> we just have that on lock. And that's and and you can never take that away from me. Or him. <laughs> it's the hair that does it. That's that's what really heightens the pre the presenter equality. <laughs> Okay. So, oh. let's go ahead and jump into this wondrous. Oh, oh god. <laughs> so, to get you guys a little bit up to speed with some of the uh, some of the fun that's happened previously on Critical Role, um, our band of intrepid adventurers, Vox. I will say this is this is um, one of the best one of the best overly uh, uh, obvious examples of like grass is always greener. You always want what you don't have. It says et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I have always wanted straighter, lighter hair. Uh, I my hair is very heavy. It's very thick. It has a lot of volume, uh, and it looks weird if I do not um, try to at least take a minimum level of styling. I also don't like the way it looks with headphones on, but that's a whole other thing. Um, whether it's short or long, uh, I've always wanted like really light. Uh, uh, straight hair like Matt has and I saw an interview with Matt uh, where he talked about how he felt like self-conscious about like his hair's lack of volume and like how like flat it laid on his skull and I was like uh <laughs> it's it's just the most yeah it's and I know that like this you know that you can find this sort of example all over the place but it's like it is so like me and him want essentially each other's hair uh, when uh, most other people look and are like, oh yeah, they have like really similar hair. But both of us are like, oh man, I just, I wish that it was like yours. <laughs> um, I don't know. I guess just your daily reminder that the grass isn't greener. Uh, <laughs> it always just looks that way. Uh, I don't know if you care, but there was controversy around this guy. Uh, I didn't look too deep into it though. Oh, interesting. Uh, I'm going to have to fade out of this chat and say very little. We barely started. This is already aged like milk on so many levels. Oh, no. Oh, no, no, no. Do you know it was G-Hercup? I've heard of it. Uh, same. Uh, thus, I live 
in beanies because my girls go crazy if I don't and I live in the driest climate in the US. Yeah, and I I've either wished that it was straighter or that it was curlier. I'm always like, oh, wavy is like the worst texture. And like that's it's legitimately like like thoughts that went through my mind when I was younger. Of like, oh, I hate how wavy it is. Just be curly or be straight. Make up your mind, hair. Ridiculous. Um, I know about it pretty in depth, but I'm not sure if I should talk about it here because people love this guy. Interesting. Okay. Um, hmm. Let's 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 uh let's call it like this. Let's call it like this in terms of of Hardwick. Um, I'm gonna evaluate him without knowing. Because critters at the time wouldn't have known. And then afterward, we will remind me, if people are still around, remind me um, afterward to look it up just so that I can cut my opinion. Not, not, like, not like slice things out, but like cut it as in like, you know, you cut food with acid, right? Like you cut like a sweet taste with acid. Um so that I can I can modify or update anything uh, if if needed. Um, I'm not gonna like look super deep into it probably, um, but we'll at least at least kind of get the general vibes. Um, that seems a fair way to approach this. Thank you, Brittany. Um, but yeah, so we'll we'll go forward. If I say anything that ages poorly <laughs> because of uh, something with him. Just consider me a 2015 critter, uh, and 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 we'll go from there. It's Machina. Uh, after having, because I will say I know very little about him. I watched Talking Dead when I was watching Walking Dead, and that's about it. Uh, no, I I appreciate the warning. I appreciate the warning going into it. Yeah. Horrible encounter with the Chroma Conclave, a gathering of chromatic evil dragons that has just torn through the Tal'Dorei countryside, destroying cityscape after cityscape. Uh, the party has fled and to, has been seeking information on how to possibly eventually topple these creatures and restore order to the land of Tal'Dorei. They begin seeking these artifacts known as the Vestiges of Divergence that promise ancient power from wars long past that could aid them in this journey. After acquiring one with a near-death experience by uh, Vexalia over there, um, they begin their next step in the journey. However, as part of a recent scrying spell by Keyleth, the druid discovered that the pirate tribe of her druidic heritage, uh, the Ashari, were decimated as their home of Pyro was the portal to the fire elemental plane uh, they normally guard, was where Thordak, the Cinder King, the great red dragon, tore through into this prime realm and managed to seemingly wipe out most, if not all, of the tribe. Um, Vox Machina made the relatively grim journey back to the mountainside, finding it now brimming with volcanic rock and uh, volcanic activity that previously lay dormant. Upon climbing the side of the mountain, you found remnants of the pirate tribe still alive uh, and making their way up the mountain as damaged as they are in hopes of sealing this now progressively swelling tear between the prime material plane and the elemental plane of fire. Not just that, there was aid that came to the uh, the pirate tribe that involved a number of Arashari, one of which was Corin, Keyleth's father. There is a, a brief, tearful exchange and reunion before the rest of you, stealing yourselves, began to walk in towards the center of the mountain's caldera, towards the remnants of the Cinder Grove, the now destroyed and sundered petrified forest, in hopes of closing this rippling tear to the elemental plane once and for all. And this is where we begin. So, the group of the six of you, gathering alongside the uh, dozen or so Pyre members with various burns, uh, Sir Konos, who is the leader of the tribe, now missing his arm, cauterized at the shoulder, all uh, advancing forward quietly in this kind of tense push of necessity. You can see in the distance, swirling between the trees, clusters of uh, glowing elemental entities that are uh, either spilling forth from this recently and have taken this landscape as their own, or are just enjoying in their, uh, their kind of, elementals like the burn shit. Um, <laughs> And so you're seeing Firementals wandering about, uh, just tearing through what remains of this countryside, and uh, you, let's see, you actually, uh, Vexalia, as you guys are stepping forward, keeping an eye on these glowing distant entities, these creatures, you catch out of the corner of your eye what appears to be a number of other humanoids, a small cluster of uh, shattered individuals, kind of far off to the left, tucked around the bottom of a tree. Can I ask everyone to wait? <clears throat> Percy? Yes? Can you look through your scope and see who that is? <sighs> Take a look. Big perception check. First roll. Oh, that's not bad. Uh, Music. The violins go south. 23. 23. Uh, glancing over that direction, you see 
towards one of the larger broken petrified trees right on the outskirts of the Cinder Grove uh, forest, you see what appear to be a cluster of humanoids. Two of them have flesh, the other two do not. Uh, these skeletal creatures kind of shuffle in place, oh, no. touching a blade to one side, while the other two appear to be in partially rotted states. They're mostly un- disinterested in their surroundings and stand there, kind of head to the side, aimless. Are they are they in the clothing of, of the, the, the natives, or are they? do they not look to be a shari? Uh, a shari? From what you can tell, one of them does appear to have a shari wardrobe. The other one does not. I... Can I say, so I, I don't think that the that this is what these are, but one of my favorite um I don't know if you want to call it tropes or just like um things that you can do in some games that you can't do in D D. Uh is is play sentient undead. Uh something of like Divinity Original Sin 2, where you can play like a skeleton essentially that is like fully sentient and you know is is i think theoretically immortal um one of the one of my favorite uh uh like race types in in any video game that has it that said (laughs) i very much understand why it is not playable. I still have a bone to pick with Fane. That's fair. Um, <laughs> I, I very much understand why they aren't playable. And if you want that sort of feel, you can go Warforged. But I always kind of wished that, uh, oh my God, I didn't even get it, Ink Charm. The, 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 the bone to pick. I get it now. I get it now. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, it's, it's, most of them are, you know, like, eh, go into your shape court. I will. Uh, most of them are like immortal. They have all of these things that even like Warforged don't have that make them kind of weird. Like, how do they interact with like fucking like turn undead spells? Like, a lot of things that the D&D creators probably just didn't want to deal with uh which is fair um but i will say if you ever catch me making a homebrew race it's probably going to be that because they're one and so when he said like oh two of the humanoid figures don't have flesh i was like (gasps) (laughs) <laughs> but I don't think that's what he's doing. But I have done that in my games before. I've made them things that exist, but the players, they're just not playable. Um, and I also think, to a larger extent, I think that's something that DMs shouldn't be afraid of. I think there's a fear that, like, if you have something in your world that players have to be able to, like, access it or like be able to play it um that i think that's one of the kind of driving emotions for why people have made like how to become a lich rules <laughs> which like in a in a non-evil campaign should basically never be desirable um <laughs> but it's it's like um i i i think that it is like super duper okay to have things that seem like they, you know, would be like player options or player accessible that just straight up aren't. Um, I think that's that's very okay. Um, and can help give you more freedom to flesh out the world without worrying how what the impact will be of your players using it against you. Um, hear me out, plant people. How are they not player how are there not playable plant people in DD? It's really weird. I, I I actually fully agree. It's also very weird because there basically are sentient plant people with the myconid. And uh and yeah, you see uh like fucking critical role makes the fun grill in uh in Daggerheart, which are just myconid, basically. Um yeah, especially like with uh with Dro being a playable race and having sunlight sensitivity, like all of the building blocks are there for, for Myconid to just straight up be playable. I mean, we have a compendium of monstrous races uh, with like the bugbear and, and all of that shit. Like you could have absolutely put uh, the fun. I almost said the fun girl, the Myconid into like uh, Morden, uh, Morden Canaan's tone of Tome of Foes. 
I don't remember which book introduced the mon monstrous races or redid them. I think it was Morden Cannons. Um, uh, JK, but I did make a Guild Wars 2 uh, Silvari race inspired race in my homebrew world. And hell yeah. Uh, I never played Guild Wars 2. Never, never uh, crossed, my, crossed my path. Uh, third party book I'm backing lets you play as a ghost. Hell yeah. <laughs> See, and that's, I'm sure it's weird, and like the, 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 I very much understand why a, you know, a first party thing, Wizards of the Coast, fucking uh, Harrington Press, wouldn't want to build that into the base game of playing a ghost, uh, because I'm sure that it has so many repercussions that they would have to think through in so many edge cases. Um, so I understand why you can't in the base game, but those sound like my kind of homebrew. <laughs> the internet nerd uh, needs me to say mushrooms aren't plants. Oh, you're right. They're fungus. They're a third fucking, not species. What is it? Kingdom? They're a third, uh, they're a third, they're a third thing. It's animals, animals, plants, and fungus. They're like their own. I, I don't remember if it's kingdom if, is the right term, but, but they're, yeah, they're like a third thing. Matt also created the Hallow one, which I, which is an un, undead playable race, I think. Oh, me and Matt are on the same fucking wavelength. <laughs> uh, my inner word, my inner nerd needs to create the pronunciation of drow. It's like brow, but with a D. What did I say? Did I say dro? I do. I, I use them pretty interchangeably. I, I'll, 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 I, I won't lie. I do say drow or dro, just like wyvern or wyvern. I never remember which one I say, and it changes in any given conversation. Uh, <laughs> Kingdom is right, and I'll end with me being right. <laughs> said in a weird they, way. They look undead. Doesn't. Are they? Are they from here? Possibly, uh, one looks, one looks vaguely familiar, I, but there's something wrong. We should proceed. Let's go up and find out what's happening, slowly and armed. At this point, uh, Corin, his father and the head of the air, Shari, in your absence, puts his hand forth and goes, I'm sorry, you're saying that you see, along the way, undead creatures. There's something unnatural over in that, in that direction. We should probably be the ones to investigate. Right. Given the nature of the elemental presence here, we're going to have to probably divide and attack the central place from multiple positions. Otherwise, they're going to have too strong of a fire front at the edges of this border. Do you feel confident enough to handle your own sliver of this assault? <laughs> Is he serious? Uh, Grog. You know, that makes sense. The way that he, the way that Matt said it made me be like, what? What is he talking about? Uh, maybe bump the CR ever level. Okay, let's see. Is this all the way up? I don't know why that is. Uh, that wasn't all the way up, but it also might be. Might need it more. Um. Oh, I actually can't bump it. This is this is the max. So if we need to do something, it'll need to be turning down my uh my mic. <laughs> uh, yeah, CR is is currently at max volume. Um, but, uh, he, he said it, I'm trying, I'm debating if I would have said it different. Cause I, I, I get what he's going after of like, if you all group up, you're vulnerable to fireball is, <laughs> is the translation there. Um, but it took me a second to understand what he was saying. And for a second, I thought that he was just like inventing a weird reason to separate them for no reason other than to make them weaker because generally separating makes each individual group weaker but that that does make sense that does make sense i just had to like think through it for a second <laughs> i i believe we can handle that quite we don't have a lot of magic wielders with us though it's all right <clears throat> i'm pretty good a lot I'm pretty good magic yeah, you're better than good buddy <laughs> you're okay <laughs> We'll keep an eye out. We'll have two of our druids overhead keeping eyesight. If anything goes wrong, signal up there. You know how, Keyleth. And we'll send them down to aid you. All right. Good? The Arashari will come from the northeast. So, Kronos, take the rest of your tribe. Hit from the west. You, continue on forward. If this troop you found of seemingly lifeless entities looks even remotely dangerous, do not engage. They are not our target. But if this is a scourge that is spread into the Cinder Grove, 
I feel we may be in worse shape than I originally envisioned. Regardless, stay silent, stay swift. He looks back to the rest of the Arashari, and all of them kind of their outer form shimmers as the wind begins to collect around their feet, ever so quietly. And they all, with an intense speed, begin to just trek at an incredible pace, seemingly blending in with the rock surroundings as they go, disappearing around one side of the Cinder Grove Forest. I think that's a good generalized strat. Um, that uh, 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 thread, uh, threads of dragons. I think that giving the players a mission and saying, hey, players, like, <laughs> I, oops, sorry about that. Muted myself on accident. Um, giving the players a mission is, oh, but Mike is a bit too low now. Okay. We can bump that a little bit. Is that better? Um, I think that giving the players a mission within the larger battle is Warning. one of the add incoming oh. take cover. Uh ooh, add incoming. How long do we have? Um okay, might keep talking about this after the ad, but also, you know, it's just what it is. Um I think yeah, I think that giving them a mission is one of the best ways to handle having players within a larger military battle or skirmish. Uh, it's kind of what I talked about if uh, we had had Orion bring in the Draconian Knights into Whitestone. It's like, okay, you have the Draconian Knights fight the Giants or the Undead Horde, the Tide of Bone, and then you have the party go around and get in and, you know, cut off the head of the Hydra, take out the commanders, whatever. You basically treat your players as a spec ops unit. You treat them as the fucking paratroopers that are going behind enemy lines. Uh, because most of the time they'll have resources to do so, and it allows you to have smaller combats. Ad starting now. Goodbye. <laughs>
How we doing? How we we doing? We're back. We're back. We're back. Uh, boyfriend into defecting from Overwatch to gigantic. <laughs> Fuck yeah, dude. Um, <laughs> I don't really get the comparison from OW to gigantic. They look nothing. Uh, almost nothing alike. Gigantic is a lot more MOBA than shooter, from what I've seen. I look. I've been playing a lot of gigantic. I will say, I think it depends on which game mode you're playing. But in general, I would compare the moment-to-moment -moment feel of the game much more to Overwatch than any MOBA I've ever played. And I've, I've played all of them. Uh, <laughs> it's like the most, like, maybe Smite. Um, maybe you're thinking of Smite? I don't know. Um, but yeah, the actual like moment to moment of gigantic, like the, the longer game mode does have like towers, but you like build them and it's, it's uh pretty, pretty, uh, different. Um, but yeah, no, I think, I think if you pitched it to someone and they were like, I like overwatch, but I don't like league of legends, I think they would do fine with gigantic. If they're like, I like League, but I hate Overwatch, I would not recommend Gigantic to them. Because <laughs> the actual moment-to-moment -moment gameplay, I think, is much more Overwatch. And it just has, like, an overarching MOBA thing. Um, uh, I also did let my players choose uh, to either weaken the other side of the army by saying, oh, you can ask uh, one to seven of the NPCs to join you, but it'll make their battle harder. They took no NPCs in the end. I think that's awesome, Threads. I think that's a great strat. I think... Uh, you're hitting on something that I think is uh, is is generally good. Of uh, I think uh, because there are I've seen like ways for like NPCs to or not NPCs PCs to like be involved in larger military skirmishes. I think that's something that. A lot of players generally like the fantasy of, but is harder to represent within D and D. It's also very like built within the roots of the like wargaming genre, um, you know, which D and D has a lot of roots in. So, I've seen like some rules for how, like I said, how PCs can like lead groups. But number one, those are extra rules. There's always going to be a contingent of players that don't want to learn extra rules. So. If your players are into, like, learning those extra rules in order to, you know, be able to, like, lead groups of NPCs within a larger military battle or skirmish, da cool. Um, but if you still want to involve your players in those sorts of things without additional rules, I think the way that Threads is going about it is exactly the way that I would go about it, where you have, like, the two generalized forces... And then you have a few objectives. So you have these two forces, and I would, I would, um, what, uh, how would you say it? Uh, I would, I would, um, not ambiguate. That's absolutely the wrong word. Abstract. <laughs> I would abstract these two forces into some sort of a uh, timer. Um, whether that is, if you're keeping the entire thing in initiative, you can make it a round timer. Uh, you can make it a bit D style clock where you just tick the clock uh, every time there's some sort of consequence for like a failed like stealth roll or something. Um, and when the clock, you know, fills up, there's some sort of update with this larger skirmish. Um, and I think that exactly what Threads is saying they can, the PCs can uh, siphon people away from their side. Like, let's say that this is like the PCs side, and then this is, I don't know, the adversaries side. Um, PCs can siphon people away, still giving them that commander sort of feel. They can siphon uh, NPCs away, either to help them. And I would actually say, thinking through this, I would require at least one PC to be with each group of NPCs uh, to go and attack these side objectives. And once you complete these side objectives, these impact the uh, overall conflict in a way that is beneficial for the, end, for the PC side that will affect this overall timer. Um, or affect like the generalized pace and, and scope of the battle. But... 
every group of NPCs that you siphon away from this side makes your side lose faster. So it, that I think that's a good way to like, you know, whatever you have, like however, if it's a clock that updates based on consequences, then maybe you turn it from a, four, a six clock into a four clock Be, for every group of, of, P, of NPCs that you siphon away from your side. Maybe you just make it tick faster. Like maybe it's uh, two ticks um, per round of initiative. I don't know. Um, rather than rather than one. Uh, I think that this is a really good way to represent your PCs leader um, being leaders within a larger military conflict, and just how to represent PCs within a larger military conflict. I think they should. Unless you are involving exterior mechanics and exterior rules, I think it is a very solid uh, way to go about it is to make um, make them just spec ops. Like, th that's the way you should be thinking about them is as a DM, you should present them with back objectives that affect the overall battle. And then they can go after those back objectives, you know, face off against the guardians, the defenses, uh, but they don't actually have to directly impact this massive mass of soldiers because that's something that's a little bit weird and, and wacky in uh, in D&D. &D. Um, uh, if you're going against an enemy army, you just need an army of your own. Then two armies cancel each other out and you can 1v1 the BBG. Essentially, like <laughs> you can you can one v one the BBG. You can one v one you know again the defenses of these objectives. Like you just need if there's an enemy army over here, you need some sort of force on your side, whether or not they're equally matched. And all you have to do to make this feel right is to represent any sort of inequality in power within a very generalized thing, very abstract thing, and then have completing these back objectives affect that abstract thing. And I think that's how you can really tie them all together and make the PCs feel like they're doing something. You can even say, like you can have one of the PCs, if the PCs are really like, I want to fight on the front lines. Grog says he wants to fight on the front lines, Fucking Orion says he wants to fucking sling fireballs at the uh, at the enemy force. You just assimilate that PC into the friendly force, and they affect the abstraction somehow. But I don't think you can run moment to moment with a PC against like an enemy army. I think that that every time I've seen it, every time I've tried it, because I have tried it before. It, it, it becomes really hard to understand what the player is doing. So you either have them do too much to the point where it is de-investing, like they feel like they're having too much of an impact on the battle, or you make them feel like you're having too little of an impact um, and that they should have just gone and done something else. If you ever try to run it, again, like moment to moment... Um, but I think you can run it to moment to moment again with these sort of back objectives that affect the battle as a whole. Um, I never cared. Uh, oh wait, uh, have you ever run Red Hand of Doom? They have a calendar-based system very similar to what you're describing. I haven't. I haven't. I haven't run. I've only run at this point uh, Blades in the Dark and Daggerheart and and Daggerheart barely. I just ran Sable and Messengers. And then I've fishbowled, so I've done like a pretend session against myself of uh, of City of Mist, uh, but I've never run any other systems. I really want to. I want. I want to long term, uh, like within like it's like a year to two year objective for me to run a lot more systems, um, as partially just in general, but also as content for the channel. Um, We've done a big battle once where the PCs could choose to lead a battalion, so spellcasters could do larger, tricky spell stuff, and melee fighters could basically buff a battalion, and rounds became basically 10 minutes instead of 6 seconds. And that's sort of what I was going after with, like, the mechanics. I've seen, I've absolutely seen stuff like that. Um, 
But if your players aren't interested in learning new mechanics, thinking about buffs, like, because that really uh, turns the entirety of the, I think, the D&D into, like, very wargamey. And people are absolutely going to be into that. Even if you don't run at a typically war game table, people absolutely... I, I've, I've met people that love having that be a, like, mini game, essentially. Like, people don't want to play at a war gaming table, but they do want a war gaming mini game at their largely role-playing table. I've, I've absolutely seen and met people like that. Um, so I think that that would appeal to a lot of people. Um, but I think if you have a table that's more like Vox, that I don't think that would appeal to them quite as much. Um, so I, again, I think that having them be more of a spec ops sort of deal would appeal to them a little bit more. Um, you're playing Total War, not D&D. &D. Kind of, yeah. Which some people are really into that, you know? Sirkonos and the others kind of nod. Sirkonos looks at the rest of you, brings up his one hand and kind of gives a, a, a touch to his top of his chest and sternum and bows his head and goes, I wish you all great luck. See you on the inside. And the rest of the uh, fire shari turn into uh, burning fire elemental forms and begin to streak through the various broken rocks and piece of glass shattered obsidian that peppered this landscape within the caldera, leaving the six of you ready to trek forward yourself. Scanlan, can you do that? Uh, no. No, and I don't think I could learn. Oh. Perfect. Yeah. So, let's go. Avoid the skeletons. Avoid the skeletons. Let's, let's, let's take a look at least. What? We, we were supposed to make sure they're not part of something larger that's heading in. They're in the way, Keyleth. Did you not just hear my father? He said if they don't bother us, then to leave them alone, but we should just check to make sure that they're not part of something. Are they in a path at all? Like, do they look like they're going to be near us when we go? They look like wherever you're traveling, because there's an open expanse of about 80 or so feet before you actually reach the edge of the Cinder Grove, and they're right on the outskirts of the Cinder Grove Forest, so lest you're very careful, they would technically see you if they're paying attention. Yes. We'll tread gently and see if they react. Do you have pass without a trace, Vex? I do. Didn't but, we... Keyleth, the minute we start fighting, they will notice us, and then they'll attack us from behind. So we would be best to get their attention now, when things are quiet. We also don't want to waste all of our abilities on Undead. There's not, there's only two, Are maybe four of them. There's yeah, well, there's, there's nothing wrong with the four of them that we see. Let's. Why don't we just tread that way and we'll see what happens? That's exactly <laughs> what I'm saying. What could happen? I guess I used Pass Without a Trace on all of us. You did. Did we already have it? Oh, that's. Did we already have it? Yeah, we did. From last time? Last time. Is it so you're maintaining your concentration. How long does it last for? Your concentration? Um, I believe it's, it's, it holds for up to an hour. An hour, yeah. So you can still be under that effect. Sure. Awesome. I'd like all six of you to roll stealth checks for me if you could. Okay. <laughs> With triple advantage? <laughs> no. No. Just the plus 10, which is better than a 25. Triple advantage. 30. Um, uh, 28. 38. 30. 38. Fourteen. <laughs> plus ten? With the plus ten. All right. <laughs> Incredible. <laughs> As you see, like it's very it's very it's just, it's just walking with a giant ass, man. Just so, as the entire group kind of bends down into a ninja-like stance, just darting across as fast as they can, keeping low to the ground and using much of the shadow of the overhead clouds and smoke that has completely engulfed uh, the above skyscape, uh, behind you, bounding very loudly, is a, a gentle gnome Swishing brown hair. I'm trying to do that thing that the Ashari just did. Right, it's not working. Uh, hot, hot, hot. And as you're darting across, you're jumping over little little open uh, globules of, of uh, molten uh, lava that is starting to pour out from various uh, crevices in the stone floor. You're trying to hop around to avoid that, and and in doing so, your foot catches the edge of a piece of stone, and you begin to go to a tumble, make an acrobatics check. Oh yes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oh, disadvantage because I'm exhausted. You are. Oh <laughs> shit! I forgot about that. The honest no. Uh, okay. Uh, dee 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 dee. Uh, fourteen. <laughs> <laughs> You do manage to catch yourself with a slight tumble, skid a bit on your ass and kind of landing your feet. It would have been a cool three-point landing if anyone else had attempted it, but you just uh, barely catch yourself. <laughs> Look back at the group with a sheepish grin, and out of the corner of your eye, you see one of the undead entities kind of turn its head and look Stop right in your direction. It's all <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Starts just kind of wandering your direction. Should we engage or keep going? Uh, I'm afraid if we engage, it could draw attention to an entire slew of what could be around. Let's just put it down quietly. All right, it's just... No magic. No, just, just an, weapons. No guns. No guns. I pull my sword. Vex, I you might be I the most capable for this. Arrow. All right, roll for an attack. Okay. Oh, just going for it. 
Okay. Wow. I'm, I'm literally, I'm cursed. Uh, I think I cursed myself sometime between here and well, you know, the, the San D20s talk to each other and they know that you're, uh, that uh, you're not true. 18. <laughs> Wander. 18. Uh, that hits. Okay. Go ahead and roll damage. Can I attack on her heels when she's done? Uh, at this distance, you can. It'll take a little bit to rush up if you want to. Feet, huh? No, that's the wrong. About, they're roughly a. I'll say this one about sixty feet from you. So if you wanted to. That's my distance. With your. Oh, if you go full speed, you can. Daggers. Fifteen oh, damage. Wrong. Fifteen damage on which one of the. Oh, and it's a sneak attack, right? Because uh, I'm hidden. It would be from you, yes. Um, the extra um, two. So what? Extra, extra two? two. Okay. So this is against one of the zombies, or one of the skeletons. I was doing the one that was walking towards us. I thought the other ones were still. And, and that would be one of the zombies. Yeah. Okay. If you got it. Great. All right, the arrow streaks through the air, slamming into the chest, and you see it just kind of embeds itself, causing a piece of tendon to kind of snap and curl back inside the torso. Its arm kind of falls a little more limp than it was previously, but it just kind of keeps walking forward. I hide. All right, go ahead and roll a check. You? Uh, is, is the, are there, they're all grouped together? Uh, three of them are grouped together by the tree, the one that notices, like slowly wandering. All right, so I'm going to throw at that one as well. Okay. 39. Uh, Stealth. All right. I'm just going to throw one, and just to check, I'm. St- Still, I'm hidden, yeah, so right. so this is the assassinate, this is, I have advantage because it hasn't gone yet, and it's a crit because I'm surprising it. Mm-hmm. So it's... Wow. Uh, 25. 25. With that, as this zombie entity is hobbling forward, the dagger strikes it right in the center of the skull, through uh, right where its mouth and jaw hinge hit, severs the base of the skull to the spine, and the head just rolls off <laughs> onto the ground underneath. The body just kind of takes two more steps before <laughs> Falling forward. Does any other? Yeah. Did they all know? Did any of the other ones notice this? Um, all the, all the the other undead creatures all of a sudden turn into the forest as opposed to towards where the uh, death sh- happened, and you see running out from the forest towards you, a blue-skinned humanoid rushing out, arms in the air. Stop! 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 What you're doing? Stop it! What have you done? What have you fucking done? It wasn't hurting anybody. I don't understand it. Jesus Christ, these are not easy to make! Are we, ki- are we killing this one? Oh, no, no, don't, no, don't, don't kill him. No, 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 no. He's precious. What did who, I do? Who are you? Who are you? Who are you? You're fucking shooting at me! You're asking me questions! These are zombies! These are undead! They were attacking us! They were attacking him! These were in my employ! Oh. Well, you should keep a leash on them, then! That would be inhumane, wouldn't it? <laughs> They're not human! Well, they were! That's very disrespectful of you, I don't appreciate are it! Are they pets? Are they friends? Where were They're you? friend pets! You have to be around, though, yes, to keep well, an eye on them. I know, but... Okay. <laughs> okay. So as a guest entrance, as a guest entrance, I I like it. The thing that I was writing on the screen that I was I was I was kind of waiting to uh, say the general opinion. In general, when it comes to optional hooks, and you won't be surprised if you've watched my like how to give quests in D and D video. Um, when it comes to like optional hooks like this, I really like them just being present in the environment, just like doing stuff, rather than like, you know, running up to the PCs. And then if the PCs choose to engage with it, then that can like kick off other stuff. Um, and like to to contrast, like if he had just, like if like the, all of the undead had just like run up to them while the fire shari were still around, uh, I think that would have been a little bit worse than them just like standing there and the party having to decide whether or not to engage with them. And the thing that I I wrote that I think is a a good, uh, maybe poignant thought is um, the, the, the choice is essentially, do we engage or avoid if they're just standing there versus if they run up to you, is it, do we engage or disengage? So the difference between the two is avoiding versus disengaging. And I think in general, players are a lot less likely to disengage from a quest hook or a plot hook, even if they're not interested, frankly. Um, I think a lot of players will just kind of follow along. But if you present them with all of these optional quest hooks in a way where they would have to disengage from the hook in order to not do it, that can be a component of like going down like the railroading road of like, if people feel like they have to actively remove themselves from your plot that you're like pushing at them, that can be a part of the component feelings of feeling like you're railroading. Um, 
So having just like a hook just sitting there that they could choose to avoid, I think goes much more towards the more non-linear, open world sort of feel that I think a lot of D&D players really enjoy. Um, that's not to say that you always have to do that. Like some, like you can mix it up a lot. Um, but I do think that that's kind of the, the core difference between the two. In terms of introducing a guest, it, it, totally fun. Totally fun. I'm assuming he would have run out of the forest one way or the other because, you know, they have to get him in. I also love, what are we at? 2337? Very early. They're getting better. Because when did he end his recap? That's only 13 minutes. 13 minutes out of a two-hour 55 session, they are starting to get their guests in a lot quicker. I will say, I totally forgot Chris Hardwick was here. <laughs> now, I think that's partially because, you know, I'm pausing and talking. I think the general audience wouldn't have forgotten that quickly. Um, <laughs> but I love, 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 love how much quicker... Uh, both Zara and Cashaw came in last time and how much quicker they're getting Chris Hardwick's character in here. Really love that. Getting them, and I, I said it with Zara and Cashaw, even if Chris Hardwick comes in right now and does basically nothing for 30 minutes, I think that is better than bringing him in 30 minutes later. <laughs> Because theoretically, he can make a quippy joke, he can role play, he can interact, even if it's not like super deep, he at least has the option to interact with the other people at the table. Um, so, big thumbs up on, get, on how early they're getting him in. Um, I've been traveling out here for a while and so they, they provide a layer of protection. Certainly not great, now. Now there were four, now there's three. Well, listen, when we see these things without an owner around, we take them out, I'm sorry, it's pretty standard. This can't be the first time this has happened. It does happen at quite a lot, actually. <laughs> now that I think about it, it's probably a little bit on me. <laughs> you can make them vests or something, well, maybe, some service. Yeah, That's a nice idea, is there a vest maker? Uniform, so a puppy mask on them or something so people know they're nice. Certainly, yeah, yeah, masks and vests, that's a great idea. You, you, you see a green before you, uh, a blue-scaled dragonborn, if you would like to describe your- Okay, that's unironically an awesome idea. If, <laughs> if you're playing a necromancer in D&D, &D, or even like any sort of summoner, if you're a Pact of the Chain Warlock, if you're a fucking Ranger Beastmaster, if you're a Drake Warden, getting your summon a little indicator that they are a summon is, <laughs> is unironically a good idea. And I am thinking about this now, and I am think like, it's pretty common for, like, you know, DMs to be like, whoa, there's a fucking bear in my tavern. Matt's done it. I totally approved of it when he did it. Um, <laughs> but I think you could do that even more as a DM while also having, you know, maybe presenting uh, an NPC that has this sort of conversation. But that's hilarious. It makes me laugh, but also it's a good idea. <laughs> Yourself for the party. Yes, I'm, uh... <laughs> I, sorry, I forgot to... Where are my manners? Uh, my name is Gern Blanston. Um, no, it's not. It's Gern Blanston. <laughs> oh my God. This one's very rude. Yes, yes, yes. yes, yes. yes. You look exhausted. <laughs> He's just short. This volcano, right. do you live near here? This volcano really takes the piss no, out of No, 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 I don't live near here. I'm, listen, I, 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 I've been traveling. I'm a simple candle maker. Oh. Simple. What are you doing on top of a volcano? Why a volcano have... is, is nature's candle. What a stupid question. You make candles, but you also make undent. Yes, they're, yes, they're like people candles. Can I inside and see if he's telling the truth? Go for it. Our lives are so bizarre now. <laughs> Uh, 17. 17. Okay, really quick point. If you're a player, I don't know what sort of ground rules Vox Machina has in terms of guest PCs and if they could turn out to be evil. <laughs> I don't know what sort of ground rules or like fences or gates that they have on that. My assumption, typically, is that guest PCs are at least not going to be an adversary to the party. Maybe they are quasi-evil off-screen. 
Garthok, probably not a great dude uh, off off uh, off table. Um, but my my general assumption is typically that they are not you know actively evil. If you're a player, I've already gone over you know how fucking much Fox Machina insights. But especially this, I there, there's a certain like there's a certain balancing act, right? Of like it's interesting to treat a guest player as if they are a stranger and basically how you would treat an NPC when you first meet them. But also, doing this insight check takes up time. And I know I've said this sort of thing before, and people are, and I've gotten comments that are like, "Oh, the time is negligible." I disagree. It adds up. <laughs> and if you want to like waste, I, I, I even, I'll put big air quotes around it. If you want to spend that time as a party during your normal campaign, I think that's fair and that's a choice. Um, but I do think in general, it would be better to maybe lay off the insight checks on someone that you, based on the ground rules that you're playing around, probably isn't an adversary um and just like get to the other stuff quicker because even something like an insight check doesn't provide a huge amount of room for the uh character or for the player to role play so even if you want to do like a i don't trust you sort of like role play beat just engaging them with that in words, I think is more fun and entertaining to the guest player than getting insight checked and uh, the DM telling the party uh, what you feel <laughs> and about you. Um, he's telling the truth. <laughs> um, Why is my brain tingling? Is someone doodling around inside there? <laughs> Just she, she, she eyes you up and down, trying to basically get a feel for whether or not you were who I make you? special candles. I make special candles. I'm searching for some magical items up here in this volcano. I understand there was a wee bit of damage not long ago from a dragon had torn through the region, and so I'm just searching for scraps to make these simple candles. That's why I was in a. I, uh, uh, this is my uh, my red, my dance vest. Uh, <laughs> I think dancing is very important. I'm alone most of the time. It keeps me occupied. They have no appreciation for the arts, these undead creatures that are friend pets, and um, you know, I've just been uh, digging around up here, seeing what I can scrounge up and find. What are you, what are you not? Well, well, are they special candles or are they simple candles? Well, some are simple, some some just create light, and others create tragedy for people. They're, They're magical candles? Yes, in a word. Cursed Actually, candles. magic is the perfect word. Right? Candles. Candles. Tell me, here's the patronage of uh, your candle business. I mean, I sell to, you know, no, no one in particular, really, just, uh, I have to be a little choosy about who gets the candles, but, uh, you know, it's something that I've crafted over the years. I... Well, we feel dreadful about killing one of your pets. I feel, I'm so sorry. Perhaps we could <laughs> purchase a candle off of you for to make to make amends. Well, maybe you could just kill someone else, and then I could just bring them back. I mean, that would be a wonderful way to repay. Well, you know what? We're on our way to do just that Stick around. That thing. Really? Things do tend to die around us a lot. Sometimes larger things, sometimes smaller things. Would you, you like a body to reanimate or something? You might get something even bigger. Are you than... inviting me to come along with you? I don't know, are we? <laughs> Did I just invite myself to come along with you? <laughs> well, maybe, like, if you give us one of those tragedy candles, you know, we could always like, light it for somebody. That could be good down the road. Oh, 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 do you, oh like, like candles for funerals? That's sad. We well, do have a lot of tragedies. They're like, we bake somebody a cake, we shove a candle on the top and we give it to them. I don't oh. think that would be a grand idea unless you didn't like the person very much. Well, that's yeah. what I meant, yeah. Well, I think for now I'll just hold on to the candles that I have and just see see how things pan out. I really don't know any of you, so... We're sure. yeah. Vox Machina, a traveling band of adventurers led by me, Scammon Shorthalt, and uh, <laughs> these are my compatriots. We're on a, uh, we're on a very important <laughs> mission to get... Uh, what are we doing again? Uh, we're trying to, to close this giant rift that we, we are walking into. Break something big and scary. Well, what's your name again? To... Scanlan Short. No, what's the name of your group? Vox, Vox Machina. Machina. No offense, but that sounds like a shite band. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Are you musicians? It's better than Tragedy Candle, really. I mean, that's kind of a shite band. To be well, that was really. <laughs> <laughs> they opened for Vox Machina! <laughs> <laughs> that's a hot oh. head! Fantastic. Oh, I'm not thinking of the right thing. That's all right. Uh, I'm a musician. Excellent. But uh, these people, they can't really hold a tune so much. Listen, seeing as how that you killed one of my uh, undead thralls, it'd be really nice if I could join you to see if maybe we can scrounge up some other things along the way. And you help us. Yeah. I mean, we'll see how it pans out, but I feel like 
everything would come to an abrupt ending if I just walked away at this point. <laughs> it be very strange. It's thoroughly unsatisfying for anyone else who might be witnessing this exchange. Your, uh, your undead pets, are they gonna try to eat our brains or anything? No, no, they're just fine. That right there is Coral, and that's Stimpy, and that's Fatty. I... <laughs> I really have to wonder if Chris and Matt talked about a less silly contrivance. <laughs> I don't know. I honestly, I honestly can't tell. I can't tell if they just didn't talk about it or if Chris is going off into improv land. I don't really care, honestly. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I, I have to wonder. I will say, I, it depends on the party, on like how much your party is good with kind of like making like, Kind of, uh, uh, this is the less silly. <laughs> this, is the le this is the less silly one. That he's going with them to, uh, that he's going towards this dangerous planar rift just to, just to get an extra body. <laughs> I'll just say, I think in general, it's probably better to have a more like concrete contrivance that makes a little bit more sense <laughs> for why the guest is going to join. But also, <laughs> like, I think this is very much a thing where it really depends on how down your like so i i i've been very vocal of like you don't want to deinvest your players like that's like generally uh, a thing you want things to feel real and concrete when it comes to guest players i'm a little bit less uh critical of maybe less concrete contrivances I think more often, if you have like a concrete thing like Garthok, like I think Garthok had like a solidly concrete thing of like why he was going with them. I think that will generally be better, but also super. I think this is one of those things that really depends on your table and is probably very, very, uh, you just got to feel out your players. Um, and I do like his energy. <laughs> I do like his energy, Daniel. There are a lot of bodies. There are a lot of bodies there. <laughs> uh, even the contrived nature amuses me quite a bit. I know, me too. Me too. And like, I'm, I'm way less into contrivances when they're part of like the normal campaign and will have like probably like broader reaching implications like i'm i'm less into this sort of like silly thing but when it's a guest player that will explicitly like not be their next session i have a higher level that i will suspend my disbelief for um and just like go along with the silliness and just like have a have a moment of levity for um so yeah i don't know I think I'm a bigger fan of hanging lampshades than most people. Did I just invite myself immediately wins me over? I, yeah, yeah. I, I it, like, the entire way that this has gone down, like, I can't complain about this at all. I think you're going to have maybe more general success, but it's super dependent on your table. If you make your guest contrivances a little bit more concrete, a little less silly. But this is one where there's a wide spectrum and it really depends on your players as to whether or not they'll be into this. Yeah, buckle. <laughs> Who was the one that we killed? Oh, that was Carol. Very sad, very oh. sad indeed. Yeah. Carol and Coral. Carol, Carol and Coral. Coral. I get them confused. No, 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 they were not initially related, but uh, we became a makeshift family oh, that's, after a while. That's very beautiful. It's, uh, I, noticed the, I noticed subtle differences that the most of the living doesn't notice. Oh, we're supposed to be doing yeah, something you what, Dad, we're actually... It's it's kind of dangerous around this. Very, I don't know. Very press on, Gather. and you can join us with your family. Please, that would be very nice. What, what was your name one more time? Gern Blanston. Yeah, okay. Gern. Yes, well, let's yeah. go. Let's move okay. along then, Gern. Yeah, you could uh, come along with your herd of. Can you fight and stuff in case yeah, shit goes down? If you make magical candles, you must know a little bit of magic, correct? I'm a little bit better of a. I don't disagree, Daniel. I think it took up. It. it I think it was overall a net negative. 
but that's not because it didn't have positives. <laughs> like sometimes things that are net negatives are like slight negative, no positive. I think that the bingo had like a decent amount of positives. It just had too many negatives to go along with it. I, I do sometimes miss the CR bingo. Spellcaster than I am a fisticuffs type of person. Okay, perfect. Right. Sure. That's We're fine. short on magic people. That's wonderful. Excellent. No offense. <laughs> <laughs> All taken. <laughs> We move along. <laughs> uh, are forward. we still trying to stealth forward, or is it, does yeah. it even matter at this point? Your dead no things three. don't stealth, I would Trace assume. <laughs> they're, they're, they're not very delicate, unfortunately. <laughs> no. no, they're really for protection. The uh, Now, the zombies can really take a lot of damage to the front of the chest, and the skeletons are quite quick, actually. Yes. So, you know, wow. they, they've, they've been fairly good for a while. All right. Good to know. Uh, we head towards the thing. We head stealthily. To the thing! Stealthily. <laughs> To the thing! Go ahead and make a stealth check if you don't mind, Gurn. Uh, does my pass without a trace work on him too? Does it like envelop nope. him? Nope. Oh, Roll he's high. not there. Eleven. Eleven? Plus. He's not under pass without a trace. No. no. And then, uh, yeah, no, okay. So <laughs> yeah. as you guys begin stealthily, there is a couple <laughs> heavy footfalls of the lumbering dragon. Oh, dragon feet. <laughs> <laughs> no tail on this one. No oh, tail. Uh, what happened? Please don't ask me about okay, this. Okay, I won't. <laughs> um, yeah, the only dragonborn you seen without a tail was the paladin that worked in the council, uh, Topher Bertoris. Um, so that, that does catch your attention a little bit. Um, not just the dragon more lumbering, but now the three undead that are <laughs> stepping behind. Worse than trinkets, Kevin. Stealth is going to be a thing going forward. Yeah. <laughs> okay. As you guys begin. Sorry, to these fall, dragon lips can't whistle. <laughs> <laughs> Mostly just fire comes out. And it's at that point you hear the <laughs> cracking of what sounds like heavy timber, oh, no more than thirty feet away from you. You all stop in place suddenly, and you glance over, and you can see the flickering of the light of what appears to be some sort of a, a, a flame-based elemental energy that's tearing over the side of a newly fallen petrified, uh, petrified, petrified tree. Look what you've done to me! <laughs> <laughs> this is your fault. Gurn, <laughs> son of a bitch. <laughs> Purple hearts, green stars. <laughs> Purple <laughs> hearts. <laughs> hey, seen some shit. See, this <laughs> special <laughs> veterans edition of the uh, lucky charms. Very, very lucky charms. Very lucky charms. Um, <laughs> shit. <laughs> So, oh, that got dark. Yeah, how about that? Oh, um, back to normal then, eh? <laughs> yeah. So, as, as the flame begins to trickle and burn over the edge, you can see there is an intelligence to it. There are a couple of arms that kind of rise up the side as the head pops over and glances and stops in place, frozen, staring over in the direction of the bounding dragonborn. It's a, it's a fire elemental? It appears it's smaller than what you're used to seeing, but it is. Dude, you know what Matt's description just reminded me of? Of him talking, like, even just the way that he just emoted? of bum bum like it even like something as small as like the dun 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 like i think a lot of times if i'm thinking about it someone who i think is not <laughs> quite as like actory good at emoting is that i would you know be like I, I i it would look a lot sillier and a lot less fluid and someone that i've been watching recently uh, I'm gonna do, I guess, a little, uh, a little plug, I guess. Um, someone that I've been been watching recently that I need to remind myself. I don't actually remember their their channel name, uh, but that I've been thinking about them in terms of how to describe my monsters because they they are basically a um, they're a puppeteer. And they do a lot of animal puppets as, long, as well as like human puppets. Um, but a lot of them are animal puppets. And it is up. Oh, this is it. Burnaby, Burnaby Dixon. Here, let me let me see. Let me show it. Uh, can you guys see that? Yeah, there we go. This dude's fucking awesome. Uh, a lot of the way that his things move. Like, let me let me see this. I don't know if you can hear it. Oh, it's muted. Yeah, that's fine. That's actually probably better that it's muted. But he's controlling this with uh, just his hands. And, like, the way that it all moves, I don't know. This isn't even actually one of the, one of the more impressive ones, I think. Um, I don't know if I've seen any of these. Um... But I, I don't know. I've been I've been watching this guy recently and thinking about how to describe my more like animalistic adversaries. And Matt's like little bit there just really reminded me of it. Of like he seems to have it. <laughs> like Matt seems to have it in a way that I do not. 
uh, when I when I think about you know my, the more bestial or animalistic adversaries. Um, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> it's indeed uh, a creature made of elemental flame. Um, I would he be considered a primordial? Uh, it would be considered an elemental. Okay, I'm gonna go fire elemental. Okay, so you're using your transform. I'm gonna transform and go into my fire elemental. Is this the first time you've done that? No, 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 she's, okay. Uh, it's the first. Is this the first time I've I think it's the first time you've been fire elemental, yeah. yeah. Really? Yeah. Yeah. So, you guys watch as Keyless form suddenly erupts into flame, which freaks you out for a second as you're yeah. uncertain Sick. as to whether or not she did that. Keyless! Are you all right? In fire elemental, in elemental, she's like, <laughs> does it still look like Keyless? What does it look like? Uh, it has, for a moment, an essence of Keyleth's kind of more life form than- He did set that shall low? I did not know that. <laughs> I did not know that. That sucks. Well, you watched the, the two things. I guess it's just a lesson to think about your, uh, your movements more. Uh, shit, didn't know that. That sucks. Um, uh, alternatively, you could always use and hopefully get sponsored by uh, Describ. I don't know what Describ is. I'll have to look into it. Dude. <laughs> oh, man. Speaking of sponsors, uh, Paige heard me talking about, like, making a joke about, like, Wormwood the other day. And um, apparently, she has been, she has been getting... Um, Oh, it said describe. That makes sense. Um, she's been getting apparently wormwood, um, <laughs> wormwood like reels on Instagram that is just like them like building these like gaming tables. And uh, she heard me. She, I came out of stream the other day, and she was like, "Were you talking about wormwood?" And I was like, "Yeah, they're a." Sponsor of Critical Role. I, I don't know if they're sponsoring them anymore. Oh, she's coming in to talk about it. I want to clarify oh. that I do not get... I did get their reels once upon a time. That was yeah, several right. months ago. Yeah, I eat the mic. I now just watch their stuff. I follow them, and they only post ads about their tables, <laughs> and I just watch them for fun. <laughs> And so she was telling me about this, and I was like, Paige, there's a there's a non-zero chance. Like, there's a world out there where, you know, like like a Wormwood sponsorship is not out of grasp for me. Uh, like we could like get sponsored by them uh and, <laughs> and and like get a table. And she's like, that would make every sacrifice we have ever made for this worth it <laughs> instantly uh she was like the, she was like i would want one of their coffee tables so bad um <laughs> or table tables well but uh, she says both um uh, but anyways uh super geek uh mike is sponsored by them a good bit Ooh, that's interesting that's very interesting uh i might talk to him about that <laughs> Uh, so there's probably quite a few content creators that have terrible views they just don't talk about. Yeah. Yeah, you, you do, you do not know anybody online. Uh, you don't know, you don't know anything about me <laughs> besides what I actively choose to, to portray to you. Um, yeah, there's you, yeah, content creators are not your friends. They should not be role models, probably, generally. Uh, because, yeah, quite a few of them are probably real fucking trash shitheads. Um, unfortunately. Um, the stream was invaded. The stream was invaded. They're listening. Uh, their BTS vlog, IMO is better than their actual products. Oh, no! That sucks. <laughs> uh, there's so much I could say about Wormwood, but I won't say anything. Oh, no. Oh, no. Is it because we'll find things out through the... Through the course of of the of the show, Ugh. um, sometimes it's uh better in a watching a train wreck kind of way. Oh no, they're exposed for treating workers badly or something along those lines. That's why CR doesn't sponsor them anymore. Oh, yikes, that sucks. Uh, careful, I'm pretty sure CR cut ties. Ooh, well, that sucks. I mean. It, 
if I, I, you know, I don't, I don't generally make it my, I, I don't generally hear about things or generally search things out, but I will say before I ever take any sort of sponsorship, even if it's a sponsorship that I actively seek out, like at some point in the future, I am going to actively seek out a World Anvil sponsorship, but I am also going to do more research into any potential like news or allegations about World Anvil before I ever actually do that. Because right now, I I would like to, but I haven't done enough research to feel that like if they if they were also down, I would need to do more to feel comfortable having them actually on the stream. Um, so. There are probably going to be brands or people or whatever that I mention. <laughs> God, two in a row. Barnaby Dixon and then Wormwood. Um, where I am just wholly unaware. Um, but before I ever like took anyone's money, uh, I would absolutely do a lot more research into them. Um, there have been a few accusations with less than ideal outcomes. Sounds, I think, like roll 20 probably. If I had to guess slash assume, although maybe it sounds more, uh, more like, uh, more serious than the roll 20 allegations. Um, we know everything about you. Your last name is man and your middle name is megaphone. <laughs> yeah. Stream has had a lot of controversial people in it. I know that was not the intent. Uh, <laughs> parasocial relationships are a bit weird. Yeah. Yeah. A bit. I mean, it's, it's, um, I I don't want to like pretend like I am immune to it in any stretch of the imagination, but I try to be very very aware of it. Of like when things come out about some someone that you like, they like you're liking them and you feeling like you have watched so much of their stuff and they've never been a shithead before. So I think there's a I, I'm very empathetic to it. Like, there's a very, like, gut reaction of, like, no, this, like, person could never be a shithead, you know? This person could never be a shithead. Uh, I felt that way about, um, Tobuscus. Like, when, when the, when all of the Tobuscus allegations came out, I fucking grew up watching that dude, you know? Like, I, I, I watched... Every single, uh, I, I, I watched every single video of his for like years. And so when all of the allegations came out, my gut reaction was like, there's no way. There's no way. But obviously, there is very much way. There is, and like, I very quickly got rid of those gut reactions. Um, don't look up what he's like now. Oh, no, I'm very aware of what he's like now. That is why I'm bringing this up, is because he's a total fucking trash bag. Um, and I, uh, and yeah, that was, that. Was, so that's what I'm saying. It's like, I don't want to say, like, I'm immune to this parasocial shit, but it's, uh, it's tough. It's, it's, it's really tough, and you never really know what any of your creators, like, they could appear pretty chill, for a long time, for years, and then turn out to super not be chill. <laughs> and uh, you always have to keep that in the back of your mind. Ooh, I have not washed this in long enough. I just, I'm getting like the last remnants and it smells a bit moldy. Um, <laughs> gross. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, yeah. Uh, Sierra uh, tends to cut ties with problematic people, but they definitely have still had problematic people on the show before it was known. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I'm aware of like the, um, like the host of like Talks Machina. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I mean, you can't avoid it, especially if you have guests as often as them. You, like, just by the numbers, you're gonna have someone on that's controversial in in some way or in some circle. Uh, I'm a K-pop fan, and some other fans can be absolutely scary about their faves in terms of feeling like they own them. Yeah, oh yeah. Uh, I wonder when the Harry Potter books will me be mentioned. Oh my God. Well, I mean, yeah. And Harry Potter's a whole, it's hard. I've used Harry Potter, you know, analogies, references, because it's such a well-known work of fiction. 
And so it's it's a very easy reference to make when like explaining something or when referencing like an a, an overall idea. Um, but yeah, J.K. Rowling sucks. <laughs> and yeah, I don't know. And and you have something yeah that like so many people grew up reading, grew up loving. It made it made such a positive impact on their lives. And how do you separate that? It's tough. I don't know. I'm not a I'm not a um relationship uh commentator <laughs> uh this stream contains many riffs of different types a bit yeah 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 uh i play with mike paid game and it's for sure an added layer of word to the parasocial dynamic since we're closer than the average youtuber fan but i'm still paying him for a product absolutely yeah that is that is a very weird layer to it i definitely understand yeah as a non-binary, I, I have HP stuff, but won't ever spend another cent. Uh, they are in my closet right for right now. Yeah, I think that's fair. Uh, hoping you don't turn out to be a secret bigot. Me too. Uh, <laughs> but uh, if in the rare case everyone was wrong about you, you'll be known as megaphobia. <laughs> that's fair. I all. <laughs> I mean. I'll say it. I don't think I'm a secret picket. Uh, I will say I I have had unsavory views in the past. I'm not going to pretend like I haven't. I grew up very, very Catholic and would consider past me pretty homophobic. Um, a, even though there are ways that I identify now that don't really gel with that. Um, but yeah, I mean, I mean, people absolutely like if if i never brought that up no one would ever know uh and it's a very scary thing to think about um i feel like i've grown and evolved past that um but everyone could always be keeping secrets from you yeah um my rule of thumb for harry potter is uh mention don't buy as long as i don't financially support her yeah that's fair um that's fair megaphobe man yeah Oy, oy, oy. <laughs> Do you happen to know any like non problematic creators? Just wondering, <laughs> dude. I don't know, man. I it's it's so it's I'm also like very out of like the news cycle, so sometimes I just don't even hear about like problematic shit that happens. Um, yeah, uh, I actually brought up a bunch of CR clothes explicitly to bulk out my wardrobe so I can remove the HP stuff. Fair enough, yeah. 14 year old me calling stuff I don't like gay, 20 year old, uh, 28 year old bisexual me. I feel that. I feel that. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> I read all the seven Harry Potter books as a kid. Now the author would probably not like me very much. Yeah. Uh, so I don't know. It's, it's tough. The whole thing is tough. And, um, unfortunately, I, I don't I don't have a lot of information or insight to give other than uh, be skeptical. Uh, I'm not your friend. No one's your friend unless you know them in real life. Probably. <laughs> uh, so. I'll go with that. <laughs> Than most elementals would, but still these like long curling flame like arms, these eyes that glow a bright white fire in the center of the face. Other than that, relatively formless, other than what looks like where her hair would be, these wisps of flame kind of curl behind her. Pretty freaking sick. Mm. So, Can you talk to it? That's right, I'm gonna go, dude. Awesome. So as you approach the elemental form, so I approach and I'm gonna kind of like, like do the animal instinct thing and kind of poof up, and poof up, make myself look real big. The creature behind the form you can see is like drifting away from the uh, the trunk of the tree. Oh, it's running from me. It's turned away and it's moving away from oh. you. Yeah. That was easy. <laughs> Deuces. And I roll back. <laughs> All right, cool. I, turn I thought we were supposed to keep them from coming out into this world. Are we? Wait. Are we not in the? Are we in the fire plane yet? We're no, no, you're just, you're, you're in the caldera to... Oh, we're in the caldera. Yeah, you haven't traveled or traversed the plane. You're still, okay, you're I making your way in, into know. the remnants of the cinder grove. Okay. Maybe you should ask it then to I'm go back. I'm going to say, hold! In. Oh, dude. Uh, <laughs> you, guys, you, guys, you guys want some fucking drama? I, I'll make this really quick, um, but I want it to be known so that people do not buy this fucking product. Um, so I'll, I'll make it fast. Um... Seng LED, smart bulbs. Uh, S E N G L E D, smart bulbs. Don't fucking buy them. Uh, if you remember, I was talking about how, like, 
I had some smart devices that someone got access to the account and customer support told me they couldn't force log out. Um, I deleted my account, but I still have some of the bulbs plugged in uh, and like on like my land Warning. and shit. Ad incoming. This will be Take perfect. Cover. I'll describe it all before the ad. Uh, still have some of them in. Whoever uh, logged in and hacked into, or not even hacked, probably just like got the password. Whoever got the password to the account uh, is still logged in and is still fucking with shit, even though I deleted my account. Deleted it. <laughs> Do you understand how insane that is? I can still, and I can still control them. I can still ask my fucking Alexa to like turn off and on the lights. I deleted the account. Deleted it. It's gone. I can't log into it. I tried. And they are still controllable by other people. <laughs> so, Sang LED, don't fucking touch their shit. Fuck you, Sang LED. Time for an ad. <laughs> oh my god. So, insane. Insane.
Oh my god, very uh very good timing. We still got 27 seconds left on the ad. I will say, I'm not a legal expert. So when it comes to like GDPR, I don't know. That was that was some shit that our uh, that our legal departments <laughs> dealt with. Uh so I don't know. Um but I saw a comment that I actually do want to go into. And I know this has already been a six second, uh, well, I guess including the ad time. This has already been a long tangent. Um, but I actually think that this is both interesting and important for people to know. Um, so, G Herkup, why would someone hack your light bulbs? Are they going to ask for ransom? Why would someone hack my light bulb? So, I have these, these fucking Curly Q light bulbs, right? Uh, why would someone hack the account associated with these? Like, what, what the fuck does that do for them? This is a really good example of operational security, called, also called OPSEC. Um, so this account that controls my light bulbs has some sort of email associated with it. So we'll say, like, I don't know, fucking megaphoneman0 at gmail.com and some sort of password related to it. Uh, grog forever one exclamation point. <laughs> uh, and then this specific account doesn't have this, but many, many smart bulb accounts, many smart accounts, just accounts in general will very, very often have a pin associated. One, two, three, four. They'll have like a four digit, six digit, whatever pin. The purpose of why would someone want to hack a light bulb? Mega doxed his email. <gasps> um, the purpose of why someone would want to hack a light bulb, specifically, I'm not even going to talk about like accounts in general, but a big, big reason that someone might want to hack light bulbs, specifically, like smart devices, smart light bulbs, is because you can see it from the outside. So it is a very, very easy social engineering connection point. If I know your email, your password, and your... I don't... That, that fucking line is terrible. Uh, if I know all of this stuff about you, and I want to confirm, or I want to find out... Let's say that somehow I've bought it from another company... I know that Megaphone Man lives on, uh, let me think of a street that I don't live on. Uh, <laughs> let's, say I, let's say I know that Megaphone Man lives on Washington Street. Let's say, let's say we know that, that Megaphone Man lives on Washington Street. We don't know where. And they really want to learn more about you. This is something that I legitimately had to deal with at my last job. I had a very high security clearance. There were legitimately uh, foreign adversaries that did enact like social engineering uh, activities on people where I worked. Uh, it's also why they always told us to not walk around with your badge out. So like, don't go and like pump your gas or go into the gas station on the way to work with your badge out. Because legitimately spies were, were watching out for that sort of thing. Um, so, I know that you live on Washington Street. I gain access to this smart bulb. I turn off and on your smart bulbs at very distinct times. The times where this is happening is like 1 or 2 a.m. So, they can pretty safely assume that most people are going to be uh, asleep and they're not going to be turning on and off their lights in weird patterns. So they get in a car, they go along the street every night and they do this until they can see the lights turning off and on through your windows. And especially something like a light bulb app will encourage you to tell the, to assign the light bulb to a specific room. So you say like, this light bulb is in the living room, this light bulb's in the kitchen, this light bulb's in the office. 
the office where you might keep your computer, and if you have a clearance, where you might keep all of your work documents. So not only can I find out which apartment is yours, I can figure out which room in your apartment is your office so that I can get the most direct line to potentially spy on you. Uh, or, like, for example, right now, this window right here. If you figured out, you could go, if you figured out which apartment was mine on my street, you could then gain access to the alley next to my street, or next to my building, and figure out which room is the office by watching these types of windows. Then, if I say still worked for Honeywell, where I have sensitive information on my computer screen, you could then just go outside and I mean, the, the silly version of this is, oh, you crouch outside the window. The real version of this is you put a high definition camera on the fence right outside the window and you record my screen that has all sorts of, uh, of pertinent um, governmental info. So if you have a high paying job, that's that, or you have a, you know, a secret uh, squirrel sort of job, that's a big risk. Um, but even to someone very normal, let's say that they've, you know, they've confirmed, so they use these light bulbs to confirm which apartment is yours. They could then correlate that. They already know this pin from your light bulb account. Nine times out of 10, you're using like one, two, three pins, maybe. <laughs> Most of the time, people are using one pin. Um, and... <laughs> If you know that, I've had many apartments where I've lived where I had a code lock on my door that was like a four-digit pin. And so if you know the pin from other correlative information, you can use the light bulbs to figure out which apartment is theirs, and then you can just let them, you can just let yourself in with this pin that you already know. It is, it is all social engineering. It's, it's all that, that is why someone might want to hack something like a light bulb uh, account because it sounds stupid. <laughs> like it's, it, it does sound stupid. Like what are they going to do with smart bulbs? Like what, are they, but it can lead them. It can give them information that they can use to correlate other information that they already know about you that places like YouTube, Facebook, social media sites are selling. So they can use the information that they buy from those sites to then correlate it to real world tangible things. That is, that is, that's the, that's the reason. Yeah. So I, uh, you know, obviously long tangent, but this is, um, this is something that they really, you know, drilled into our heads at work because we did have important stuff on screens and things like that. Um, but it can be bad for even like very normal consumers that don't have secret squirrel information. Um, uh, there's also a combinatorial thing. Uh, they might learn very little about you from a smart light account, but they could combine that info. Exactly. Exactly. The, the combining and the correlation. I, I heard a great example the other day of, uh, of a type of, um, of, of, of correlative analysis where you look at a um, the spouse or the partner of a soldier and they post a, a thing like, oh, so sad, my partner's going off to basic training. And then you, as the adversary, as the foreign adversary, whatever, know that maybe American basic training is supposed to take about uh, a year. And then six months later, that same spouse or person posts a post uh, from their partner's graduation from basic training, and it's only six months later. Like, those two posts tell you, as a, as a spy, as a correlative anal analyst, that something's going on with American basic training. They're pushing soldiers through it quicker, or they made some sort of change. Or this person is special, they are somehow distinctive, maybe we should look into them a little bit more. I mean... These sorts of things happen all the time. Actively, all the time. Even to, like, very normal people. Um, yeah. 
Uh, the question is really, why are you still using the light bulbs? Because I didn't go out and buy new ones yet. I thought I could delete the account and they would just act like normal light bulbs. <laughs> Fucking sue me. <laughs> so yeah, no, I need to go to like Home Depot and buy new ones. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I really do. Um, reminds me of pirate software. Social engineering is crazy. It's absolutely insane. Yeah, and he's he's a fucking white hat, right? He was a he was an opsec. Uh, he was he was an offensive security specialist. I guarantee. Like you know, I'm talking about this. I have some expertise from this from um the defensive side of like working with IT, making sure that our apps are well designed to not give out this info, making sure that we fucking delete shit when it's supposed to be deleted. Like, I'm, I'm familiar with this from the defensive side, but I guarantee that the offensive side is thinking about this a level up from how I'm thinking about it. Because it's always a cat and mouse game, and the offensive guys are always ahead of the defensive ones. <laughs> Especially, like, designers. Um, so I'm sure he has, he has way more insight than, than I even do. Uh, darn you, Disney, for making one a smart house. I know, dude. I never even considered lamps with apps. Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah, I, clearly I didn't either. <laughs> clearly I didn't either. I mean, this was, and, and I still think that like you can, like with this, with this light bulb account, right? This is all fine as long as no one gets access. And if you stay up, it'll be pretty clear when someone has access. So this isn't something that is, you know, super under the radar, <laughs> you know, that in a lot of the things, um, a lot of the things, a lot of times you're aware of social engineering after it happens, but you, but it's harder to think about before it happens. That's what I'm saying with like pirate is probably ahead of me on this. He probably would have thought this sort of thing out before buying the bulbs. <laughs> I'm a fucking defensive, uh, reactionary sort of specialist. So he's, he's probably way ahead of me on that sort of shit. Uh, <laughs> But, but yeah, it's, it's something you gotta be, you gotta think about in the modern age. Some things just don't need to be smart. That is the very much the conclusion that I'm coming to. Um, social engineering is insane. It really is. Uh, I forget who, but there was an author that was called up by a department asking how he figures out how to break into a secure, secure building, Google Earth. Absolutely. That's why you see on a lot of like more secure governmental areas, Google Earth just isn't straight up isn't allowed <laughs> for this very, for that very reason. Yeah. I work in insurance and uh, I've gotten so many phishing emails and SE calls, uh, calls mainly in customer service. Recently, my brother-in-law's FB was hacked by a scammer while he was deployed. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, was a female hacker getting access to someone's bank account by pretending to be their wife while playing baby audio to get the clerk to be agreeable. A I mean, and with the rise of AI, no, no, don't even think about like stealing jobs, artistic implications, being able to, they are now able to spoof someone's voice so much more accurately. It sounds stupid, but it's not a bad idea to have a code word with your family, with like your really close family that like you would fucking liquidate your bank account to help. It's not a bad idea to have a code word if there's for, if there's really, really something wrong. Um, that some that that a scammer wouldn't know because you are absolutely seeing scammers right now spoofing people's voices they can already spoof phone numbers caller ids now with ai they can they i, I don't even want to say they can they are uh spoofing people's voices it's very it's it's not even difficult anymore uh, 90% of the reason, uh, I can see for smart lights is to turn off all the lights when you're, uh, out or in bed without having to get up, uh, slash come home and check. Yeah, that's what, that's what I would do. Uh, also when we went on vacation, uh, we set up a, like, um, a, a, a pattern, um, to turn off and on to make it look like we were home. And then midway through the vacation, I changed the pattern. Um, so there, like, there definitely are some benefits, but I don't think they... They outweigh the positives. I use I, the negatives. I used to think that they outweighed the negatives. I don't really anymore. <laughs> um, in addition to many places not being on Google Earth, they also have gates far away from the building, so you can't even visually see the outside of the building. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The the building that I worked with had that, and also all of the front of the building that I worked in was all unclassified stuff. 
um, all of the classified areas were were much much deeper with him for for that exact reason. Uh, my aunt is in her seventies. Her Facebook gets taxed several times a month. Yeah, dude. Yeah, I I don't I I believe it. Um, anyways, so I have I have knowledge about other things occasionally. Uh, <laughs> I am I am somewhat a a at least slight specialist in some fields. So I thought I'd impart wisdom where I can, especially because. It's based off my mistakes. I'm currently getting fucked by my mistakes. So <laughs> hopefully you guys don't repeat those. Ignan. All right. Which I'm assuming it speaks. As you guys hear in the distance this echo of this weird <laughs> sucking, crackling sound that goes. <laughs> um, it halts for a second, looks over its shoulder, and then goes into double speed, disappearing into the trees. Shit, away shit, from you. shit. Um, Trying to follow in your lead here. I. Uh, Already immediate pause, but this is actually about critical role, so don't <laughs> don't get mad. Also, follow after and I. I don't know why the fucking thing didn't start. That was weird. I say. I don't know why the timer didn't start. Anyways, um, I love scouts. I love scouts. I think scouts, uh, feel real. They feel right, and they are a way a a great way. You guys hear me talk about it all the time of fucking foreshadowing danger. Scouts, scouting parties, patrols, all of these sorts of things uh, are amazing ways to foreshadow larger danger uh, and give parties a dilemma of what to do when they encounter a scout. Uh, because things can, if they're trying to be stealthy, things can very easily turn loud, um, but you want to stop the scout before they get away. Love, 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 love scouts as defensive measures, uh, or, you know, scout slash patrols. Mm, in the name of the guardians of this realm, you will stop. Okay, as you follow it past the, the initial, uh, as I say tree line, it's where a bunch of trees have kind of fallen over and block, formed a small blockade in this portion of the forest. You glance over as you're shouting that, and you can see uh, what appear to be uh, a small, uh, another of the same small elemental that this one has gone to to have a brief conversation. Beyond that, you see a larger one, roughly your size, that has just turned around and noticed your presence. <laughs> And all of them kind of look over at what appears to be another humanoid creature, but uh, instead of a lower torso of legs, it's a l elongated snake-like body. It's it's black and red scales across oh. its entire form. Two human arms and a humanoid face, but these kind of webbed red spines down its entire back. Gern, is that one of yours? That's you, Gern. Gern. No, I don't know who this is. Okay, I don't. I'm not familiar. I'm not familiar with who this I is. Take I take my I, potion of fire resistance. Okay. Uh, I could send them a present in the form of a candle, if you prefer. Uh, Do it. At this point in time, Keyleth, as you're standing there looking over this edge, they all turn, and the the creature, uh, the, the the weird kind of, uh, I'll say it, salamander-like creature, um, begins shouting out <laughs> phrases in Ignan, which you understand, that says, Go! Oh. Oh, he's not here yet! Alleviate this uncontrolled one! What? At which point, they all begin to swarm towards you. At which point, um, I'm going to do a uh, uh, like a fire a kind of like <clears throat> intimidation tactic. I'm gonna do like a fire radial thing, and okay. I'm gonna say, as the leader of this realm, as the Katiate of the Fire Nation, you will heed my word. Go ahead and make. As you guys are watching this from the distance, you all hear is. It's really confusing and a little, little hilarious to be I honest. I think it's going well. Um, I need you to make uh, sorry, a, an intimidation check. It really is, Daniel. It is, it is a very, uh, it is a very specific word choice. I love the use of language here. I love, I really like the use of language. Uh, number one makes it makes whoever knows the language always feel cool. Makes them feel like they. Um, you know, re rewards certain choices. Um, and an you guys know, I love clues that are given vaguely. Uh, so like I've talked about visions, uh, poetic interpretations, what have you. Uh, languages, even if you understand them, like if they're not your primary language, you might not understand certain word choices, certain colloquial uses within that language, uh, maybe you know metaphors, uh, all of these sorts of things. So I think it's 
a great choice to use. Like, that's a weird phrase that doesn't really make sense. Like, alleviate this uncontrolled one is, like, doesn't quite track and look, could, like, mean a few things that is, like, kind of unclear if it's violent, but it sort of sounds violent. Um, and I think it's a really, really good choice for someone interpreting a language that they don't regularly speak, um, especially in, like, a stressful situation. Um, yeah, yeah, I like that a lot. Uh, I legit don't remember if Matt uh, is just making Ignan sound weird or if it's hinting at something, but alleviate instead of kill is really tripping me out. Yeah, I love it. I really, really love it because it does add a layer of like, are, are they going to kill us? Alleviate? Like, what, what the fuck does that mean? Uh, but also feels totally fair for like a different language. Like, alleviate. They might colloquially people that speak ignin might use the word that directly translates to alleviate instead of kill <laughs> and for someone like keyleth someone that you know speaks the letter of this language but rarely uh interacts with other speakers it is very reasonable for her to get the literal interpretation but especially in a stressful situation, maybe not get the context or things of that nature. Um, so I just, I love it when languages are used well in D and D. And I think that this is a really good example of a good use of a language within D and D, uh, at large. Um, the chat on screen seems to have frozen. I know. Uh, Oh wait, no, oh, it like caught up. I don't know why. That was weird. Yeah, it did. It did glitch though. I, I did see that. Um, tone being hard to understand in other languages. I mean, yeah, absolutely, absolutely, Pharaoh. It's very like a lot of languages when you say something like um, it's it's uh, falling out of favor for obvious reasons. Um, but you know, it used to be pretty common parlance in English to say I'm gonna kill myself because something bad happened that's crazy to say <laughs> there, there's a reason it's starting to fall out of favor in more modern uh english uh context but if you're a non-native speaker especially someone that doesn't speak english very often that would be confusing if you heard someone say that in a rather light-hearted tone um, and I think that that's the same sort of thing that we're experiencing with this, you know, Ignan thing, or maybe it's not like, that's the, that's the really cool thing about, I think about like these vague sort of things that are open to misinterpreting is that you don't know if that's what's happening. If you're just, if you should follow the tone or if there's something else deeper going on here. Um, in a story I'm currently writing, takes the main character a second to get that fun water house means pub tavern. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, now we just say it when we watch a piece of media we really like. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's really weird to understand every sentence literally, but just feel like you're missing something. Yeah. I could see that sign. Yeah. Absolutely. A lot of English speakers will say thanks for everything, which in Norwegian is what you would say at a funeral about the dead. <laughs> Yeah, that's a great example, Pharaoh. That's an awesome example of this. Yeah, absolutely. So all of that is to say, I really like this choice from Matt. I think that's a great choice for, for this. Fire. 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 Yeah. No, that one fails me a lot. Yeah, sure it fails. You got you. It does. Shut up, Travis. No, oh! 20! <laughs> Woo! Got a better point. All right. As this happens, the, the, the two smaller elementals kind of shrink down and glance over at the larger one. The larger one kind of looks about and shouts back at you and Ignan once again. Do you serve him? It doesn't matter who I serve, for I am above him. I am your master now. This is... Ooh, interesting choice. <laughs> I know I'm pausing a lot, but it's because I don't think, you know, my, my, these are like really discreet opinions that I, that I, uh, don't think will evolve at all. Um, 
I think, and I'm just gushing. I'm just gushing over Matt. It's so funny that this episode started out with me being pretty critical of, of Matt's overall choices, but I'm just, I think he's just making great in the moment decision after decision of making a success on an intimidation in this is odd. Like, not odd, it's... It, I think it's it's maybe a weird thing to deal with as a DM uh, of like what will be the result of this intimidation. I think that allowing a chance for deception is very solid. I think that's a very, very solid choice of n the success on the intimidation because this is now essentially become a social encounter. And I like the idea that success on this very probably difficult behind the screen intimidation check doesn't immediately work. They don't immediately run away. They don't immediately kowtow. Uh, but it gives her the option for more social options. I think if she had just come up and lied to them, just being like, yep, I'm, I'm with your master, I don't think that would have worked. Or it would have been very, very, very difficult. Probably more difficult than this. But the intimidation allows that to be a more reasonable path forward within the social encounter. And Matt made it very clear. One of the things that I've talked about with social encounters in general, but Matt's previous social encounters, is that their progress through the obstacle was not as obvious. And I think that that's one of the tough things about the social mechanics in D&D is that progress through obstacles, uh, through like social obstacles, is not always very clear to the players. But I think that Matt is doing a really good job here of rewarding her, like giving her a very distinct, concrete reward and being very obvious about it. Of like, you have succeeded, you have opened up a new path within this dialogue tree. Like, <laughs> uh, and, and it's all very fluid. Like, it all feels right, it all works. Um, so I, I, I fucking big dub, <laughs> big dub to, to Matt here. Uh, yeah, this has been a pretty chatty episode. I love it. <laughs> well, see, I'm assuming there's going to be a lot. I'm honestly not too worried about it. I know we're way behind pace if you just look at the times, but I also assume that we'll be getting into combat at some point relatively soon. So we'll be turning up the speed. So I'm not as worried about it. Um, uh, also interesting strat from Keyleth. Yeah. That is, that's a separate thing. Uh, <laughs> but I love Matt, D Matt's decisions here. Love Matt's decisions. Um, uh, yeah. So, yeah, in, in, in general, big ups to Matt here, doing a lot of things right. Or at least a lot of things that I really like. It's not your realm. Get back into the fire plane where you came from. <laughs> He looks back at the, the, the long, snake-like humanoid who's standing wow. there, who kind of glances at the elements and goes, She wants us back. Very well. And they all turn around and begin to slowly drift back towards the center of the cinder grove where the flickering light was. Holy shit. Good job, Keelan. We don't know what happened. Where are we talking? Are they turning around? They're heading back in the direction. We know she just did there. I fly back over to them, still in iron and in, in fire element. Oh, 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 oh. Did you see control? Did you see that? Did you see that? They take out their leader. They take out their guy. Is she talking in normal or is she talking in No idea what you're doing. You're very scary right now. It's very hard. I think so. I might have to tackle you if you don't calm the fuck down. I chill out. Okay. I chill out. I'm not gonna revert back though. Yep, because I'm gonna stay. So the parliament just goes like, <laughs> and just there's more, more of a, a, a smoldering up. sad elemental at the moment. I gotta give him a fire thumbs up. There you go. Strong sad element. First word, two, two syllables. <laughs> <laughs> so um, they're going back. Do we move on? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. I'm gonna, I'm gonna take off, kind of leading in my fire elemental form. Um, deeper towards the rifts, um, keeping my eye out for any elementals Let's that her. might be yeah. escaping. All right. This is her game. Yeah, but it's all on fire. Uh, <laughs> go ahead and make a uh, sleight of hand check. What? Eighteen. Okay. Uh, yeah, Vax, go ahead and make a perception check. Oh shit! Roll high. Mm, pressure. Use one of your good dice. <laughs> perception. And roll bad. Shut up. Should he use the good dice? 30. No, 28. 28%? Yep. Ooh. Uh, wait, are you exhausted? 
Yeah, you are. Not everything? Uh, Let's go check. No. Roll again. <laughs> Even better. Even better. So, so it's the earlier. So it's the earlier one. Yeah. Okay. You just see as you're all walking. One thing that I'll that I'll say. Um, this is this is an example, and I I don't want to harp on this too much. I just like to bring it up occasionally, you know, to submit additional points of evidence. This is a situation where I think that passive uh, scores are more uh, beneficial to use for multiple reasons. Um, and and if you don't use passive scores all that often, or you don't um really like you don't really think about them as having a lot of benefits you can look in the dmg the dmg has like a lot of suggestions and and kind of presents a case for passive scores um but i think that this is a good example of one where matt really often uses contested scores or contested roles um and beyond it not being overly necessary um i don't uh i i don't think it's uh it, it's it's again one of those little things that really siphons off time the like just in the long run um in a and and i don't think it like the contested check here i think is actively worse than passive um passive scores are for when you aren't tr actively trying to do anything yeah absolutely um, general rule is absolutely in the name. And even if you want to, like, I could, and I could immediately see a counter argument here for she's exhausted and there's not an immediate way to represent that within her passives. Um, Daniel beat me to it. Uh, I, I believe you are correct. Uh, I don't remember off the top of my head either. General rule of thumb is that advantage disadvantage is worth about plus or minus 4.5. So I think you're about right. Uh, if someone would have disadvantage on a perception check, it is my general rule of thumb. And I don't know if this is actually raw. I'll be honest. I don't know if this is raw, but it is my general rule of thumb that I take like minus five off for disadvantage. Uh, it is indeed a minus five. There we go. Um, if someone's trying to be sneaky, they could have advantage. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, so all of those sorts of things, I think it makes a lot of sense. Like Chris Hardwick is actively trying to do something. He rolls. She is not actively trying to perceive him. She doesn't. That is kind of the base core of a passive score. Like I said, I don't like to talk about it a lot, even though it comes up pretty often. Um, because I don't want to just like go uh, like just like hit on it so much but i do occasionally like to refresh these sorts of things either for new people or just to add occasional evidence um by not utilizing passive i think matt is in a way failing to honor laura's choices in a way i i don't think it's it's massive um but i do think that there is an amount of that there yeah um, especially like you could generally argue it, but especially in terms of her taking observant. Yeah. Um, yeah, exactly. Dan, it's not a huge thing, but yeah. Yeah. Anyways, walking along your new blue dragonborn friend just kind of as that reaches down and snatches something from the dirt, pockets it and keeps walking. I follow behind him and keep watching him. Okay. Mm -hmm. Could I see what it was? Mm -mm, no idea. You just see a little cluster of kind of ash and dust in the ground that's been partially disturbed. Mm. All right, as you continue to press forward, you hear in the distance a loud cracking sound echoing, and you can see what appear to be a number of trees in the far off side to the, actually it'd be to the more north, uh, eastern side of the forest. As a brief whirlwind <laughs> flickers up, you assume this is probably from the fire of Shari, you've taken that side of the entranceway, and you can see two flickering lights kind of drift up in the air before <laughs> sparking out in the distance. Ooh, Should you let them know we're in place then? Um, I'll throw up a sky right. <laughs> or actually, as a fire elemental, can I just be like <laughs> in fire elemental form? I mean, you can make some localized fire happen. Can I like send up like a little bit of like a, like a flare? Like, Not in the way that you would want to. You'd have to drop form for that and cast a spell. Uh, we could, of course. I set oh, an arrow. Fire. I'm going to set an set arrow, arrow on, on fire, fire and then shoot it up in the air. I don't realize she's doing it. <laughs> okay. As you go ahead and take the arrow, what do you have around the edge that are going to. You're going to light the shaft on fire? No, I'm going to tie some of my cloth from, you know, <laughs> that I have, the thing. Yeah. I take some cloth from the bag of holding from one of those old fancy cloaks that Better we had. Seriously? <laughs> 
Can I have some fancy cloak and grog out of bag of holding, please? Why are you hot right now? It's so weird. Please. Fancy cloak. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> the arrow arcs off. Vanishes across the little bit of the remaining tree line. No idea if they saw that. All right. Do you guys continue to press forward? Uh, hold for a second and wait for Team Three's response. Right, there's 13, three teams, right? They already. This is actually also a good example of something that. Something that is like very much not a hard rule or a hard thing that I follow, but introspectively looking. Um, I, a lot of times, and, and, I, and I think this is generally something I would recommend. A lot of times I am more... I'm a lot more strict on what magic can or cannot do. And I'm not as strict on physical things. So I think that there is an argument that you could make that maybe you need to make a survival check or you need to make some sort of check in order to accomplish what Vex is doing. Uh, but Matt just lets it go through. And I would do the same. Um, I will say the one thing I, I might allow, I think I'm a little bit less strict actually than Matt when it comes to creative magic use, or at least less strict than he is now. I think we were more similar at the beginning of the campaign, but I think Twitter has gotten him into a more strict stance on magic. Um, <laughs> but the uh, I, I said it in the Underdark, I think it was the first time I said it, where if someone wants to use a spell in a way that kind of makes sense or a magical ability in a way that kind of makes sense like it feels sort of right a lot of times i'll make it an arcana check and i'll make it like a save or suck set kind of thing um where if it's a cantrip they essentially can't try it again if they fail the arcana check and if it's a leveled spell they could try it as much as they want but they'll lose the spell slot if they fail the arcana check and nothing will happen um so I, I'm generally more stringent on magic because magic is already so flexible. Um, whereas if people want to do something creative with materials, generally classes have more equivalent uh, access to like material stuff like that. Definitely leans towards marshals. Um, but I like to lean that way a little bit to encourage martial creativity. I think that spellcasters get a lot of creativity from their spells. They can use their spells in very creative ways, um, just kind of by default. Uh, whereas I put less checks in front of martial and like, you know, physical material creativity to try and encourage that out of marshals uh, because I think it's less given to them. Um, this is this is an aspect of my DMing that is uh, very explicitly like unfair, <laughs> like is not like fair to all classes. Um, but I'm doing it for a very particular reason. I think that it encourages creativity out of marshals, and that is something that I want to encourage, even though it is a bit unfair of a ruling. Um, so all the other teams yeah, are one. Three, we were the third. Then, uh, oh, yeah. they, oh, one, two, we were three. Okay, yeah, then, yeah. Okay. You uh, begin to push further forward towards the center of the cinder grove as you're, you're noticing more and more of these trees are pushed flat. It's almost like that uh, um, that Russian forest that the meteor had landed and exploded, where just all the trees are flattened and pushed Tunguska. from the center. Thank Tunguska, thank you. Um, where you begin to climb over a number of these flattened portions of the forest, and in the center you can see that one river of, of uh, molten rock that had been trickling down the front of the mountain is sourced here in the center, where once previously you guys performed a ritual to pass into the elemental plane, has now torn into this extremely bright rift that flickers. It's like looking into the sun, you have to avert your gaze, you cannot look directly at it without actually hurting your eyesight. And you can see there are multiple paths of the, this molten lava uh, pouring out from this renewed volcanic activity. You can see it burbling up and bubbling underneath. Uh, like the very presence of this tear itself is causing the activity to just raise and, and, and grow more fervent. Um, at the base of the rift, you can see a number of other elemental creatures that are in the process of surrounding this, this opening. And uh, you can... Uh, Everything all right, Ryan? I am not here. You're not here? <laughs> uh, no. I don't know. You guys see him too? Perfect. Um, as you can see, a lot of these elemental entities are swirling around. There are, uh, there are two more of these 
strange snake-like humans, uh, these salamander-like creatures that are discussing, and one really large one that stands there holding this strange trident-like structure, and it's shouting out commands left and right, and you can see uh, these salamander entities and a number of these elementals are all kind of gathered around the portal, and they're all just focusing this like slow, steady beam towards it, as, as you can see it tearing, flickering, and slowly expanding with each popping expansion of this doorway. The ground itself kind of shifts and rumbles. My hunters mark the big one. All right. Can I send a candle? <laughs> I'd like to, yeah. <laughs> All right, so I'd like to, um, what am I looking at here? Fire, there's a bit of fire? It's a lot of fire. Most of these entities are either fire, like fire essence or just made out of straight flame. I'd like to uh, call over the skeleton known as Fatty Arbuckle. I'd like to give <laughs> Fatty Arbuckle, <coughs> I'd like to give Fatty Arbuckle an ice storm candle. All right. And ask him to kindly deliver it to the center of this <laughs> melee that's happening just up ahead. Won't that okay, what's with the candles? <laughs> Am I going crazy? Is uh, my original assumption was that this was an abstraction for his spell casting. I assumed he was a necromancy wizard, and that this was an abstraction for his uh, like spell book and spell casting and spell slots. Uh, but he's giving it to one of his skeletons. I don't think necromancy wizards can cast through their summons. Like, uh, right? <laughs> Am I? It, I honestly don't know if I'm just totally missing something, but I feel like I might be. Don't me like don't say it if it is revealed, but I will say, as a watcher, I am confused. <laughs> as a watcher that knows something about D&D, I'm confused. I was I like I almost feel like this is a fucking like Vin Diesel witch hunter type thing where it's like a custom class I'm just not aware of. Um yeah, if it's revealed and explained, let let me let me sit, let me marinate. Um, but if it's never explained and it's just like weird flavor, feel free to let me know. <laughs> uh, very very odd. Uh, I think uh, fairness in the big picture, moment to moment, can be very unfair as long as the big picture is fair. Yeah, I agree with that, Daniel. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Um, asymmetrical fairness. Yeah. Uh, I think there's that he views the candles as spells. Generally, don't remember. Um, yeah, weird. Okay, anyways. I'd kill your friend. Oh, he's had a good run. <laughs> feeling a lot less guilty, so. <laughs> well, I can do it, but I don't appreciate it when other people do it. Fair. You fair. know, it's my choice. Sure. Never said it was okay for you to start lighting them up with arrows. <laughs> Jesus Christ, whoever that is. <laughs> Thanks, Olya. Nice to meet you. Oh. <laughs> Eddie, our, our uncle, Skeletal Clan uh, Claws, clasp around the side of this kind of uh, marbled looking bluish white candle and clutches it and just goes. <laughs> yes, off your trot, go! <laughs> and, you know, for, I have to demean I was, him. I was really <laughs> hoping for a fatty Arbuckle skeleton impression. I was really, really <laughs> hoping for it. What you did was cool, but like that was just. They don't, they heart. can't speak. Okay. They don't have. <laughs> voice boxes or anything. <laughs> As it kind of shuffles forward down this ashen pit towards the dome where the lava itself is beginning to pour forth in the the uh, uh, the doorway is, you can see the shadow of its form kind of as the light passes. It's almost, it looks like the, the cover of uh, the thing, how it's just like bright light coursing past this dark image of the skeleton walking away from you. Maybe you, we should duck down so that nobody knows where that came from. Oh goes. yes, get 10 feet back. I should have said that already. <laughs> oh, uh, it's walked quite a distance, thankfully, at this point. It's probably about a good 40 or 50 feet before it reaches uh, the first element. And see, as, as it begins to step forward, they all kind of turn and look, and one of them kind of shouts over, Also, to be clear, if this is a custom class, that is a spellcaster that has to solidify their spells into an object and then can like throw and detonate spells from the from that object basically like making like magical spell grenades and that's the only way they can cast that's actually a sick homebrew class idea i really like that i think that is an option for how uh, if you wanted to change base artificer in a way that you that that where you wanted to make them feel more mechanical and less spellcastery, I think you could absolutely change artificer in that way, and it would be sick as hell. <laughs> One of them kind of glances over, reaches out, and pulls out some sort of a uh, a long brass colored longbow and begins to notch an arrow carefully as it kind of hobbles forward. They look at each other. One of them shouts out at Ignin, which you uh, understand, Keyleth, shouting, You! Who walks here? 
keeps walking <laughs> forward like a little wind-up toy made of bone uh, until eventually uh, the, 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 the one with the uh, the bow kind of gives a nudge with its head, and the other salamander entity draws a, a, some sort of a heavy bladed object and begins to step forward towards it, ready to go ahead and cleave it. Come on, come on. As the skeleton steps forward, it gets right at the corner of its range. Do you like want to command it? Helen Hunt in that moment in Twister. Squeeze the candle, fatty arbuckle! <laughs> <laughs> at which point, the to be clear, Hoovy, they tell you to flavor it like that. I'm thinking about like mechanical changes where like you have to like crystallize your spells ahead of time. Uh, I think that would be a very interesting spellcaster. A, a spellcaster that has to like pre literally like prepare their spells in crystals. Although we are dipping back into Vancey and casting, so ooh, I don't know. Uh, um. But uh, I think I think there's a way to do it that is that is not that removes the bad things about Fancyan. Um, I returned to see we got a whole five seconds into the episode, and I love that for us. We're getting there. We're getting there. Skeleton, just as the blade sweeps past and crashes into its torso, shattering the rib cage, the arms go. The wax. My thought is that okay. This is uh, this is the thought I have. Tie tie. <laughs> Is that you have to uh, you have to roll like a die at the end of the day for each spell crystal, and there's like a chance of them just like like destroying at the end of the day. Um, I don't know. This is all very off the dome. There are very easy ways to make this a terribly balanced class, but I think that the core idea is kind of fun. Uh, I think it would be interesting if you could if you could try to store spell crystals. But they had the chance of like destroying at the end of like a long rest. I don't know. That's a weird and wacky one, though. I don't know if I. I don't know if I like it. I don't know if I like it. Bends and cracks in the center, and there's a brief pause where nothing seems to happen. Uh. And a swirl of sudden localized uh, storming blizzard just encases a ten foot radius, hitting both of those salamander creatures. Um, what does it say on the on the candle specifically? Uh, oh, on the can ice storm candle, uh, candle can shards, blah, blah, blah. All, it must take a all its effect must make a dexterity saving throw, DC 12, or suffer 4d6 cold damage. It's a fail and a save. And it's a half on half damage on success? Yeah, half damage on success. Great, okay, so one of them failed, one of them saved. So go ahead and roll 4d6 damage. Dang. Take that, Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, oh boy, three, set nine. Nine, okay, nine and five cold damage oh. each. So poosh, it blasts open. Um, oh, and a dexterity check for your buddy who uh, makes it. Oh. So, uh, Fatty Arbuckle actually walks out of there with a mere five points of cold damage. <laughs> kind of ice and frost. The absolute surprise in Matt's voice. That's hilarious. Uh, his busted open ribcage, though, he did suffer. Ooper duper! <laughs> <laughs> Suffer uh, seven damage from the impact of this weapon. Uh, so Fatty Arbuckle, pretty damaged, but still standing there, just going. <laughs> Keep standing, Fatty. You can do it. I love you, Fatty. Is everyone just going to sit back at this? And, or... No, we should probably attack. It's up to you, or you can watch this horrible bludgeoning of this skeleton. Oh. Uh, uh, when I see this salamander take out the big shiny shark thing, I go into a rage. I hide. All right. I, hide. So I assume you're going to be rushing in there then. Yeah. Anyone who wishes to immediate to go into battle now, let's roll initiative. All right, I'm in on this. All right, let me go ahead and. Or Fatty. So these are all fire. All right, going into combat. Going into combat. Oh hell yeah! Oh, nice. Should we oh roll for stealth again, or are we still stealth? Uh, no. <laughs> I was just, I was just stepping into stealth. Oh no, I was trying to hide though, like back uh, away from you as you were doing that. The candle turned into a blizzard, so. You know what? Honestly, we're not doing too bad on time. We're, I think, about a third of the way through. Ish, a little bit less than a third. And we're at three hours, and we're about to go into combat. Like, eh, we're doing all right on the pace. And I always pause less towards the end of uh, towards the end of an episode. Is it always? Like a thing? Like, there's no like. Maybe not always. And I mean, go and shout. Technical. 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 <laughs> it kind of does, doesn't it? I think you would have to, I would have to think about it a lot more, but I think there's like alchemist flavoring for like potions. I think that there's, there's a lot of ways to flavor it, but I do actually agree with what you said about spell scrolls. 
I think that there is a way, there's an interesting class, or maybe even just subclass, uh, for a class that could make essentially mechanically temporary spell scrolls. I think there's something interesting there, especially if you make it like an actual intended effect rather than the um, unintended and banned at many tables coffee lock, <laughs> you know? Um, you mean when you pause for two seconds before the episode ends and goes on? No, that's if you round, that's basically the end. <laughs> that's basically the end if you round. So I, that doesn't count. Pharaoh. <laughs> so this is quite a ways away from the portal itself. Oh. Lava flow traveling around that side. Oh, look at that. All right, and we have Keyleth over here as the fire elemental. Huh? No, no. Where's the big one? I like the pool. Uh, the, the big one that you haven't seen yet? The big one that we hunt that I hunter's mark. Right there. The one holding the trident thing. Oh, sorry. Uh. Thank you. <laughs> um, and then we have. Look at how pretty those lava bubbles here. look. Is that German? That's Gurren right there. Yeah. Um, we have Fatty Arbuckle. <laughs> <laughs> and chilling over here. Coral. We have Coral and Stimpy. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so. So, just one there. That's, uh, on the element. there. So these are fire elementals, yes? Uh, they are, seem to be fire-based creatures, yes. Hey, DM. Yes. You said they were ripping open the, the portal. Where is it's that on the map? Back. It's this back. Way back. Way back. Okay. The crater's just a crater. Yeah, like there, there's a pool of magma that kind of goes this way. You guys are on one side. I'll push them this way further. The rest of the actual portal's back this okay. far. All right, so, initiative order. We have 25 to 20, anyone? 22. 22. 22. Jesus. Every time. Oh, yeah. You. Yeah. Okay, 20 to 15. 17. 17. 16. Cool. Get out of the way now. All right. 13. 13. Kill all right, great. So, top of the round. Percy, you're up first. Uh, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, use my pistol. I'm going to do a, 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 a trick shot of the arms. I'm going to, oh, actually, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to use my bonus action to, uh, um, uh, to, uh, you know, actually, I'm going to hold off on that. Uh, I'm going to make a, an arm shot to the one with the trident. All righty. That's my first shot. Uh, and that's, uh, 20. Can they, Dr. Hoovy? The Order of Scribes? Oh, shit. That's that's an idea to to base it off of. I think I I yeah I don't know maybe uh, I I wrote it down. I was like maybe there's there's an interesting class maybe buried in there somewhere. Sometimes you have an idea and it either already exists. I have this all the time as a content creator. You have an idea that you think is so cool and interesting, and then you Google it and someone else has already done it ten years ago. Uh, <laughs> So I, I absolutely, uh, but sometimes you see what they did and you're like, ooh, could I tweak it a little bit? Like I might look at the order of scribes and be like, ooh, could I like tweak this around and, and, and make something still interesting, but a little different, you know? That's a uh, uh, 25. 25 hits. Uh, and that's a um, uh, strength saving throw. Strength saving throw. Uh, that's going to be a 20. That just barely makes it. Ah, oh, it's clear of the blast of the air impact. Psh, it's the arm. Then just to hold on to his trident-like weapon. Uh, that's fine. I'm going to take, he's going to take his damage and he's going to take another one of those. All right. That. So we'll damage <laughs> Okay. I, uh, mm, I'll have to, mm. Is this the rift? Is this the rift that we're looking at? Because I had, I had a, I, I, I had a compliment right here for the battle arena. I think that there are two great things that he described. Number one, the rift that is that hurts to look at. I think that that is a very, very flavorful way to cause uh, to have a source of blindness in the combat, which is super rare, uh, especially for like an environmental effect. But totally works here, and you could absolutely have adversaries, whether meaning to or not play around the the rift blindness aspect um and it's an excuse to uh use a use a mechanic and a condition that doesn't get brought up very much um so i immediately loved that and law he was like lava trails cutting through the landscape that assumingly these fire elementals will be able to easily pass through maybe the same with the salamanders um and that but obviously friends can't block it I'm a little sad that we only see pools of lava rather than like full on trails to like really cut up the battle arena. Um, but also, I 
uh, I can accept pools. Pools are fine. Uh, I think I would rather prefer like big long lines that like really distinctly bisect, or not bisect, but but really distinctly cut up the arena. Um, but the the pools are fine. Um, I'm really interested to see if he will use the blindness from the rift as a real mechanical effect or if it was just flavoring. I think it is the type of flavoring that is absolutely perfect for a mechanical effect, and I think that would add something so, so interesting to this combat that you really don't get, and it's really hard to put in to a lot of combats. So we'll see. That's, uh... 13 points of damage. 13 points of damage already. All right, take another shot. Go for it. Skill in your own deck, by the way. So you're ready. Yeah. Um, you're up. 20. Warning. Nice. Strength check. Add incoming. Take uh, cover. Nine. Yeah, Add incoming. Here. You see the stingers are pried off as one of his pinky fingers actually blown off from the impact, <laughs> uh, shooting some sort of like dark, deep crimson blood that seems to kind of burn the landscape around as it drips, uh, tried tumbling to the ground and being lodged in a piece of rock. Uh, most of the lava. And that does um, seven points of damage. Seven points of damage already. Uh, third shot's going to be a sharp shooter shot. All right. So my side of the attack. Uh, ooh, uh, that's probably missed. All right, we got 30 seconds before the ad, uh, so we will run the ad, and then we'll be back. Um, yeah, I'm interested. I feel like the fucking CR audio got even fucking lower. I feel like they got even quieter. I feel like this entire episode has been very quiet, at least on my end. Um, hopefully, you guys can hear it all right. Um, but I have to go to prepare for a Daggerheart game tomorrow that was supposed to happen like a month ago. Fuck yeah, Daniel. Have a good one. Um, do well. Do well. I, I believe in you. Uh, let's see. Yeah. All right. We got a few more seconds and ad is starting now. I will see you all in a second and we'll dive into this combat. Goodbye.
I don't want to, I don't, I, I need, I want to like do a quick little talk over the music because I don't want to jump scare people anymore. I want to let them know I'm back first while the music's still playing. <laughs> All right, let's get into this combat. Uh, 14. 14 unfortunately misses. All right, that misses. I'm going to take a, take a run behind and hide behind that, that rock. I'm there. Okay. Got it's it. not a rock. It's it's a rock. Do I see that big thing in the back? Uh, this big thing yeah, here? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, probably you see that. I, okay, and, and the thing next to Fatty Arbuckle is also baddies, yeah? Yep. They're yes. all baddies? These things are all baddies here. <laughs> yeah. I'm here, I'm all here. Right. I'm, I'm gonna here. take a uh, 15 feet step to my right, okay. put me in a straight line with the guy next to Fatty and the big guy behind him. Alrighty. And then fire a lightning bolt straight ahead to <laughs> both of them. I hope they're not immune to lightning. <laughs> <laughs> I'll find out. Alrighty, so, uh, as, and you watch at the corner of your eyes, Welgarn, uh, you see this tiny little gnome step to the side, conjures some arcane kind of purplish blue energy, and then thrusts his pelvis forward as a bolt of lightning energy just rockets forth, oh, tearing, uh, of course, yeah. uh, tearing into <laughs> both the. <laughs> I don't think I've ever seen that happen before. <laughs> we have. <laughs> Sending both the larger salamander creature and the elemental behind it, go ahead and roll 8d6 damage. What's the DC on this? Uh, is it my spell save? There's more in here if you want to. Yes. Right. With the hand cone? Yeah. 20. Oof. That is a failure and a failure. Yes. All right, so full damage against both. 27. Oof. All righty. As the bolt of lightning energy whoosh, tears through both of them, uh, eventually absorbed into the stone behind them, both the elemental flame form kind of flickers and falls to the ground for a second, trying to reform itself. While the salamander looks down at this black and burned charm mark in the center of its torso, from where the bolt entered and exited out of its back to strike its compadre. Um, not too happy. I confused how such a large, damaging thing came from such a small little creature. It's powerful. Uh, <laughs> then I'll turn to our new friend Gurn, and I'll say, uh, I, I will inspire him. I'll, uh, I'll say, uh, please uh, help us, and to inspire you, I will sing you a song. And I will sing. Pretty uh, inspired by your dick, like to be honest. <laughs> oh, there's more. I think a song's gonna get better than that. It might. It might. And so I sing. Uh, to everything, Gurn, Gurn, Gurn. <laughs> there is a season. Gurn, Gurn, Gurn. I just like to sing your name, Gurn Blanston. Did that help? Do I have to roll to determine if that was helpful or not? If you'd like to. Certainly. <laughs> just roll, roll a d20 for musical taste. Four. Four. It catches you by the ear with delight. You're, 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 it's not bad, actually. Your, your, it's not bad. Your general frustration with modern music is, is completely bisected by the more oldies classical sound of his tunes. And, uh, and I, I quite enjoyed how you worked my first name into that, actually. <laughs> No one's ever done that before. So uh, you get a D10, Inspiration Dice. All right. So just keep that on the side. If ever you make an attack roll or a saving throw that isn't high as you want it to be, you can then roll that and add the D10 to that roll. Okay, great. So you just have that kind of in the wings. Oh, as you feel inspired. Exactly Thank that. you very much. Nope. Exactly that. Excellent. Right. That brings it to the Elemental's turn. Now, uh, this Flame Elemental is going to streak over <laughs> to Blurn, who's, <laughs> oh sorry, no, this is, uh, this is to Fatty. the Fatty Arbuckle. <laughs> so many weird names today. Um, and this larger Fire Elemental here is going to Oh, Fatty, he served me well here. I don't know, he's got a fighting chance. I love that we're scrambling for D6 as well. Right. And is going to. Are there any dice around anywhere? anywhere? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just waiting for the hand to go in. I found this uh, polyhedral base and I had to fill it with nine pounds. He was a long way. He's not doing anything. He's just going around to get there. But now, as as the large elemental burns into the center of Scanlan Percy, uh, you can feel just this presence itself is extremely dangerously hot. The air around you is blistering. You can feel your hair curl back in its presence. Um, the small elemental can go ahead and make two attacks against uh, Fatty Arbuckle. Ah, shite. <laughs> That's going to be a nine to hit. <laughs> I think it's AC's 13, so I don't think it's going to hit it. Second one, rolls a one. Oh, fatty live! Fatty live! Fatty one. It's one. You can't keep Fatty down. Bob and weave, Fatty, Bob and weave! <laughs> don't take, don't step too hard, Fatty! <laughs> you won't be able to take it! And uh, with that, Grog, it's your turn. So you go into your rage, mm -hmm. top your turn, and then what would you like to do? Uh, can I use, uh, I guess, my entire action to run towards Scanlan? What's your speed again? It's 50. 50. 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, 40. You can get right there between Scanlan and this creature uh, if you want to. That's about it, huh? I'll test your movement. You, got, you can move 10 more feet if you want to. You can leap oh. over me. I think we need to spread out. Can I, can I go back and arc the other way? Can I run to the left just as far as I can? This way? No, yeah, where from my starting point was? Oh, you know, this way yeah, you said? Yeah, okay. back towards you, around the pool. That's about as far as you can get right there. All right. If you do not attack anything, I you lose your rage. Yeah. So, so I fall off it. You can still. I mean, if you want to throw something, yeah, I can, you can throw your weapon if you want to. Can I attach the chain of returning to Craven Edge? Mm -hmm. And I'll throw it at um, Dryden Liss Bastard right there. Go for it. So you watch as this muscle-bound Goliath comes leaping around the corner as it fixes a chain at the end of its weapon, flinging a two-handed sword like a giant boomerang. And only 14. 14 against the uh, the larger one. Yeah. Unfortunately, uh, it makes an impact, but it just ricochets off of its plated body armor, and then kind of tumbles to the ground. You can go and make your uh, things. Put it back. Yeah, pull it back. Uh, strength. 18. Okay, no problem. You pull it back with the chain and catch it midair. Ending your turn there. Keep it out range. Indeed. Backs you up. Uh, all right. So I uh, rip up the boots of haste, and I'm going to run right next to uh, Vesalia. Now I'll say this is. So this is a general philosophy it has worked out for me i believe in it and i believe in it for some specific reasons but it's also like not as established and i can i can very much see some counter arguments to it to it it's also a very like me like i i fully created it and so it's a little bit rough around the edges but 
If you've seen me try to analyze a map before, uh, especially like an indoor map, I do a lot of this where I consider like large zones and I draw connections between them. I essentially draw like a node based graph to represent the map. And I generally find that the best maps are relatively easy to abstract into this node type of graph. And when they're on the node-based graph, based on how I color the nodes and the edges, they they have a certain like look to them, like they make sense. They're easy-ish to abstract. I had, and we're gonna see how this goes. I think that this has a lot of the. This map sort of looks like to me like someone who was designing maps and they were originally designing like white room combat most of the time where like there's no real environmental effects around. There's nothing really like going on in the environment in the map in which the combat is taking place. And so they put in some hazards. They put in lava pools. They put in like cover spots the problem is, and one of the really big portions of this, when I was talking about how I would prefer for there to be like big lines of lava, um, and I haven't even finished drawing this yet, but I mean, this is kind of what we're looking at. One of the core problems here is that these obstacles the most that they provide, like at most, they provide ranged cover. And they maybe, there are maybe some hazards that could use like pushing. Like if you pushed a combatant into the lava, obviously not going to be a thing for, or not probably going to affect the adversaries too much. So Vox Machina probably isn't going to try to do it. It would be more of a thing for the adversaries pushing Vox Machina into these. I think the problem is, and when you try to abstract this, you have to get really weird and 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 odd and, with the abstraction. Like, this doesn't look like a great map. This just kind of looks like a ring around a central point with tons of places to access said central point. I think that there's a maybe a more interesting map hiding in here. If maybe, say, there was an island in the middle of the lava, and the island is just surrounded by lava, right? Let's say that. There's, there's an island in the center, totally surrounded by lava, so there are multiple points around said lava. Oops, that's the wrong tool. There are multiple points around said lava. And at each point, you could consider the lava a difficult path across. This, to me, very instantly makes a lot more sense. Like, it's very, to me, it's a lot more clear what's going on. I can see the benefit of the map. I can immediately start thinking up some strategies of if there is a central point that is very hard to get to because every single point outside of it is a challenging path to get to it. Again, we're imagining, you know, an island in the sitter in the center of lava with then a ring outside of it. I can immediately look at this abstraction and start to understand that. With mats, I, I, you know, this doesn't immediately speak to me on like what sort of tactics I can employ. It doesn't really look like there are a lot of tactics I can employ other than maybe like cover taking which I think is accurate to the map in front of us is like, that's really the only thing you can use those like terrain pieces for is cover. It's not terrible. It's better than again, white room combat, but I think it's, it's going to lack a lot. And in a lot of cases is going to kind of boil down to more white room type combat uh, where they're just going to congregate in some nodes 
and they're not really going to have a reason to switch. Because that's that's kind of the thing about this, and that's the thing about White Room Combat, is why ever walk around the map? Like, they are going to get to nodes to fight the adversaries. The adversaries are going to get to nodes to fight them. They're going to go to fight the adversaries. And then why would they ever move outside the, of that node? Why would they ever change places or move around the battlefield in any way? To compare it to the map that we just saw with the Deathwalker's Ward, there were distinct reasons to move around that map, to block line of sight from the beholder, and there were very like distinct obstructions, there were more distinct zones. I will say, it was a little hard to abstract it in the moment because the zones weren't very clearly defined, but I did it fairly easily. And I think that you saw a lot of decision-making, or not even a lot of decision-making, but at least some decision-making within that combat. We'll have to see how this one goes, but I predict it'll all be kind of them just congregating in areas and whacking at each other. We'll see. Maybe Spoilers Chat is laughing their little asses off. <laughs> it's very possible. Um, but yeah. On the very edge of the map. Over there. And the fire elemental is right against Percy, right? Yep. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna stab him three times in his fire buttocks. Uh, so <laughs> first one is uh, is a 27. Second one is a 16. Hits. Third is a 14. Hits. Hits. Okay, oh, so wow. first one sneak attack. So, right. Mm. And by the way, the reason that I do that abstraction, like that I did below, the reason that I think about I try to abstract maps in that way, is a very similar reason that I've heard script writers say you should for or like book writers that you should force yourself to remove like 10% of your book uh, after the first draft because forcing myself to abstract it makes me think about it and makes me really consider what works and what doesn't. Uh, if I have trouble abstracting it, I think my, my players will have trouble. I, I think that that kind of represents part of the friction between the players and the DM. So if I have trouble abstracting it, I can pretty much predict that my players will have trouble interacting with it in an interesting way. Um, so, that's why I go through that process. for that first. So that damage. And then Swarm kind of flickers briefly for a moment from the sheer impact of the dagger hit. Mm -hmm. Second dagger does seven, and uh, third swipe does nine. Nine, already. The two of the daggers impacts, partially passing through its form, not quite as impactful as the first. That first one did seemingly cause the creature to have a hard time coalescing its, you know, fire reefed physicality. Um, then your turn next? Yes. Gurn, you're up. Um, so you're right there. I'm right there. How, how far can I run and cast a spell at, at, the, at the, the ones around Fatty? Uh, 30 feet is how far you can run, and that's about six squares. If I were to cast a bit of... Would I, how about a cone of cold? Could I cast a cone of cold? Oh, fire you, could, you could very much so. That sounds delightful. Yeah. I could cast Ice Storm, but that's yeah, a general yeah, malaise yeah. of middle-aged couples living in a neighborhood, <laughs> becoming aware of their dead-in lives. All right, so you want to move around here? Yes, let's move around that bit right there. All right. I'd like to cast Cone of Cold. I might unfortunately have to take out Fatty, but... Uh, uh, you, it, it is probably a good chance. This is not going to be... After everything else, Fatty survived. His own master deals the, the possible finishing blow. I feel like I should be the one to do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's much more humane. It's poetic. I think so. You brought him in as well. This is what Fatty would have wanted. <laughs> Everything oh, under that area. Oh, oh, so yeah, you can yeah, Don't worry about it. No, it's fine. Yeah, it's a big thing. This old spell. I mean... Y'all want to go to the DQ and get a count of cold? <laughs> want to get a count of cold? <laughs> What's your spell DC? It should be in the top of your spell page. Uh, it is 16. 16, all right. And it is constitution save. Let's see if that is a failure, a failure, and a failure. Yeah. Oh! What, about, what, about, what about Fatty? Did he succeed? Oh, I'll roll for Fatty. Come on, uh, Fatty. Fatty. did not succeed. <laughs> 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 nope. It wasn't inevitable. Nope. All right, I'm going to roll 8d8 points of cold damage. Jeez. All right. Oh, He's not going to have not used a lot. Two. That is a four. Eight, eight, uh, eight, let's see. Eight. I have a hold. Yeah. Right. There's another one here. Right. Not that easy to get to. No. Two, four, six. I think two more. Two more. Good gravy. This one. Yep. Here's one. And... Oh. <laughs> oh, oh, this, is, this is why I sort my dice at the beginning of the game. Oh, give me a break. Sorry, it sounds like there was something coming uh, from the other side of the room. How's that working out for you? How's that working out for you? Do you have a D8? Do you have a D8? I can borrow it. I do. I, 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 have, uh, I don't know what happened yeah. to my D8. I need to buy. I'll buy some at the convention tomorrow. Yay! Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. By the way, guys, if we hit 16K before the end of tonight's show, uh, we're gonna go ahead and have a sloth come into the studio. Oh, yeah. What? Yeah. 16K in a sloth. Holy shit! I know. When? When? What? Is he gonna play with us? Focus, focus. 21, 27, 31, 34, 38, 44. Oh! 40. 44. 44. Oh, shit. 30 fire planes, I call damage. I don't think I appreciate that very fucking much. I'm saving all your fucking arses out here. All right, so. For Trump's um, sake. The, um, 
as he's shouting out at you, releasing this this amazing condensed blast of pure winter hell in front of him. It comes scattering across uh, this way, freezing the corner of the strings, partially some of the lava here, of the stone, just by proximity. Blast past these entities, and as the, the arcane snow comes to rest, you can see the elemental here itself is having a hard time keeping itself together. Its flames <laughs> and sputtering and flickering, barely keeping itself together. However, by its side, you see three very still, frozen, solid statuettes of the remnants Damn. of the two salamanders and Fatty Arbuncle, oh. taken by the cold of winter. Oh, shit. Awesome. Maybe you can reanimate him. <laughs> it's too late. <laughs> He's no good any longer. We'll say for the sake of burn. Let move on. I have. <laughs> we'll say for the purposes of remembering that too. Put a couple of frozen, frozen, and let it go. Let it go. <laughs> all right. Uh, I believe that ends your turn, Gurn. Uh, all right. It would be the salamander's turn, but they're frozen. Damn. I got pummeled. Max, you're up. Awesome. Um, wait. So they can unfreeze, or are they basically frozen until something? You don't know. Ah. Okay. I'm gonna. Um, that. That. Yellow one, like behind me, that's Keyleth, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, you believe so. Okay, I know, right? I'm gonna flip backwards, like 10, ten feet. <laughs> right. Actually, can I? I don't wanna be like around anybody else. Okay, so I'm so gonna like flip over the lava pit and go out in the end. All right, go ahead and make an acrobatics check. Oh, don't bring your foot. Ooh. Oh, that would be um 38. <laughs> Without issue, land, I don't even know, two point landing on your feet, knee down, still clutching, you're ready to go, bow, unscathed by the boiling cauldron of molten rock. And I hunter's mark the, um, the guy attacking near Percy and Scanlan, and I shoot two arrows into him. Okay, right there. Yeah. Go for it. Two attacks. Um, that's easy. Where's my thing? Hold on, sorry. Um, <laughs> You're on deck, Keyleth. 21. 21 hits. And um, 17. Both hit. That's nice. Um, 13, uh, 17 on the first hit. All right. And then 18 on the second hit. Nice. Both arrows. Shoo, shoo. It burned to ash when the impact, but the sheer blow and the magical energy behind it from the bow that you threw it from hit it, and you can see it begin to shake its form even more. It's self. It's do the, the hundred-point damage as well. Yeah. There we go. Cool. Uh, then you turn back. Yes. Keyleth, you're up. Okay. Work with me here. Okay. All right. What you got? What you got? So here's what I want to do. I want to kind of like go low and kind of dive into that lava pit Ooh. in front of me. Sounds scary. And I want to kind of using the lava around me to rise out of the lava and look really like scary and badass. And I'm gonna <laughs> shout to the living elementals. I'm gonna be like, "Hear my warning! Nope. I am your new master. Nope. Retreat to the fire plane or meet your imminent demise. This is your last chance." Thanks. Circle yes or no. <laughs> And if you'd like me for copulator, I'm Aren't they frozen? Uh, I'll, I'll say, uh, given the use of, of lava controlness, there's a little mentals. Go ahead and make, go ahead and make a, uh, a persuasion check. No, intimidate, it's me, intimidate. Okay, that's better than my persuasion. Let's do this one. I'll roll back. Get out of here. Get out of here. Uh, 15. 15? You can see the uh, the smaller elemental here that has watched its friends get frozen solid as well as whatever that skeleton was. Um, kind of looks, turns towards you and <laughs> begins to make its way this direction. Oh, uh, towards the portal. Yeah, the, lar the large one doesn't seem prominently phased by your display. Okay, but that one's freezing out. Yeah. Do I still have an action? Uh, I would say that whole thing of bringing up the molten rock and the shout and everything would be your action. Okay. Knock one off playing. I knocked one off playing. Nice. There you go. Okay. All right, and your turn, Keyleth, things to Percy. Um, am I, I'm toe to toe with, with the, that one right there. Yeah, it's right up in your space. Right, it's in my space. Um, okay, I'm going to I'm, I'm going to draw my sword. I'm going to try and move back and forth. Uh, let's see how this goes. Right. Um, I'm going to take a uh, I'm going to take a swipe at it with my, my sword. Go for it. Um, that's a uh, thirty. That hits. That hits. Um, you take nine points of damn fire damage as just striking it. The flames burst back and burn towards your face and torso from the impact. Did I put fire resist on you at the end of last game? Uh, yes, you did. I have fire resist on me. Okay. So, so all right. Damage, so that's right? so, yeah. so, so how much how much fire damage? Roll damage four. Four damage. Four damage. Four damage. Four damage. Four damage. <laughs> all right. And four damage. roll damage for your strike. Uh, ooh, uh, fifteen points of damage. Hmm. All right. Um, so you want to make a second attack, soon? or are you just gonna keep going back and forth? Which way? What are you doing? He's, you're being, he's being a dick. I'm, I'm gonna try and I'm gonna try and break away and back up. I'm gonna try and roll away from, roll away from him to okay. the other side of the rock. Okay. As you roll away, it's gonna go ahead and make a attack at you. That is a plus. That's an eighteen to hit. Um, my armor class is eighteen. Um, but I'm gonna use my shield for a plus five of my AC. So. Okay. So use your, your your shield burst. Okay. As it strikes out towards you, shrinking its elemental claws outward, you back away, instilling the power of the broken. You see arcane shield temporarily shing, just ricochets, pushing its claw away from you. You run away unharmed to the other side of the rock. Um, I'm actually I'm, I'm gonna instead of going to the other side of the rock, I'm just gonna back. I'm gonna run straight back, and I'm okay. just gonna shoot at it as I, as I run away. I'm gonna take more shots at it. Uh, all right, I'm gonna take one more shot because I have to reload. Um, and I, that's a 15. 15 hits. Wow! Oh, oh, no, that aren't very hard to hit. No, that was amazing. Oh, sorry. Well, not right um, that's just 10 points of damage. 10 points of damage. And then I reload. All right, you reload. All right, then it's Percy's turn. Scaling, you're up. Uh, who's behind me back back there, way at the edge of the map? Over there? No, uh, holding Vax. something. That's Vax? Oh, he'll be fine. Okay, um, uh, I don't want to be near this thing, probably, right? That's your call. <laughs> um, okay, I'm gonna take a, a step uh, towards Vax. Okay. And, uh, and away from. There? Gurn, right? Uh, so oh, is Gurn. There's Gurn there. So yeah, 15 feet away from me yet so far? Uh, he's 15 feet from me yet. Okay, so I will then cast Thunder Wave, uh, which should not hit Gurn, but will hit Vax. Okay, well, is it a 15 foot radius? Yeah, uh, it's a 15 foot, foot cube. Cube, so you can just make the cube here and it'll hit none of them. Oh, oh, right, please. I'll do that. Right. <laughs> so, um, uh, and I'll do uh, so. And I'll do it at level 2, Thunder Wave. All right, level 2, Thunder Wave. Evasion. Oh, it's a self infinite cube originating from you. So yeah, yeah originating so, yeah, from so me. Alright, cool. So uh, level three, that's three D eight. Let's see, it makes constitution saving throw. Does not, not with a natural seven. Uh, so go ahead and roll your damage, three D eight thunder damage. Not very much. Ooh, that's pretty good. Twenty. Twenty. Nice. How do you want to do this? Oh! 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 Oh!
Uh, Shut up! I, uh, I, I send the thunder wave out by cracking my knuckles, and as I do so, I, I do, ahem, <clears throat> Gurn, I want to check this out. Oh, I'm, I'm looking at something over here. Gurn, Gurn, I'll be with you in just a minute. Gurn, I'm doing, doing something really cool. I'll here. be with you in just a minute. <laughs> so I do it anyway with a scowl on my face. <laughs> oh, I don't like uh, Oh, I was just, <laughs> why didn't you wait? I just said a minute. I get it, it was, you had to be there. All right. I was here, but you didn't, you should have told me. <laughs> You even missed your own thunder wave spell. You're so distracted. Current frustration. You look back. You crack your knuckles, and it's gone. But you didn't see it happen. And it's a little disappointing overall. I kicked the dirt. <laughs> All right. You guys uh, look over as this elemental runs off towards the glowing doorway. You see further down this passage. It's not that far away from you, but you do see the flickering doorway. It's like, um, you can see other entities beginning to step out of it, and you can see one larger form. It looks kind of fiery, kind of humanoid. Just kind of comes out the lower body, made of ash I'd and rush cinders. That way and look for my other tribe. Where, can I see any of my other tribe mates? Make a check. So if they're frozen, does that make that dead? Can you find out? Probably yeah, can I walk over the that's better. That one keeps, that one keeps talking with me. What'd you say? Perception? Yes. Uh, uh, 26. 26. Currently from where you stand? No, sorry, sorry. 24. 24. From where you stand, you can look off in the distance, you can see parts of the, the tree line uh, across down the center grove shifting and moving, and you hear the distant sounds of combat, but you do not- I will just point out, agreeing with Dr. Hoovy, there are so many cool cleric subclasses. Cleric has so many cool fucking classes. Subclasses. Um... Forge cleric being absolutely one of them. I can't think of a cleric subclass that has come out past the PHB that I don't like. I like all of them. I have a visual perspective. It looks like the other teams have not quite made their way to the center. You're actually the first team to get here. Oh, um, and you're kind of, you, you, you kind of, you made your way around a possible encounter right. and doing so arrived before the other teams did. Okay. However, it looks like a secondary line of defense is now pouring okay. out of this doorway. Oh, shit. Can I make my way to the two frozen statues types? Three statues. Yeah. Oh, three of them, yeah. Including Thaddeo Buckle. Thaddeo Buckle. <laughs> can I make my way over to one of them and should I just make sure they're dead? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Push yeah. Them, smash them, smash can I push Trident Dick over? Cool. Yeah. Uh, as you shove, and it's pretty heavy form, especially with the ice that's, you know, formed around the body. You get mad. But not too hard for you, Gronk, because you're gone. You give a little shove, and it pops over, just shatters yeah, into yeah, a hundred pieces. Yeah. <laughs> do the other one now. Yeah, no, no. Oh, yeah, can I go over to the other one? Kind of like, <laughs> yeah, this time you give this one a full push. This one actually gets 10 feet in the air <laughs> before scattering across the ground. Pieces of it actually spilling into the, the molten lava. <laughs> and there stands, frozen in place, Fatty Arbuncle, chest destroyed, oh. arm kind of limp to the side. Just... Can I pick, can I pick and walk, and walk him back over to go and go, sorry. <laughs> You see the giant, the, the half giant Goliath handing you the frozen body of your skeletal friend. Well, I don't know what I'm supposed to do with this now. You don't want him. I mean, he's not very. Maybe we could have a quick burial. You could hang a coat on him. So we basically would just carry him around <laughs> as, a, as a coat rack. <laughs> don't we have company incoming? I was about to say, don't we have a giant back monster? I hunted monster. Is it close by? Yeah, stealth, stealth. We'll get to that as soon as we come back from this. Oh! We're going to take a quick bathroom break and we'll see you guys back here in about 10 minutes or so. We can take this next time. Bum, bum, bum. Bum, 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 bum. What do we have for the break? Two, two minute art break. Art to break. That's a normal. Art to break. Uh, 27. 27. Uh, 2755 is what we're aiming for. Right about there. Right about there. <laughs>
you know, it's a lot of Zara art, but I think it's, I think there probably was also Kasha art. I just could tell. <laughs> Cause I, I feel like there probably was Kasha art and I just like, it's not like I forget what Kasha looks like, but he doesn't look like as distinctive as Zara. So I was picking up a lot more on the Zara art. Um, anyways, uh, Okay, I think that's about it. As always, art is cool. <laughs> Back to Critical Role. Oh, whoops. Uh, last we left there off, we um, the party was making their way towards the center of the caldera where the portal torn open to the fire elemental plane resides over a flow of molten rock pouring in three directions from the center of the mountain. Uh, seeing a number of entities swirling around and some pouring forth from this open doorway, Vox Machina and their current a temporary ally by the traveling dragonborn wizard slash necromancer slash candle maker named <laughs> Gurn Blanston. They're here. Have uh, made their way in this direction. Now, before we start, just reminder, guys, I guess we're getting pretty close to 16k subscribers. When we hit 16k, something with the sloth is going to happen. Like, not tonight, though. No, not. I don't think tonight. No, no, no a sloth on standby. Oh no. But um, but yeah, there uh, there will be a sloth apparently that will come here for 16 and 16k and a sloth. And you want to watch Laura freak I out. I want to hold us lot. Oh, so much. <laughs> also, we have a giveaway winner for the evening. Toast King Jr. is the winner of our tonight's. And then I'm going to use ah. my longbow of the sky. So oh no! Oh no! Oh no! no, 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 no. Fire elemental plane. This ah, is. Ah, 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 ah. I accidentally. I tried to just normal click, and I accidentally went went too far. I went too far. Uh, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, okay. There we go. <laughs> Hold on, you'll be sending you a lot Let's of fun goodies your way very shortly. So, in regards to Toast King Senior. Oh yes. Well, you made him proud. Make sure to let him know. We'll we'll give him a little pipe uh, on the inside Queen. too. Be good. <laughs> All right. So, as you guys gather yourselves, come on, stepping through the battlefield, you would just. I will say. So I kind of ragged on that combat before. I will say it was short. And it does not appear to have been a legitimate challenge i would say like i think i don't know that the purpose of it was to be pub stomp or if it was meant to uh suck up resources like there's a lot of reasons that you might place a combat there and in general i think it's much more okay to have maybe weaker or less developed uh, battle maps that are a little bit closer to white room combats um, for those maybe like less involved combats. I, I think that's that's totally fine. So I will say overall, like I don't think it was a good battle arena, but also I don't think you need like a super good battle arena for maybe that type of like lower intensity, lower challenge combat. Just encountered the shattered and slowly melted. Specifically because it went so fast. If it was going to go longer, but if it goes super fast, it can be like part of like a tonal discussion. You know, you can, it can serve a lot of other purposes other than being a puzzle and a challenge and whatever. It can serve a lot of purposes. So we'll have to see. Melting pieces of ice that once were some of these fire elemental denizens scattered around your feet. Oh, you step shit. forward as you see the what? somewhat human, somewhat flame-based entity come pouring out of the void, surrounded by other elementals and one of the other standing salamander general-type individuals. You can this see them. This is coming out of the rip. Yes, coming out of is the rip. Is that behind him? Is that what the, the This the is the thing? actual doorway right there. Oh. And so this like is a pool of lava that they're coming out yes, of? Yes, this is, is all molten. Molten fire Fuck. plane, more or less? Uh, well, it, this is actual uh, lava from the inside of the mountain ah. that's been called forth and cracked. Ah! Ah! Oh! Ah! Through the surface because of the presence of, of the tear. This. Oh my gosh. Okay. He gave me lines. Probably fine. <laughs> he gave me <laughs> lines. Probably. I don't see a problem. I don't think this will be bad. Uh, we did not take a short rest, did we? Uh, no, you did not. No, we did not. But in the middle of the. There has been no time. Don't go to the fire plane. I'm gonna, and upon seeing this, and it's so funny because this map still has exactly the same like terrain on it, but I think this terrain instantly works so much better. Uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna draw the map. Well, let's play. Drop my fire elemental form. Alrighty. How'd you give me water? Oh. Um, and I say, oh shit. Uh, 
I have a feeling this is a him they were talking about, and I have a feeling he's not gonna believe that I'm the real new master. So, there's that. So, do some, um, do some cold stuff, like like this guy. I like your old self-check, by the yeah, way, oh, as right. transpiring, and these entities are now you making... Have... That's without a trace? Is that still a I need 100 marks. I'm straight to that ended, unfortunately. Sorry. Okay. Um. <laughs> 14. 14. 15. 15. Oh, wait, uh, with 15. pass without a trace? No, no. no okay. 15. 24. 34. 22. 22. Okay. Uh, as you guys are all having this conversation, kind of hushed behind this barricade of broken tree elements, you can see uh, this sound manager will turn and kind of hiss in that direction. Hiss! Look over and point his trident in the direction of where you all are, and you can see the larger fire elementals all of a sudden turn their attention in the direction of the rest of the party as the um, the humanoid is kind of floating about five feet off the ground, his lower form is kind of the swirl of cinders and black ash. He kind of chuckles with his arms crossed. <laughs> Points forward, and the elements begin moving forward. Uh, thank uh, you. Let's do a, do a quick ancillary reaction before shit happens. Uh, well, this would be the initiative order now. Oh god. So everyone will initiate. Ah. Uh, they see something behind us. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Oh, oh, Jesus. Me. Sucking it up. Dude. Yeah. No. I'm, yeah. That's okay. Well. Okay. <laughs> All right, folks. This brings us to uh, twenty-five to twenty. Twenty. Hey. <laughs> Dude. <laughs> Don't make a bad. <laughs> Take a bad roll. Twenty to fifteen. Uh, Nineteen. So? Nineteen. Yes, yeah, so I'm 15, 15, 15, 15. Sixteen. Sixteen for Gurn. 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 Fifteen to ten. Thirteen. Thirteen for Percy. Uh, ten to five. Eight. Eight for Gurn. Uh, Scanlon, what's your? Oh, ten. Oh. Sorry, ten. Ten. So that'd be just for you, Percy. Yeah. Alrighty. We got all that. And there. And that brings us to the side. All right, so. I'm seven, by the way. Oh, seven. I got you. the gym. Nobody cares, Marisha. I know. I'll just <laughs> be back here. Caboose. All right, there we go. So right before Grog is Keyleth. Great. No. All right, top of the combat round. No, 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 no. no. All right. Shitty initiative. It's going to be fine. This, he's cut things out of cardboard. This doesn't look good. Oh, no. <laughs> there, there was, there was a, a thought process. Oh, shit. Tower. There was an instructable involved in this. This is just really. <laughs> Some pepper cure. Zoomed. No, 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 he was no, down no. in the play zone before. Ooh, cool. Down, down, down. The, uh, the, which, let's see. How many wants to roll an arcana check as you see this entity rising Absolutely. up? Absolutely. I will as well. Sure. People who are proficient with it. Two. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, with disadvantage, right? Yes, you do. I'm so tired. Yeah, I'm okay. Uh, 24. Hey. Whoa. Whoa. Get out of here, Dragonborn. Get your brain on girl. All right. Uh, you I'm very smart. <laughs> <laughs> and as you say that, you recognize this entity and blurt out its name just instinctually as you get a proper view of it. Uh, one of the many denizens of the Fire Elemental Plane, this is Nefriti. It is a fire genie. What? Nefriti? Nefriti. Nefriti. It's the species of Nefriti. Uh, but in Ifrit, however you want to pronounce it, a flame genie generally hailing from the city of brass and or spaces around in the Fire Elemental Plane. I can feel it from that side. Yeah, I know. I can, I can feel it. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so uh, floats above all of you, arms still crossed, opens the arms and as it chuckles, both hands just right. are engulfed in flames that congeal into these large firing balls. That... <laughs> okay, so to give an example of like why I do this sort of thing, what I would, you know, if I constructed this map, how I would play, because this is not considering adversaries, right? I think immediately what I see here is a potentially good place for ranged combatants to be right there, because if we're entering our, our party, Right here, there is two steps any way they go, at least two steps, for them to get here for like any melee combatants. So instantly, if you want to have, if you want to jack up the difficulty a little bit, you can put some uh, some ranged combatants on this node. These are the sort of things that I think about when I use this sort of um, this this sort of system. Um, I think a flying enemy sitting on top of, you know, this uh, kind of transfer line is great. Oh, all in all, way better. Way, way better. And I think if you were just looking to, like, introduce the general concepts of these general enemy types and the generalized terrain, I think the first combat works to do that. Oh, no. Flings them both down in the direction of the party. Oh, oh, my God. Mega Man boss. <laughs> uh, this is going to be at Scanlan and Vex. What? These are fireballs, right? So Scanlan, that is fireball. 13. No way. Vex, that is 15. No. Both just <laughs> cracking into the ground by the sides of where you're standing, barely missing them. Uh, it just kind of keeps glaring down to rest you with a smile. Uh, ending that, it brings us to Vex. You're up. Uh, I'm, I got a high stealth right beforehand, so is, am I hidden at the moment? Uh, as far as you know, depending on the individual. Know. You don't know who saw you and who didn't. Uh, all right. Uh, <laughs> pulse. All right, I'm just gonna throw three daggers at the salamander right from where I am. Right from where you are? Yeah. All right. Okay, so uh, first is 20, second is 14, third is 19. Okay, uh, the first one was what? 20. The first and the third hit. Okay. Are we, if you are hidden though, which you would not be hidden from this individual, yeah. uh, you do have advantage on those attacks. You can reroll the. And if I'm hidden, it's a surprise, right? On that guy? You no, no, it's a sneak attack if you're hidden. Oh, okay. The surprise round is if they have no okay, idea that you're there. Okay, good. Yeah. Fine. Cool. Uh, okay, so. Um, if you have advantage, or maybe one of those would be a 20 if you reroll the All right. Damage. No, and other one. No. no. Uh, so. Uh, 
Is a ten. <laughs> Pick us off strong. Not bad. Between both daggers, whoosh, whoosh, one strikes it like square in the sternum, and the blade kind of cracks and pops as it hits the center of the chest. It right. all can't make any sound as it whoosh, disappears from the wound, turning to your belt. The second dagger manages to come towards it. It tries to parry out of the air, but in doing so, it just gets embedded in its forearm and it kind of shrieks out in pain. <laughs> as that two vanishes and pierces your belt. Are you gonna move? Your uh, I'm gonna move. I'm gonna I'm gonna skip to my right and stand behind Grog and spank him on the ass and say, "Go get him, Tiger." Go get him, Tiger, right there. All right. My name's Grog. <laughs> Next, you're up. Um, is there any? Are those trees? Do they have any substance at all? Or are they just there to look pretty? Right I mean, you can get behind them if you want to. Uh, they're, they're like maybe about like that wide. Okay. Um, Charlie Brown. Charlie Brown. Charlie Brown. Charlie Practically. Charlie Brown. 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 What about 23? That does it. All right, how about oh. uh, the Mega Miss? So one of those hits, okay. I'm a loser. <laughs> Shooting past and the third one, spoof, hits it as it's kind of holding the flame balls in his hands. It's kind of, you need to like sacrifice. small impact, it just kind of glares at you through the impact. A small mammal, maybe we can find like a squirrel Seven. or something. Look! Like a pagan ritual, okay, cool. I got a kid. <laughs> that's about 17 points of damage and that's it, because I suck. 17 points of damage, Already. Uh, and you are hiding behind the tree. I'm hiding behind the tree. End of Vex's turn. All right, it is now the elemental oh, turn. Dice! Oh boy. Oh, oh boy. Oh, oh, this is winner? It's going to move in and actually consumes the space oh, of Gurn and his great. followers. It's not even a figurine, it's just a chunk of plastic. <laughs> so, as you're saying, you see this fire just streak around real fast, and all of a sudden just step into the space where you and your two undead followers are, flames just whirling around you. Uh, all of you immediately take uh, five points of fire damage. You and your two allies, Stimpy and Coral. Poor guys. Coral! Uh, so, those two guys, weren't there? Oh, they killed one. Right. Yeah, and you guys killed, you fucking killed one too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, they both have six. Yeah. All right, so with that, it is going to make two strikes towards you, Gurn. Uh, the final mental rushes in and just... And not the just fast, not the fast! <laughs> uh, that's going to be a 13 to hit. What's your armor class? 13. Just hits you. Oh. And that's an extra 20. Oh, oh, fuck. So you take 14 points of fire damage from the first Doesn't hit. Doesn't feel natural. No. Uh, that's 14 points of damage in the first one. Thanks for coming. Thanks for coming. And eight, six, seven. Friend of the show. 19 points of fire damage from the second strike. Oh. And you are currently oh, engulfed in flame. Oh, God! Hot fire from the impact of the fire elemental. It doesn't hurt. I'm fine. I'm, I'm fine. <laughs> I'm hard to do Dragonborn have natural fire resistance? Certain ones do. Oh no! If it was lightning, <laughs> it'd be fine. No! <laughs> <laughs> Alright, that ends uh, that elemental's turn. This one is going to. It's going to step into the space where both Percy and Scamlin are. Both of you guys immediately suffer seven points of fire damage. I'm half the diver. Correct, so you take three points. And it's going to make a strike on each of you. Uh, There's going to be a. Uh, 14 versus you, Scamlin? Uh, that does not hit me. Alright, and then versus Percy. Same roll. 14. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, you're adorable. <laughs> this is you both with a series of terrible attacks. Uh, that ends their turn. Gurn, you're up. Gurn. At the start of your turn. It's my turn. But first, you have to take your, your, your fire damage. Oh, I'm still getting. I'm still on fire. Yep. All right. Well, you, at the top of your turn, because you're now on fire, you take six points of fire damage. <laughs> Flame you're just leaves the fire all around. It's a bad day. It's a bad, bad Sunday for Gurn. Oh, boy. Um, hmm. I'm trying to find something that won't destroy. How close is everyone to me? Everyone's pretty close. Uh, no one's near the big guy. No, but I'm standing. I'm right there. So I feel like I'm. Well, here you can see right here, you're at the little red right there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then your two followers are right there. If anything that goes in a cube, you can be fine. Do you have anything that's in a cube shot? Which way am I facing? Oh, I'm not facing. Wherever you want. Okay. Um, I mean, I guess, I'm, can I run around and throw another? I'd like to run around and throw another cone of cold you can aimed at that guy and then up at the prick hovering above everyone. Destruction you mean? Yes, Okay. So, Hi. so you can move around <laughs> to this side of the elements in this case, you kind of pushing past your allies, whip around, you get a little bit of view through the fire and the flames that are swirling around you. Uh, you concentrate and then release a burst of cold energy. Um, oh, it, might not, it might not be close enough. Uh, of course it is! <laughs> It'll be enough to oh, no. get those two there. All right, well, I suppose that's, that's so impressive. That's impressive. That's that's impressive. Nothing at all. Nothing. All right, so Constitution saves on the Elemental. Uh, that's a, what's your DC? Is that 15? Uh, 16. 16 fail, fails, and then on the uh, Salamander, that is another big fail with a 13. So we're going to 8 damage. Oh, fuck. All right, 5, 6, 13, 19, 23, 25, 31, 40. Oh, four, I'm sorry. Uh, what was that last one? Shit. 31, 35. 31, 35. 35. <laughs> right, 35 points of cold damage to both the Salamander and the Elemental in front of you. Great. And so you see a beautiful blast of Winter Arc energy just skirts forward, uh, casting most of the dark area here in snow and ice and sleet. You can see the uh, the front of the lava pond is cooled for the moment, um, and actually can be walked across probably for one to two more rounds Ooh, as the nice. lava is now turned to You're dark. welcome. <laughs> still on fire, by the way. Yes, we're also still on fire. Um, it would take, so, someone has to take an action to try and douse the flames on him, whether it be himself or possibly your ally. So this is a good example of why I called a lot of these like lava pools and trees and whatever, why I kind of like abstracted that barrier, that path into a challenging path. 
these are not probably obstacles that you're just going to like get past and deal with. They're always going to be there. But this is also a great example of most challenging paths should be able to be temporarily mitigated if you use resources. So the idea that, oh, you used a resource, um, even if it wasn't, you know, explicitly to do that, I think it's a really good reward to say, oh, you used that resource, this path is maybe isn't challenging anymore. For one turn, temporarily, this path is, is much, much easier to travel down. Um, so really just nice little, I'm loving Matt's moment to moment DMing this session. I think he's fucking nailing it. Uh, I mean, not to say that he like doesn't normally, there's just a lot of stuff that's standing out to me as like very, like really great choices, uh, throughout this session. Oh, you still, have, you still get actions to your two, uh, undead Oh, oh um, in that case, I think I'd like to ask the, the zombie character, which I believe was, no, Stimpy was a skeleton, I believe this is Coral. Coral. This is Coral. Mm -hmm. I'd like to have Coral, uh, rip, is my, is my skin on fire, or is it just my vest? Both, actually. <laughs> I, I, actually, the scales are starting to- Those crisp. are really hard to get! The vest? Yes! <laughs> um... <laughs> I, I need to have the zombie's body hurl its body on top of me onto the ground and roll around on me <laughs> to get the flame off. It's a very okay. stinky enterprise. Okay. okay, I'll allow this. You, um, you're, 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 you are intentionally going prone. Uh, so you'll start your next combat round on the ground since you have half your movement as uh, Stimpy hobbles over uh, and begins it's to terrible. roll around. Is, 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 there, is there like snow or ice on the ground? Uh, there is isn't behind the elemental, yes. Is, is, can he scoop some up? Uh, the zombie can take one action, unfortunately. It's not a super intelligent creature. One or the other. All right, then I, I suppose he just has to roll on top of okay. me. Okay. Oh, so you guys glance over the corner of your eye, you see the dragonborn all of a sudden jumps to the ground, sprawled out, uh, snow angel style. Do it! Just do it already! <laughs> what are you waiting for? Uh, as this undead begins just flailing about on top of his body, he's starting to get like elements of, of you know, decaying goo. Yes, it's fucking terrible! <laughs> but the flames do eventually go out over the next, you know, five to six seconds or so. Um, so what would you like to do? <laughs> um, I mean, uh, I guess, do I, I would have to give him a candle then, wouldn't I? You would, yes. Right. Um, Maybe he just uh, scoops up as much ice and snow as possible and attacks the... <laughs> sure. All right, so uh, Snippy goes over. Snowball fight. <laughs> picks up some bits of the frost on the ground with the skeletal hands. <laughs> Lose it. Uh, funnily enough, hits. Uh, oh, yeah, it does. Because it's right there. Um, and we'll say for that particular instance, it Like takes 100 points of damage? <laughs> three points of cold damage. Yay! Snippy! <laughs> Immediate steam yeah. in the face of a fire elemental. That smell like cooked cow eggs. <laughs> <laughs> First, you're up. Uh, weird question. What uh, what saving throw does, does a creature have to make uh, with with your sword? Uh, to, oh, wisdom. It's a wisdom saving throw. Yeah. There's constitution for the strength. Cost constitution. constitution saving throw. <laughs> good, good to know. I just answered the first thing that popped in my head. <laughs> Was wisdom fascinating? Okay. Uh, I'm right in the thick of it, aren't I? Percy, that's not what Hex does. <laughs> I feel I have experience with this. I know the warlock hex <laughs> confusion. That's not what hex does. Right. Yes. Um, Could be wrong. I'm gonna I'm gonna break away. I'll take the hit. That is I don't like attacking these things straight on. I'm gonna I'm gonna take the top of your turn, by the way. Mm -hmm. You take My nine mind. points of fire damage down to four because you are also engulfed in flame as a scanlin for having passed over the space there. Nine points of fire damage down to four. So I'm um, okay. Um. So I'm going to I'm going to. Break away and take a, take a run forward towards that crater in the, in the, in the far right corner. Um, the this way here? Yes. Okay. Um, uh, running past the bottom of the left attack opportunity on you, swinging out with its flaming appendage. Mm -hmm. uh, that's going to be a 13 to hit. Yeah, nope, rolling low. Hit. Uh, that's fine. I'm going to take my bonus action, action and I'm going to um, uh, cast Hex on it. On which one? On the one I just ran away from. Okay. That elemental is now currently Hexed. Uh, with a disadvantage on constitution saving throws. Oh, okay. Hey. Didn't work. Hey. That's fucking. You're thinking of Bane, Percy. I know this to be true. <laughs> My, in my experience, the best thing to hex is strength uh, for like grapples and shoves and shit, but it's a very understand. It's very, very understandable. It's just wrong. I don't think any blood though. Is it saving throws or is it ability checks? Uh, ability checks. Yeah, it does not take saving throws. Gotcha. All right, never mind. Uh, well, that's fine. Since I've, I've broken off, I'm going to take some shots at him anyway. I'll take, the, I'll take uh, three shots. Go for it. First one is a 18, 18 hits. That's seven points of damage. Already. Uh, second one's a sharp shooter. Um, that's. Ooh. 25? 25. And with that shot. Hey! Yeah. Yeah. Jeez, leave some for the rest of us, uh, big boy. Actually, wait, wait, go back. Wait, go back. Let's go back. This is only took all the damage from the Conan Colts. This one is still fine. Oh. Found oh. you a victory. That's uh, so weird. He disappeared for a moment. I haven't actually damaged him yet, have I? Uh, you did seven damage. No, I didn't, because I didn't. Oh, that was the first damage. The second damage I haven't done yet. No, you're not. Okay. Like, uh, 20 points of damage. All right, nice. Uh, another sharp, uh, sharp shooter. You're getting access to this, right? Uh, no, I'm not. Okay. Uh, D6 each of these, buddy. Oh, so that's uh, six oh. extra points. And oh. Yes, melee attacks are strength, but a attack roll is not an ability check. 
Uh, like a like a like a strength based attack roll is not a strength based ability check. Um, so it would really only apply to like shoves, grapples, that sort of thing. Um, unfortunately, <laughs> that's seven extra points total already. And third uh, sharpshooter shot. Thank you for running on the hex. Um, that's uh, a twelve. That's gonna miss. Twelve misses. Unfortunately, you, you shoot too far. It actually like separates his body for a second. The flames flickering away from the impact of the bullet, <laughs> passing through. No effect. Unfortunately. Weird. Weird thing. Can I, can I spend an action surge and put myself out on the fire? You can. I, you know what? It's just fire. I will be on fire. You will be on fire, Percy. You're gonna be on fire. I'm sure. On fire. Sure. Fire. Scanlan, you're up. What is holding the thing that's floating in the sky aloft? Is he flying? Is he supported on a column of fire? Well, oh, he's brought a plastic shelf with himself. <laughs> oh, oh, of course. Of course. <laughs> of course. He's just standing on it. Like Yimei, you said It's the slogan. It appears to be flying. The very essence of this creature is like partial flame and magic, and it's just <laughs> levitating <laughs> in its lower form is a, a tiny dervish whirlwind of black ash and flame. That sounds awesome. Uh, and is he, he's, a, he's a larger creature or smaller? Large. He's a large creature or smaller? Large. <laughs> okay. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make him uh, the boy in the bubble. So I will cast Otaluk's Resilient Sphere. Yay! <laughs> what? Yes! What that? It's a, I'm going to make a bubble around him. All right, first you take four points of fire damage because oh, you're sure. on fire. Yeah, <laughs> oh, wait, no, but it was nine, right? You said? Hmm? Oh, that was four? Okay. Uh, that was when I originally got to you, and then you're, just, you're still burning every turn okay. to pick yourself out. All right, the range on the resilience sphere is 30 feet, so you're going to want to get closer oh, to cast Okay, it. I'll walk. Oh, he's going to hit me, isn't he? This is cool currently if you want to go across. Yes. You get there, um, and that'll be enough distance. Okay. It's, it's nice I'll do that. Okay. And then straight up in the air. Okay. So, let's make a dexterity saving throw. What's the DC? Oh, cool. to Luke's resilient, resilient sphere. Yeah, the DC is supposed to 20 right now, right? It is. Wow. And it rolled a 19. 18. Oh! Wow. Oh my gosh. And with that, suddenly you guys see Scanlan concentrate shouting the magical incantation through the hand cone. And You're a, in a ball, motherfucker! <laughs> you see a, a somewhat uh, pink-purple-hued globe of crystalline magical arcane energy just soop, form around the creature. And the, the, the freak just goes... <laughs> <laughs> does, does he fall? Or, or does he continue to fall? The sphere is weightless, so no, he stays where he is. And he's a good witch. Okay. Science check. Yes. Does oxygen penetrate? There's still air inside. Damn it. There's still air inside. Because that would have been amazing. I was looking away. What just happened? Oh, fuck. What? Always look at me. Oh, I was there was some. I was looking at some grubs over by the grubs. I'm hungry. Okay. Oh, and I'll turn around and I will heal Gurn. Because he's not doing great. All right. With so. my bonus action, I'll, at a second level, I will cast Healing Word, uh, and I will I will sing to him again because he loves it so much. <laughs> no, I think I'm fine with 26. Girl, baby, girl, handle it for no girl, baby, girl, burn that mother down. Yes. Uh, right. I know that. And one. so, second level is that it's two d four plus. Yes, five. Two d four plus. I know that one. Oh, shit. Oh, do I roll? Yeah. Do I roll or does he? Whichever one is Mary. Okay, and two. Yeah, I got one. Thank you. Okay. One four. Okay, so nine. Great. All right. Uh, Sian, with that end your turn, yes. you're up. Thank you. Okay. I will never again not watch your spell casting. <laughs> your tiny bundle of adorable creature. <laughs> Um, are, is that guy and that guy within 30 feet of each other? It's kind of hard to tell the uh, thing on it. Uh, there is 30 feet between them, yes. Okay. Meaning, like, a 30 foot long spell could hit both of them, correct? Uh, a 30 foot long spell could, 10, 15, you can only hit one. There's 30 feet between them. Okay, so, but this guy, oh, these, mm. this guy, uh, mm. uh, uh, put out this guy and this guy. They're within 30 feet, right? Oh, yeah. this guy or and salamander and 35 feet. between them. Oh. Yeah, the two, the, these two, yeah, there is definitely. Okay, actually, yeah, let me do that. Um, okay, I'm going to cast a tidal wave right here. And I'm gonna go outward in this direction, and it's ten foot wide and thirty foot long. Okay. So I'm actually let me back up a little bit out of it. So it's ten feet wide, and it'll go like that. You mean? Yeah. Okay, so you back up to there. Yes. Boom. All right. Ooh. Okay, dexterity save on each of them. Uh, dexterity save on the first one. That is. Uh, this is water? Do they have like this badge? Uh, <laughs> no, not not in the same throw. Uh, okay, that is the first one does make the same throw. However, there's a nineteen plus three, so 20, 22. Um, not success. It takes half as much damage. It's not prone. So it's like half. The other one, however, does fail. Do they take like more damage because it's water? Uh, how much is in this? Oh. It does forty-eight damage. Right. Go ahead and roll. I'd say how many gallons would that be? Oh, shit, how many gallons? Um. Ooh, that's good. That's, that's, um. That's awesome. Twelve plus eight is twenty. Plus another eight is twenty-eight. Math. That's that's a that's a d8 there. That's, so that's, that's yes, it is. Fourteen. Okay. Fourteen. Uh, so fourteen and twenty-eight. Uh. Okay, I'd say that tidal wave, how many gallons of water would we say each one of those is? It's thirty foot tall. It's thirty foot tall. Ten foot tall. Ten foot wide. Ten foot tall. Ten foot wide. So that's thirty feet long. That's like. Four gallons, <laughs> easily. I'd say we're looking at like close to 50 gallons of water, right? Probably like more, more than, way more than 50 gallons. gallons. A lot of gallons for sure. I think it's like a million gallons. It'd be like enough. Totally Somewhere between 50 and a million. Somewhere between 50 and a million. Why didn't we finish okay. it? Be, it would be a few hundred gallons of water. Does this matter? Does this matter? <laughs> Does this matter for a fire elemental or a nefriti or salamander ability? If not, I mean, I guess you might want to know for how it affects the lava river. Actually, that's 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 maybe a point. Yeah, I think uh, gallons determine damage. Does it? Oh. Gallons determine damage on the fire elementals? Oh, interesting. 
huh. I would just try, generally, if it were me, I would try to to keep this moving. Agree on an order of magnitude. So agree, is this in the ones, the tens, the hundreds, or the thousands? And then pick the midpoint. If I have to estimate something really quick at the table that is like something we might have to do like fucking research on, <laughs> I'd be like, all right, do we think that this is in the tens of gallons or the hundreds of gallons? Um, and then, and then we would, we would go from there. And then I would pick like 50, 500, one of the two. Yeah, that's a, that's an odd spell. That's a very odd spell. If it doesn't give you explicit guidance on it's an odd spell we'll say for the purposes of this how many deciliters of water? I know, <laughs> for, the, for, for the width of it and the space you had to pass it through we'll say roughly 60 gallons of water passes through each of these elementals okay water stability for every five feet the elemental moves in water or for every gallon of water splashed on it it takes one point of cold damage so they both take an additional 60 points of damage and the f oh my god okay you know what if it is both the spell and a weakness of the fire elemental i don't blame matt for for really litigating this i i don't blame him <laughs> because if it's on both sides of the equation where it both determines the damage and determines extra damage, you might you might want to be a little even a little bit closer um than I was saying. I mean, I think that you know him just making a decision also totally fine, but I understand why he was more concerned about it. Uh cuz even if it was if it was from neither side, who cares, move on. If it's from one side, Take a quick estimation. If it's from both sides, yeah, you have to pay a little bit more attention. Yeah. Oh, oh shit! Rich destroys both of the elementals. Oh. Oh. Do that again, Kelly! Okay. I will. Again, again. Again, again. <laughs> okay. So kill. Yeah, more movement still. If you want to move somewhere. Damn. If you want, set Thagel. Uh, if not, whatever. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll I'm mostly interested in how he ran it in the moment and if I would have run it differently. And I know that I wouldn't have sat there and calculated it. But if you have the result on hand, sure. Love, I'll scooch up a bit, kind of start moving towards... Like there? That's good. That okay. All right, that brings us to uh, Grog. You're up. Uh, I would like to rush up. Uh, West but if you don't have it on hand, don't feel the need to like look into it. News and attack uh, that little guy on the ground there. Right there? I'm the little guy on the ground. No, not, not there. Oh, no, okay. you're the other guy there. Okay. Um, and can I use a reckless attack? Uh, are you raging first or are you? Oh, you're raging. Okay. <laughs> I would like to rage. Okay. <laughs> and use reckless attack against him. All right, so you got, you got two attacks, reckless attack. That's good. I have two. Uh, 24. 24 hits. 23. 23 hits. Uh, 5, 10, 18. Uh, 18 on the first one. Nice. And 10, 5, 23. 23, nice. All right, so as you rush past, looking over at the cooled rock that's starting to crack and bits of, you know, steam vents are starting to push through underneath your feet, Scanlan. Oh. The area you're standing on isn't very sturdy. You probably want to move pretty soon. Uh, however, you see this bar barreling form of pure anger and blade from rushing past as uh, Grog just slams into the salamander twice with his blade. Uh, that uh, uh, fails first, yes. constitution, and fails second. Yeah. So you gain plus two strength. Salamander loses two strength. Yes. However, uh, because you've taken... Uh, you, take, you, with each strike within melee, the salamander's heated body, uh, is so intense by its proximity that you suffer six points of fire damage from the first melee. So you gave me resistance, so half to three? Half to two. Half to two. The other one uh, would be 12, so you take six. Okay, eight health. Total of eight fire damage, awesome. just from slamming and attacking the Salamander. Alrighty, uh, that brings us to the very end of the Salamander's turn. After being hacked twice by you, Grog, it turns around, uh, or takes its uh, trident in its both hands, looks at you with this horrible snarl. You can see now these kind of glistening, almost ruby like sharp teeth, and it's like wide grin. <sighs> these long kind of uh, uh, catfish like tendrils that kind of wave off its face as it slams down the spear towards you. Oh, you brought a fork to a sword fight. <laughs> Uh, that's going to be a 23 to hit. Oh, shit, that hits. <laughs> you take uh, 12 points of piercing damage. I will say, so I talked a lot about uh, targeting priority uh, during, I want to say, like, two or three streams ago. Uh, maybe four, even. Uh, about, like, what PCs it makes sense for... Oh, wait, no, actually, it was the Beholder fight. So, two streams, I think. Uh, anyways, about, like, which players it makes sense for any given monster to fight... You could link that sort of into the tank fallacy of, like, why attack Grog. I will say, Craven Edge is a great answer to the tank fallacy. Of, like, yeah, the, take, the tank deals, you know, maybe, Warning. like... Add incoming. incoming. Take, take cover. cover. Take cover. Maybe the Barbarian, you know, is really hard to damage. Maybe he uh, doesn't do quite as much damage as some of the backliners. But him slowly sapping your strength is a good reason to go after the tank. 
So Craven Edge, great answer to the tank fallacy in my in my mind. Um, but going back to targeting priority, I think that what Matt just did of oh you just attacked them so they're going to attack you back. I think it is a very basic way to think about target priority, but also in the moment it is it is better than random. <laughs> It is absolutely better than random. Um, and I think it is, in a pinch, a good excuse for who who this monster is going to target. Um, so I think it's a good thing to keep in the back of your head if you can't think of a more logical solution. It's just who attacked it last. Um, with that, ad is starting, and I will see you all in a little bit. Also, YouTube, I'm going to try to run this ad from the stream deck. Let me know if you get it. I'm not sure if the button works. So I'm going to press it now. Let me know when I get back if you got an ad on YouTube. Click. Goodbye.
do 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 do. What's up? Um, yeah, we got seventeen seconds left. Oh, let's see, let's see, let's see, let's see. Pull the stuff back up. Oh, also, uh, the voice was not meant to be doubled up. Thank you for letting me know. Uh, good example of like quality of life things. <laughs> Like, when I talk about making the stream more stable, that's the sort of thing I'm talking about, Thashel, is, <laughs> is doing some tests, making sure that uh, that that the, the, the experience is as good and as solid as possible. Um, uh, what up, Deadly? How you doing? How you doing? Welcome. Um, target priority also depends on the intelligence. Is the assassin squad or an animal? Oh, absolutely, Thashel. I mean, target priority depends on so many things, so many factors. Um, and sort of, you know, what, what I'm getting at with that previous statement is, uh, if you can't think of another factor to base it on, <laughs> if you can't think of another factor to base it on, but you think that the adversary would want to stay in the combat, either hitting the thing that they last hit or hitting the thing that last hit them are decent fallback plans that I think, because, like, if you can't think of any other factors, again, I think that there should always be, like, pretty pretty well thought out targeting priority. I think that's part of what makes a combat feel very interesting and real is good and uh, robust targeting priority thought. Um, but... If you're in there and shit hits the wall and you have no idea who this adversary, it would make sense for them to target, I think last hit enemy uh, or enemy that last hit them are both two good fallback options, you know? Um, uh, did I miss anything important in today's housekeeping? Not particularly, I wouldn't say. Yeah, other than housekeeping will be later in the stream from now on. Um, and I'm focusing on quality of life stuff <laughs> for the stream. Um, I did get an ad when you hit the button. Sick. Okay. That's way easier because otherwise I have to like go into this whole fucking menu on, on YouTube. Um, it's not even, it's not that hard. This is just easier. Um, sick. Uh, I did not get an ad. Some people won't. So as long as some people did, it's working. <laughs> Uh, but YouTube is very explicit of like, sometimes people just won't get ads when you like press it. Um, so I, we're, we're all good there. Um, anyways, let's get back into it. Damage. Oh, I have the six and it's going to also turn around its tail as long as snake tail <laughs> whips you. Uh, that is going to be, uh, 18 hit. And it, uh, misses. It misses. Alrighty. The tail comes towards you and you just knock it out of the way with Craven Edge. Um, that will end its turn. Top of the round, I'm gonna go make a roll for the consistency of the currently cooled lava pool. It maintains. Um, however, it's, you, you feel your feet kind of like cracking beneath and you start. Um, all right. This, <laughs> this E3, let me look at, me look at the logistics of the spell now, because <laughs> this, oh, yeah, no, this, this spell is awful. It can't do anything. Yeah. It is opposed for the duration, up to a minute. It's done. Sorry, Matt. <laughs> Sorry, like, First of the holder, how my flame, genie? It's pushing against and it takes like I mean, it's very similar to uh, to Banish, to Force Cage. Like, there are some there are some single target priority spells. This is a really uh, this is a great example of uh, what have I thought of Chris Hardwick so far? He's fun. He's silly. Uh, I know that there is some stuff about him outside of the game, so I'm trying to essentially evaluate him as if I was a critter watching this that didn't know anything else. Um, and from that perspective, I think he's bringing a lot of uh, levity and lightness uh, to the episode. Um, a lot of jokes, a lot of banter. Um, and I think that he's either playing with some interesting homebrew or he has very interesting flavor uh, around his character, which I think are both cool. Um, and then after the stream, I'm going to look into some of the maybe more controversial things that are more modern. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so I think this is a good example of this Otoluk's, uh, sphere of D and D's action economy <laughs> of the more people, especially spellcasters you have, 
just make you so much more powerful because there are so many spells, especially high level spells, that can lock targets down one for one. So like Scanlan has to keep concentration. That takes him out of, you know, maybe some of the more powerful spells that he could cast. He can still cast spells though. Um, <laughs> and it takes another adversary totally out of the fight. So it's a one for one trade. So this is a, it's a good example of like why the action economy is such an ever present force within D&D combat. Because if you have more actions on your side and you make one for one trades, you will eventually get to the point where you're the only one going. <laughs> so it's, it's, you know, if you follow it out to its logical conclusion. Um, it's also a, uh, a good example of uh, why you legitimately need more than one combatant on the enemy team, no matter how strong they are. Uh, having having some lieutenants uh, that I, I I think you will almost always have more interesting combats if instead of one big monster you split it into like kind of a medium monster and two smaller monsters. Or if you want even more than that, if you want more than three, having at least three tiers of having like at least three tiers of power. Like you don't want one big guy and a lot of griblies because again, that big guy can get locked down relatively easily by a large party. Um, so even in this, I think it's good that there's this mix of the Ifrit the fire elementals and the salamander. Uh, I think that having that variety, because I think the salamander is a bit uh, more powerful than the fire elementals. If I'm un if I'm reading it right, um, if they're not, I would have tried to pick like at least one other combatant that is more powerful than like the 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 griblies, the pawns, if you will, um, because of this exact situation. Unless. You really wanted to make Scanlan feel good, this combat. <laughs> if you wanted to make him feel good and you knew he had this spell, th then you could maybe design it where there's one big guy and and you, you know, he he locks the big guy down and he feels great. Uh, that's also a possible route. Um, I generally don't know what the general feelings are on CH right now, but the fact that this vid is still up, I think is a good sign. CR not afraid to pull the controversial stuff. Maybe. I mean, we'll see. I don't know it either. And, um... We will, we will, uh, we will see what it's like. Uh, due to it being more part of the CR canon more than anything, the CR eps with BWF haven't been pulled or edited either, as far as I know. I don't know what that means. Good uh, vagueness on the acronym, uh, and I will move on. <laughs> like these two flame balls that conjures and throws them out towards you guys. They just go <laughs> against the sphere and then go out and just kind of. <laughs> It's really like this. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> you want to rub me the right way? We all collectively look up at him and look down and go, oh. You're just rolling it back through the rift. <laughs> just rolling it back through the rift. Oh, one wheel. Oh, well. All right, uh, ending that. It's turn. Can't do anything. Back to you. Uh, all right, I'm going to uh, scoot up right in front of Keyleth on the edge of the, um, the, the frozen over pool of lava. I'm not going to stand on it. And I'm going to chuck three daggers at the salamander in front of her. Okay, right there, huh? Uh, right in front of her. Between oh. her and that. Yeah, there. there you go. Okay. Uh, one, two, three to the uh, salamander. Go for it. Uh, 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 one. Uh, and then 25, <laughs> and then 21. What's happening? Okay, I'll be it. Yeah, all right, and oh, because it's flanked by Grogs, the first one gets sneak attack damage. Uh, two plus eight, 14, 16, 17, 22, 23, 25, 31 for the first. Nice. And then uh, 10 for the second, and eight for the third. All right, good enough. <laughs> As you jump in front of the wave, Caleb, you unleash all three daggers in rapid succession, all, each one finding its mark sh 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 into the body of the uh, now profusely bleeding salamander. You can see now streaks of its own blood are pouring down, kind of boiling on contact with air, the uh, significant difference in temperature from the exterior and actual interior body, uh, causing it to change from liquid to gas. Um, That's all and your turn? I look over my shoulder at Caleb's like a dumb schmuck for a second, and then back at the salamander. Okay. Uh, <laughs> back to you up. Okay, I'm going, am I hiding? Am I hidden? Uh, you can roll stealth, check. I mean, a hide, a hide action is a hide action. It's, it's uh, as a rogue, do you have the... Um, what is that number? I don't know what number It's that completely is. smooshed off of the dice. That means that existence is about to end. Oh, there's literally... <laughs> I think it's wrong. Just roll, roll this. Okay. Roll another one. Roll my spike. You, you technically, technically, you don't have any action yet until second level rogue ability. Okay, so you, but you I had skirmish, action. my skirmish is still. If you go from hide to hide, you can do that. Uh. But you're not hidden at the beginning of the round, so... Sorry, it's a rookie rogue mistake. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's fine, that's fine, that's fine. All right, then I'm just gonna... Um... At the higher levels, you mess up the assassinate thing constantly. Everything's a concentration <laughs> thing, so I'm just gonna lightning mistake. arrow the giant, the giant fire guy. Right there? Yeah. Go for it, roll for attack. Oh, that's my new name, but I have to 
Boom. Uh, 30. Uh, that'll hit. Yeah, that's that'll hit. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Um, that's power, um, 48 power. lightning damage on a hit. Correct. Yep. Oh, <laughs> it's okay. Well, half to half that. 18. 18. That's average count. That's it. Huh? 18 more slightly damage? Yeah. All right, oh. so as you turn around the side of the tree, super releasing the arrow as it goes through the air, streaking, it all of a sudden bursts into an arcing bit of energy, <laughs> bolt of lightning, it strikes into and begins to spill around the insides of the lightning elemental. You can see it kind of shakes it off as the energy disperses. Okay, I'm going to use my bonus action to hi hide them, and it's a skirmisher's thing. For my skirmisher stealth, I can use a bonus action to hide. I'm pretty sure you have to, if you go from hiding to hiding. You, you, I swear. Okay, where was it? Right now on the air. Okay, where is it? <laughs> I don't know where it is. I'll find it, and then I'll find out. Okay. And then I'll roll for stealth benefit. Okay, I'll, I'll say I'll say for the sake right now of the distraction, go ahead and do it for now, and we'll uh, we'll correct it later if need be. Rather you have fun than not. What's your stealth roll? My stealth roll. That's... I... Big thumbs up uh, from, from, from Matt there. Uh, I think that's very fair. Let it ride for now. If she's very, you know, she's very clearly very convinced about the mechanics of this ability, let it ride. Let it roll. I'd rather you have fun than not. Like, restrictions and fall and the rules are there to promote fun. They're there to keep a general sense of balance, and because if they're if the balance gets too out of whack, it is difficult to present fun challenges, right? That's that's kind of the the down ramp of logic of we need rules to promote balance so that challenges can actually be challenging, <laughs> you know? Um, but if it's a rule that you are going to figure out later, you plan on figuring it out later, and she's convinced, let it ride in the moment. I think that's absolutely the right way to go as a DM, is you let it ride, you say, okay, you know, we'll go with what uh, you remember for now, and we'll look at it after the combat, especially for something this small. <laughs> like, it's not like she's asking to, like, you know, teleport to a different plane of existence. She's trying to hide on a bonus action. So for this sort of thing, you let it ride. And then I would even say you don't even correct it during the session. If it was me, I would say, okay, we'll look it up after the session. And we'll remember this for later. Um... And I would just let her use it as she's using it for now. Um, and then if we need to correct it later, then we would. So I, I fully agree with Matt there. He's a real good deal. He's a good guy. He's a good guy. He's a nice player. He's top of fair. Yeah, yeah. 15, 15. Who's right? Who's speaking right now? It's not in the book. It's in the... No, it's in the PDF. You haven't turned it out yet. Okay, anyway, what'd you want? 15. 15. Okay, good enough. Uh, end of your turn. This element of creature. Oh, oh god, here it comes. Come to me. Over. Oh, he's dead. Oh, he's dead. He's dead. He's dead. He's dead. He's dead. Another one tears oh, out of the portal. Oh, it's making its way here. Hi, guys. Full movement to there. <laughs> How's everybody doing? <laughs> this, this one's going to go ahead and make two strikes towards you, Scanlan. Two attacks towards me? I feel like the genie might be keeping this. That's going to be 11. Oh, is that the attack roll? The attack roll and a natural one. Okay. Elementals oh, okay. can't roll today. <laughs> And you're already on fire, so this fire form won't make much of a difference the other way. Um, all right, so that's going to end its turn, and uh, the elemental port in. That's the end of their round. All right, that brings us to Gurn. Oh, boy. <gasps> feel the Gurn, feel the Gurn. So flames are out. You can push, <laughs> you push, uh, not Stimpy, Coral off of you. Coral stand. <laughs> Um, can I, can I, is, does it count as my turn if I ask him a question about the orb? No, you can make a quick little side. If you shout it out, though. If I attack the genie, is it just going to attack the orb and then he's going to be free? Yes! I'm not, I'm not looking at you, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> it really hurts. I didn't realize how much that hurts. Yeah, I know. <laughs> oh, I've learned a valuable lesson today while I've <laughs> I half caught on fire. <laughs> um, can I cast some type of a mental spell through the orb to the fire genie? You can certainly try. Would it be too crafty if I were to cast modify memory? Could I modify the fire genie's memory to forget to not kill himself? <laughs> I'll take that as a no. <laughs> can I modify? The, uh, can I modify uh, the fire genie's memory into thinking that he's completed the task that he came to this realm to complete, and that he might go home? You can certainly try. I'd love to try. Okay. <laughs> What's the range on the spell? Infinity. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Modify. Modify memory. Where is it? There we go. Fifth level. Oh god, I hope this works. I hope it works. Uh, it's thirty foot range. So you're gonna have to get a lot closer. And you're, you're getting it from Prone, which is half your movement, so you only have 15 more feet you can move, so you wouldn't be able to even get in range. Next three squares. Where's your, uh, you to get in the lava One, pit? two, there. Yeah. yeah that's yeah, too far from 30 feet, so you wouldn't be able to get in range. Oh shit, so I, I can't cast one of them anyway, I've already cast two spells like that today. Um, you can, you can cast that's your cone of cold, you're out of the level. Use one of those first, yeah. I might, um, uh, so, which way, uh, is there a chain of people? Oh, I see a couple right there. Um, 
Laser pointer to meet it. Thank you. Uh, so maybe what I'll do is this guy's new, right? That yeah. Guy's new. And this guy has been touched, except for her lightning arrow. Um, maybe I should cast. Oh, I can shoot lightning breath, right? You can, yeah. Oh. At this, maybe I could shoot at. Uh, should I shoot at this guy or this guy? Yeah. Oh, uh, well, the guy next to me might hit me, but whatever. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, 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 I'll throw some lightning breath at this, yeah, well, this person right here. Okay, as you stand up and kind of dust off yourself, your, your fantastic <laughs> zipper-covered dance jacket, poof, brushing it off with your hands, you lumber forward to the outskirts of this newly cracking rock crust that once was a lava pool and will soon be once again. Inhale, as you guys look around, you see this glow, this blue crackling blow on the, glow, glow on the inside of his mouth. The, the blow's how he got the mountain. <laughs> um, I'm flying high, but I can't get an erection. <laughs> I get so much blow. <laughs> Gurn Blanston. <laughs> no erection. Uh, Sad. This crackling electric energy on the back of his toothy mouth as he <laughs> releases this, this blast of lightning energy forward, striking into the chest of the fire element that freshly stepped out of the portal. Um, what's the saving throw DC on that? 14. 14. It rolled a 9. Uh, so go ahead and roll the damage on the breath. How much is this? 46. 46, 46 lightning damage. damage. I'm rolling really bad tonight. They are, Matt. They are. Yeah, it's not you. 4, 10, 15, 16. Yeah, that's good. 16 points of lightning damage to that elemental. <laughs> It, it kind of pulls back from the blast. You can see its form has kind of reconvened. Uh, there's a little bit of kind of a, a black and gray smoke that billows out from the wound as it turns to you. <laughs> You've definitely got its attention. <laughs> Hello! <laughs> <laughs> with your bonus action, would you like to do anything with your uh, compadres? Um, oh, right. Uh, I still have two left, don't I? Yes, you do. Um, you do like dancing. <laughs> I'd like to send them off to start dancing just to the... <laughs> Just to the left of this gentleman right here, All right. just to distract him a little bit because he seems to he seems to call his attention. So uh, I'd like to throw I'd like to start a little dance party right there. Okay. This fellow right here, this fellow right here, the zombie um, can uh, do a little uh, break, break dancing, and then <laughs> the zombie the zombie and then the skeleton can, can do a bit of the a bit of the bird, and then maybe the worm. Don't give a dance. Right. All right, as the skeleton leaps down into the worm, <laughs> just flat laid out, cracking part of its its pelvis, <laughs> dancing without music. <laughs> no music whatsoever. <laughs> the zombie kind of like. Arr, arr, arr. His arm falls off to all that. Poppy lock, poppy lock. So the vibe is definitely sillier than normal, which is fine. It's fine. And you know, I think even if you are traditionally maybe a um a less silly table, I think, but you are bringing in a guest that's silly. I definitely think that this sort of situation where you know you're not uh you're not going into the tomb with the insta kill switch you're not going into the combat with the beholder that's the anniversary monster that people care about right it's a a relatively isolated quest with that's much more gamey you know uh, and i think that that is a is a space and a tone where the silliness uh, is is a lot less negatively impactful or a lot less detrimental, um, even at serious more serious tables. Like, and the reason I'm saying this is like, if you're a table that is generally pretty serious, but you want to bring in a guest player that might be more like Hardwick, very m much sillier. Um, not to say that Vox Machina is a super serious group. Um, but if you are in that situation, I think that this quest is a good example of, even within a relatively serious and dour overall arc, this one has a little bit more room for levity because there's not nearly as much like hyper serious uh, talk and and whatever. At least not yet. Um, so I think it's uh, it's it's a it's a good time to have that sort of guest on is is this sort of thing um um uh, also i agreeing charm i would also hate it in D, D. there's a reason that despite summoner being a consistently well-loved class in a lot of video games and a lot of video games going out of their way to make summoner classes there is a reason uh that there is no explicit summoner class and even necromancers like summoner light and the ones that do exist like don't give you like additional like they're they are few and far between in D, &D uh because if you you know have a fucking like normal summoner class where you're constantly summoning new allies uh, to like help you out in the combat, that would be such a fucking pain <laughs> in in D and D. There's a reason that most of the even like quasi summoner classes are um, are more I would say pet master classes. Uh, like Beastmaster, Pact of the Chain, Drake Warden. 
And Pet Master is a bit different of a vibe than Summoner. Summoner, I think, would be much harder to uh, deal with in D and D. Uh, and the summoning spells are famously contentious in D and D for that exact reason. I think. Uh, <laughs> Sounds like everyone's combat round would take forever. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I had Druid in my game. She made me very sad. That, it, it's hard to run. It makes everything so much slower. It makes it so much slower, dude. Why wouldn't things be better with 7,000 spiders? Oh, my God. Um, <laughs> throwback, but FFX, if you summon something, the rest of the PCs didn't have any turns until the summon went away. Yeah. Yeah, uh, and I fully read that wrong. I thought the villain was the one with 7,000 spiders. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah, 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 Ink Charm. Yeah, exactly. Um, anyways, <laughs> yeah, I know. Summoners, they just can't really work in D&D. It sucks, but it's just not really plausible. <laughs> All right, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and. Oh! All right, um, <laughs> these guys are great. Okay, they're great. great. They're great. I'm asking you to go ahead and roll a performance check. Yay! Hey! 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 That's a really bad right. spell cast. Right. Okay. Uh... Uh, oh, that was, that was oh, you have inspiration. You do. You use your D10. This is the time. Oh, so you add a D10. So seven again. plus uh, performance plus one eight, and then a D10. Roll yes. D10. Add it. Jesus Christ. Oh, no. Ten. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Trying to recall and hum the song that Scanlan once sang to you, not but ten minutes before. You don't recall it much at all. It comes out. Hey, it's gurn. It's gurn time. It's gurn time to gurn. Now you're sharp. Gurn is all the way. What's doing, Christ? Your name was in the song. Gurn is my name. This is definitely the song that I'm singing. It's important enough that on a little wisdom save, I'll say the Fire Elemental's next attack has disadvantage. That was the strangest round of combat I think I've ever had in All right, Percy, you're up. Follow that. I feel like I'm laughing. Follow that. Uh, first top of your round, you take nine points of fire damage. That's uh, to five. To the five. Mm -hmm. I have a skirmisher stealth. As a bonus action at the end of your turn, you can make a dexterity stealth check to hide again. All right, cool. There you go. Perfect. Wasn't sure if you had to be hiding at the top to do it. I'm going to shift my hex to the tiny little focus. Laura, God, you got me doing yes. it. <laughs> Damn it. Ah, oh, it's played. Yes. It's contagious. To, which one's got there? No, 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 no. The one for this for me. Right there? Yeah, right there. Alrighty. I'm going to move my hex to him. Um, I'm going to bust out the bad, bad news rifle. I'm going to sit and I'm going to take a, a nice, calm, calculated trip shooter shot at him. Alrighty. And uh, bad news just goes. Did you misfire? I misfire. Oh, no. Oh. You get down with the gun and. You look at it, you can see some of the metal kind of bowing in the center piece. Like, that's bad, that's bad, that's bad, that's bad. So I'm gonna put it down, I pull out the pistol, and I'm gonna take a shot. Okay, go for it. It's hot. It's really hot. And just keep going. Wow. That was really awkward. <laughs> 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 yeah, maybe he made your Just roll the dice. Right. You're also 60 uh, feet apart. Okay, that's uh, <laughs> Well, I mean, it was more. <laughs> 25 to hit. 25 hits? Sure. Um, that's a sharpshooter? Yeah. A sharpshooter? Wow, nice roll. That's very good. Where was that? Literally. Um, Literally. Um, Literally. Uh, six, 12, 20, uh, 22 points of damage. Alrighty. Um, and I reload, and that's my. That's your turn. Okay. Turn. Gotcha. Finish up first episode to Stanlin. You're still concentrating on the old fix resilience oh, yes, here. Yes, I am. The gnome has got this. Um, <clears throat> hey, how's that? How's that stuff under my feet? Pretty rough. You're gonna want to step off it very soon, probably. I'm gonna step into it. <gasps> uh, bloody Stanley. So I can fire a lightning bolt and hit both of those guys. Oh snap! Fire. Okay. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's it. That, that'll be my. Yeah, you can still move back. Yeah, oh, good. good. Fire them. Okay, good. Thank right, you. Right, so the bolt arcs past. Go ahead. I saw that. It was great. Oh, for once. Thank you. <laughs> It's for you. Much Five appreciated. Now, and a 12 plus 15. No, both feel the same throw. Okay, so 8d6? 8d6 points of lightning damage. Both of them. 14. It's a wonderful display, Gurren. Mm. I, uh, I ship Scanlan and Gurren. <laughs> Guys, please. <laughs> 33. 33, nice one. Oh, that lightning bubble is so big. <laughs> <laughs> and, and wide. Uh, it's the width that really does it. really does. <laughs> Not so much the length now. It's the girth of Gurn. It's uh, the Gurn. Uh, and I will re-inspire Gurn. Oh wait, you're still injured, aren't you? Yeah. Uh, I will heal Gurn. Please. Uh, with another healing word. Uh, this time at, at third level. Technically, you can only do as high. A second spell can only be as high as second level. Okay. Well, you just do spells one round. It's no, still very right. romantic. Okay. okay. I'll do a second level. All right. And I will sing to him because I'm running out of things that rhyme with his name. Go down for what? Go down for what? You might remind you I'm unable to get an erection at the moment. However, in spite of that, blue pill does give you ten additional hit points healed. Skeleton zombies start dancing better after that. Oh, yeah, they actually does pick up their pace a little bit. Now they have a backtrack. Yeah. <laughs> Skeleton starts what crumbling. What are the elemental doing while they're dancing? Uh, well, it's currently surrounded by a swirl of hex shadow and looking around very confused and wondering why I got up in the morning. Um, <laughs> yeah, you want to move out? And I can move out? Can yeah. you take a swipe at me? Uh, it will, yes. Okay. Sorry. But better than possibly falling in. Oh, and do I get. Oh. I'm still on fire, right? Yes, you are. Take an action for it out, though. Yeah, that is 18 plus 6. I believe that does sure. hit you. You take. Uh, so, so I take uh, 12 points of fire damage. Plus whatever I was on fire for. Oh, you already took the damage earlier. So, uh, I did? At the beginning of my turn? Yeah. I rolled that already, so you take 9 points of fire damage. Oh, okay. Plus 12? Plus 12. Okay. If I'm wrong, whatever, it's fine. Okay. Um, all right, that ends your turn, Scanlan. <laughs> Keyleth. Um, okay, <laughs> so we have these two assholes in front of us. Um, my name is Max. <laughs> <laughs> well, it depends on the day. Um, so that guy's still alive too, yeah? Yeah, he's yeah all three of these guys are alive. And this guy's in a hamster ball. Yeah, it's Red Rover just holding him in place. I'm gonna tidal wave again. Tidal wave! Tidal wave again. Right here, this way. 
fucking with these two guys. Alrighty, let's go ahead and roll some saving throws on their end. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. Six and eight, both fail. Hey! <laughs> Who's number one? <laughs> I'm not a number, I'm a free man! <laughs> so good, so good. The original one, not three. How's your doing? Oh, Alright, so two failed saving throws, go to roll damage on that. Uh, uh, it's really good. I'm warning you right now, seven and seven is 14, plus another six. Uh, bring me to 20, 20, 20, 20. Uh, plus eight, 28, again. Mm-hmm. 28. 28 points of water damage, plus the additional blast of water gallons surging through them, uh, manages to completely scatter yes! both of these. Whoa, oh, that's big guy! How much water we have? We actually had a critter uh, tweet us how much water. How much water would it be in the tidal wave? 125 gallons. Oh, there's no way they're surviving that. No. And then oh. technically, in tidal wave, it says, uh, uh, the water then spreads out across the ground in all directions, extinguishing unprotected flames in the area within 30 feet of it. Unprotected flames are different than lava pools, and water doesn't evaporate, it, it just evaporates. We've got steam. Yeah, right. You do, you have a very, very heavy cloud of steam now that's oh. the side. The dancing skeletons, are, uh, skeleton zombie, are now just these shadows lit in this kind of cool music video light now as they're and, dancing. And as if this were a telltale game, at the top of the screen it says, Keyleth will remember this. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, I'm then gonna use... I don't have environmental, that's nasty, man. That's the wrong way. Um, there you go. Can I use my bonus action? <laughs> Perfect. This is happening, guys. <laughs> Is the rest of your turn, Gila? Um, Do to move somewhere? Question. Yes, what's question? What's the question? Can I theoretically cast a Grasping Vine coming out of the Hellmouth? No, Grasping Vine is a fourth level spell, I believe, and as a bonus action, you can't do anything more than a second level spell the same round. Oh, never mind. Sorry. Uh, actually, no, that's not true. I will take my uh, oh, bonus healing word to toss another healing word, just first level over the Gurn. Hey! Let's keep keeping the Dance Master alive over there. Oh my god. Man, turn off the music. <laughs> I don't even know if there's, like, a lot I could say about this, because it's... In terms of, like, player advice or DM advice or whatever, I mean, this is very clearly would depend on the uh, on the table and the players, but uh, I'm getting annoyed watching it. <laughs> Amazing. So you heal. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you heal eight points, girl. Eight, eight points of healing, Tigger. He's gone. He's gone. He's out. We can't, we can't save him. Rod, you're out. Uh, I'll use uh, another reckless attack, and I'll make the first strike against um, the guy right in front of me. Go for it. Jesus. Uh, 14. 14 misses. Damn it, uh, and the second one. Are these with, uh, with Great Webmaster? No, just reckless deck. This one's with Great Webmaster. Okay. Nope. Right on. Uh, 16 plus 9 is 25. Minus 5 is 20. That hits. Go to the damage. Hey, let's see. 3, 5, 10, 18, 28. 28 points of damage. Okay. Uh, this time, as you release the first blow of your sword forward, he actually catches it in the blade of the trident and deflects it off to the side, slamming it into the ground, almost pinning the weapon for a second. He's up in your face and grins, and the actual breath emanates from his teeth begins to burn and singe the edge of your beard hairs, and that infuriates you. And with that, you actually lift up a uh, created edge between the blades of the trident. It's a test of strength as you both tense, and eventually you uh, lift it back with a backswing, slash him right across his chest with that blow. You see a strike of, of extremely hot, hot blood just splatter across, and it singes the front of your chest and leave little burn marks on you. Yes. Yeah, like, he, like freckles. You don't want to fuck with his beard. <laughs> uh, you you, you make it make it name. <laughs> Uh, sorry, uh, uh, well, uh, 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 Alright, <laughs> next round. <laughs> Efrit's gonna go ahead and start pushing against the ball, which is going to just begin to coast through the air this way. Woof. That's a joke that's probably fine with friends, but it took me a second to connect it, and I was like, oh. Oi, oi, oi. Uh, see you later, Deadly and Brittany. Right. <laughs> <laughs> does, he, does he spin the globe? <laughs> Oh my gosh. <laughs> Just kind of gliding through slowly. Answer. Yeah, that's, uh, that's about all I can do this turn. Mm. Sorry. Oh no, God. no, it's, it's what you do. It's what you do. All right, Vax, you're up. <laughs> man, all right. Uh, I'm in a good spot. I'll just throw three more daggers at the Salamander. The Grog has not yet killed. Uh, first one is a natural 20. Oh. The second one is a 13. And the third one is a... Oh, fuck. Is a 14. Okay. So uh, the first one is... hold off on those two attacks just in case how much damage your critical yeah. sneak attack does. Blech. 5, 6, 7, 8, 12, uh, 18, 21, 25, uh, pl- uh, 25, so you double the dice, is 56 for the first one. Okay, so as you throw <laughs> the dagger, it goes right past Grog's ear and you hear the, of the wind as it just brushes past your face after you finish your back swing of Craven Edge. As the Salamander creature re- rears back from the impact, it looks towards you and just its eyes twitch just ever so slightly to your right as it sees the incoming blade a little too late as it shoof, right into its right eye socket. It just, uh, its tongue lolls out of its jaws, it falls onto its back, and its tail kind of moves and twitches for a few seconds before it eventually goes limp. No, no, he's still alive, and I kick him, and I'm like, now he's dead. <laughs> <laughs> so stomps it into the ground, twitching stops. Now just roll it. <laughs> That's right. Okay. Does the dagger stay in his eye socket? Uh, it's currently in the eye socket, yeah. Ooh. Can I reach down and grab it? Yeah. Reach right. down and grab the dagger, and as you pull it out, it turns into smoke in your hand. Holy shit! <laughs> <laughs> I look back and back. Grog, how did you do that? I don't know. Maybe I'm a magic user now. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not trying to cast reanimate person on the, on the dead thing. Okay. That's nope. not how you do that. No, 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 Hey, Skellen, what are we going to do with this giant bowl? We need someone to bring him down to earth. Keyleth, can you bind him down? Or Gurn, do you have something that can move things? Can I? Oh, go ahead. No, go, no, go, go ahead, Gurn. Does anyone have a large purple hand they could use? I feel like I had a common spell. Oh. Uh, yeah, one spell at a time. I thought I had some sort of a purple spell, I guess I don't. Is it a magic orb? Can you bring it down, Keelan? I try. Um, can I no. do a grasping vine from the bottom underneath the bowl? Oh, no, 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 no
But what are you guys? What, what are you doing? I know what you're doing. What are you doing? I, I, I could either I could either yeah. manipulate his memory, or I do have a flying broom. <laughs> oh, what? Yes. Yes, I have a flying broom. Are you gonna like, like you flatten down like, like you a sweeping sky? I could fly up and then gently oh, glide him yes, down. Yes, yes, oh, let's yeah, do that. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. 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 Places in the air and kind of rests there, slightly shifting in place. You leap up onto it and grab onto the front as you shoot up from the side. <laughs> going up to catch the golden bitch! <laughs> as you as you place yourself on top of the uh, the old Duke's resilient sphere, placing all your weight onto it, it sinks a little bit. Awesome. Then it kind of comes to a halt. About three feet it sinks as you're just standing on top of it. Oh, as far as it goes? <laughs> oh, now, what do you want to do? Can, can I, I, I'd like to try to cast a memory spell on it if possible. Okay. Uh, we've already cast the fifth level spell twice. How many fifth level spells can you cast per day? Two. Yeah, so you might have memory, unfortunately, you're out of fifth slots. Can I cast it on you to forget that I've already cast it? <laughs> <laughs> Scanlan, how much time do we have with this bubble? A minute, but I've got 30 seconds have gone by. Oh, God. Yeah. You can, you can down, down, like, down. Can I push it down? Can I push it down? Yes, you can do that. Can I push down? Can I push down? You, you can jump onto it and get pushed down. I'm going to push down with all my might to try to get him down on the ground. Okay, so you leap in the air and shove on him again as you do the orb. <laughs> <laughs> and just slowly, over the next 15 seconds, oh, oh, okay. shove it down to the point where you're over the orb right now on the very top, as you can feel the spell about to dissipate. Bro, oh, bro, stop trying to reanimate that thing and hit the freaking red guy into the pole! Right. Go ahead and roll an arcana check. Oh, oh. oh he's the best oh, no. in arcana. 20. Get it. Six. Reanimate that fucking Six. Uh, <laughs> This isn't working. <laughs> <laughs> Must be a rookie mistake. Uh, what are we trying to do? Shove him back into the hole? Shove him in. Grog, shove that fucking thing in there! He's standing over, he's over lava. Yeah, but you are made of hit points! Alright, okay, I'll just... This is your thing. Can I do the vine from out of the portal? Can I do the vine from out of the portal? Uh, no, it has to have an anchor point somewhere. Alright, fuck it, no, oh, I just run in a rage and I run into the lava and I start shoving him as in, in the lava, yeah, straight towards the flaming vagina hole. Okay, I want you to go ahead and make an athletics check. Right. No, I mean, this would be a full strength check on this. Just roll strength. Advantage on those. Advantage because you're still raging. Uh, although you won't, be raging, you won't be raging anymore because you spent time concentrating on the spell. You can go into a rage for this if you'd like to. Uh, spend another use of your rage. Yeah, I'll use another one. Okay, so you go into a rage. Uh, Alright, as you step into the actual uh, lava, uh, you suffer uh, 26 points of fire damage oh, from wading up to your knees in molten oh. rock. Yeah, uh, half oh, yeah. resistance. Oh, yeah. Alright, so 12. I've got 22. 22. With that, you poof, you shove the sphere, which shifts back about halfway to there. You kind of have like, whoa, catch yourself on the side, grabbing, grabbing the uh, the broom and kind of holding it out here as you're kind of stepping the other direction. I want you to go ahead and make an acrobatic check. Uh, all right. right. Seven. It's a seven. <laughs> you, uh... No, have inspiration. <laughs> nope, he used, nope, it. used it. Oh. As you shoo, slip off the top of the sphere, begin to fall back, moving <gasps> towards the lava behind you, um, in a very Lord of the Rings golem, tumbling into <laughs> Mountain Doom type of view. <laughs> back first into the lava. Oh, I feel fine. <laughs> Actually, it's pretty... You take six points of fire damage, oh, oh. impacting mm. really low on that. I meant to do that. <laughs> you can feel the, the back of your scales and the flesh on your back immediately begin to burn with horrifying pain. Um, you're holding your broom aloft because you don't want that to go in the fire. I ran Keep forward it. to try to help him out. Okay. And steal the broom. And with that, <laughs> I'm going to run forward as well. The sphere breaks. Oh, can... oh, 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 oh crap. Can you it? Run up. Can I, do I have him, oh, an action? Uh, right now we're going back to the initiative order oh, since oh, combat has reinitiated with the sphere open. So that brings us to the top. The Ifrit now freed from his sphere is going to go first. He's mad. He is livid. All right. I just wanted you to know I was trying to free you. <laughs> these people. These assholes. Can you believe how rude these people are? It's going to fly back up. Ah, ah, cool. Away. It's going to. Uh, let's see. It's going to go ahead and cast invisibility on itself, and then it vanishes from view. Great. As it does that, do I recognize the spell? You do. The spell. I. I could guess, Mr. Steak. I don't know the lava damage rules off the top of my head, but that seemed light. I yeah. Can <laughs> I cast counter spell? Yes, you can. Oh. <laughs> Go ahead and roll. Wait, oh, we know it's a second level spell. It auto yeah. <gasps> Yeah, because it is a second level. Hi. Spell. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right. So as it's forming, it's to vanish. Scanlan, what do you do to cover it? Oh, oh, I, I will say that just like if I'm prepping a combat with a bunch of water or on the open ocean, I brush up on the underwater combat rules. If I'm making a combat that is heavily based around lava, I am absolutely pinning the lava damage rules to the back of my GM screen. <laughs> what I remember, uh, lava is 10d10 from being waste and 18d10. Oh my god. <laughs> yeah, those are the sort of things where, like, I think sometimes... I don't know. I think... And I'm guilty of this too. Sometimes I put up an obstacle or a challenging path in my combat and I am like, this is so dangerous. This is so potentially dangerous that they won't go through it. 
even though I'm setting it up as an option for them to go through. Um, and I just like won't think about the consequences of if they do go through it. So I have to imagine that that's what happened here. Um, but yeah, if you're making a combat based around lava, you should probably put the lava damage rules just in the back of the GM screen. I always like to keep an open slot on my GM screen or my virtual GM screen to put uh, session specific notes in. So like all of my generalized notes and whatever, and then session specific in the middle. I'm gonna say, uh, uh, no, I'm gonna distract it with, uh, uh, with, with this. An app. Uh, with an app. <laughs> <laughs> oh wait, that's not what I want. <laughs> Keep going, distract it with your morning radio program. <laughs> and that bit of chaos is just enough. As it begins to, to cast its innate invisibility spell, it looks over. <laughs> Shit! And it loses the spell concentration, the invisibility field vanishes, and it kind of stands there above. <laughs> All right, uh, reach the vax. Oh, shite. Uh, all right, I'm going to leap over the lava pit. Make that crack check. Yeah. Uh, that'll be a 28, so I'm gonna run up behind Grog, and I should be within- around the side, because you are hasty with this, so you can actually just dart around the side. All right, right behind Grog, I should be within 60 feet of the Apriete. Yes. And I'll throw three daggers at it. Go for it. First one is a 34. That hits. Second one is a 27. Third is a 29, so they will hit. Jeez, uh, but there's no sneaky joke on these, so this is a 10. How'd you get 34 in your attack? I don't know anymore. <laughs> I rolled really high, and I rolled my attack bonus, like a 19 plus a, uh, 11, a 30? 30, okay, 30. I, I don't know. That's okay, a 30 works. Okay, math looked right when I did it. Okay, 34, I was like, ah, yeah. uh, <laughs> All right, so, 30, eight. Okay. Look, I have a, I have a terrible memory as well. And I'm not suspicious of Liam in any way, but I'm saying... If he had a worse pattern of behavior, that would be the most suspicious thing I've ever heard. <laughs> if Orion Akaba said that exact string of words, I would be insta, like he cheated. Just straight instant, oh, he's cheating. <laughs> and I don't think that Liam's cheating because he has a good pattern of behavior. But damn, my man, be a little less suspicious. <laughs> it's fine. There's no it might be stupidity. <laughs> the first one was a 10, second one was a, a 10, and the third one is a 7. 7, got it. All right, cool. That ends your turn, Vax. That brings us to Vax. Hunter's Mark. Uh, it, all right. It, is, uh, it wasn't because I used lightning arrow, so it dropped the concentration. That's right. So your Hunter's Mark, once again, put that back on there. Already? Although it doesn't really matter because I'm going to cast lightning arrow on him and I lose my Hunter's Mark. <laughs> 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 the trauma from the earlier episodes. Yeah. Hunter's Mark. Oh. All right, okay. so lightning arrow again, go to the attack. Oh, yay. Uh, oh, that's 31. 79. 30, 30, 31. <laughs> that hits good, Orlando. <laughs> uh, <laughs> 23. 23 points of damage, alright. That's better. Yeah, that's the the lightning slams into his chest, and you can see kind of arc through his scimitar that it's holding up in its hand, and it kind of shakes and almost drops the weapon and catches its arm as the electricity disperses out the edge of the blade and kind of looks back at you. He's now glaring at both you uh, and Scanlan. I'm gonna use my movement to run up around the molten lava and hold my hand out for Gurn so that he can use okay. me to get out of the molten lava. Alright, that's as far as you can get there. Okay. Alright, Gurn, top of your turn. You take 24 points of fire damage from the lava as you're sinking into it. Yeah, me too. So, can I jump up and then cast a spell? Uh, you have, right now you can try and cast in, in this area, but you have uh, a hard time concentrating. I think you have to take concentration check to even get a spell out because you're in so much pain. I'd say you probably want to move out of the lava before you do that. Get out of there, boy. All right, I'll get out of the lava. <laughs> <laughs> so you're kind of like, gonna Take my hand! It's, it's, well, too, sure it's too deep, you're having to basically wade your way through, just burning your hands as you get over there. What about you just, my broom? Uh, you're holding your broom. Right. Uh, so here's what you do. You go ahead and you kind of lift yourself up out of the lava onto the broom and then... <laughs> <laughs> kind of push, and you know, you're not fully on it, and it's hard to kind of engage its mental commands directly with the current amount of chaos around you, but you do manage to skirt yourself just to the very edge of the lava and land on your feet, which are numb after the sheer amount of pain you suffered, and you don't even want to look down at what you look like from the bottom. Do you need me to hold your broom while you cast your spell? <laughs> Please? Thank you. Oh, don't right. do okay. Just take some from your hand. What are you going to cast? Disintegrate. Damn it. Okay. Disintegrate? <laughs> <laughs> That's a spell? That's yes. what that is. Big one, we've seen that happen. Yeah. We have? Yeah. Yes. Who did that? The oh, giants got disintegrated. Oh, I'm fairly pissed at the moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As you should be. All right, so uh, you get to go ahead and roll. Get the fuck out you dirty bastard. Oh I'm get the spell here real fast. All right, disintegrate. You need to go ahead and make... Oh, it just makes a dexterity saving throw. It doesn't even get to... All right, what's your spell DC again? Uh, 16. 16. Roll a two. Yes! Whew, that's going to be bad. All right, roll 10d6 plus 40 damage. Oh. <laughs> Damn. 10d6. Oh, mess around. It was, it was 10, 11, 16, 22. It's all nothing spell. Like, they make a save. 22, 23, 27, 33, 36. Um, so 76. Oh, oh damn, son! A force damage. As you get out, you can see uh, your, your vest itself is, is burned. There's still elements of like uh, embers kind of burning at the edges of the leather and the cloth. Uh, the bottom part of your scales are a combination of blue, black, and little bits of the crack open where you can see red flesh underneath. There's a lot of burned. The zippers energy. are very hot. I might uh, <laughs> add. They're nearly glowing. <laughs> However, as you turn around, and as your, your kind of fin jewelry on the sides of your face jangles with the speed as you spin around and point your finger upward, the arcane energy forming at the end of your finger, this singular beam of dull green arcane energy shrieks forward. 
forward, the Ifrit, who is currently focused on Scanlan and watching uh, Vex run past, looks down just in time to see you release the spell, opens his eyes and attempts to dodge out of the way. Unfortunately, not fast enough. It blasts inside of its shoulder, and you can see as a whole chunk of its back muscle, uh, shoulder, and lower torso are just turned to dust, exposing bone and elements of its musculature and flesh underneath. It goes, and looks down, like it can't even make a loud emitting of pain. It's just kind of guttural whispering its horrible uh, suffering as it looks down and reaches up with its hand and kind of cauterizes the wound on the back of its body, mm-hmm. leading kind of a charred cinder. It glares down at you, yeah. extremely angry. I hate you most of all, Scarecrow. <laughs> yeah. um, Go back to your fire slats. <laughs> fire slats. Percy, you're up. Um, unless, you want, unless you want your dudes to do anything, by the way. They're slowly dancing. I think you should get a little bit closer and dance <laughs> in front of him, just to make sure. They, they get very self-conscious if no one's paying attention. Of course. They're just cheering on. Can I knock him down a notch? Can I, does he have something? Can I, can I try, and, try and shoot him to, to drop him out of the sky a bit, or is that...? You can certainly try. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try. I'm gonna, well, first of all, I'm gonna, I'm gonna hex him. He's hexed. All right, so the hex moves over. Hex moves over. All right. Um, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna take a, a, a shot to try and drop him. I'm gonna take a uh, crit shot to drop him. Go for it. Um, that's uh, 22. 22 hits. And that's what's the saving throw for that? Uh, strength throw. Strength? Uh, oh, 23. Uh, really? Yeah. I'm sorry. Mm, that's fine. You just take his damage. Okay. Little bitch. Plus 26. Don't forget. Um, yes. Thank you. Uh, oh, this is spell. Fuck him up. 11. Uh, 17 points of damage. Nice. Um, I'm going to shoot again. And, well, that's what's, is this for your pistol? Yeah, I'm just with the pistol right now. And what's your first range increment on that? 400. The pistol? Yeah. 1200 for, for bad news. Uh, your first range increment? I, I'm a sharpshooter. I have no range increment. That's right. Good call. <laughs> yeah, so fire again. Range increments are. <laughs> <laughs> we, we don't do that here. Yeah. Right. Um, 20, 20. That's uh, 20, 20, 30, 31 to hit. That hits. Well, I'm just going to up next, by the way. Oh, thank you. And that's uh, 16 points of damage. Alrighty. Two shots. Just as it manages the car, as the movement is in the great spell, both bullets blast into its torso. You can see it's now thinking that the height advantage would be helpful after being locked in a hamster ball and then now being <laughs> repeatedly blasted every which way. It's not enjoying its current experience by any means. <laughs> it's going to get worse. All right, and now I'm doing a sharpshooter shot. Okay. Pew pew. Pew pew. Uh, that's uh, 18. 18 hits. Oh! Ow, ow, ow. And that's. Ooh, that's. 28 points of damage. <laughs> nice. This one psh, actually blasts into the center of its uh, chest, and you can see part of its uh, pectoral muscle just tears open and flame just psh, erupts from the impact. It kind of reaches up. <laughs> Action surge. Oh, this guy. Sorry. Percy. I'm keep pulling it. Uh, same thing. I'm sorry. Same thing. I'm, I'm just. I'm gonna be rolling sharpshooter. Go for it. Okay. Get the other nipple now. Uh, <laughs> the other nipple. Um, 14. 7, 22. 22 hits. Oof. This is gonna be a rough round for us. 27 points of damage. Ooh. All right. Reload and one more shot. Jesus you, Christ! Yeah, I mean, shot, reload, yeah. reload, one more shot. You got it. Uh, that's uh, 17. Oh, that's, 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 uh, that's a hit. Yeah, go for it. Roll damage. Yeah, that hits. Damn, man. 16 plus 21. Okay, I will also say, I so I, I, you know, I've, I've talked about the, uh, the amount of combatants, all of that previously. I will say, I know firsthand from both sides of the table what this combat feels like. Right now, where they've locked down the most powerful enemy, killed all of the Griblies, even maybe the more powerful lieutenants, and now they are just wailing away on this. If you are a DM, in my experience, and from experience that I've talked to other DMs about, they feel like, and I felt like, this is bad. Like, (laughs) they feel like, oh no, this isn't fun, this isn't whatever. Being on the player side and talking to players, players love this shit. <laughs> if this isn't the entire combat, if this is the if this situation is the result of their actions, of them isolating the powerful enemy and then just wailing on it while they have an advantage, not all players, but a lot of players like that. If they are just wailing on it for no reason, that's just how the combat is set up, that can get boring. If they're allowed to wail on it because of smart decisions that they made and because of resources that they used, go swimmingly. Because the combat feels simple, it feels easy. And if your DM just presents you with a simple and easy combat, that sucks. But if you through your own work, make the combat simple and easy. That's a reward. That feels great. Um, but I know having run these and having talked to GMs who have who have run this sort of thing where, yeah, the powerful enemy gets locked down, you have this feeling that you somehow failed because the end of the combat was so, like, simple and easy. Um, but... Talking and being a player that goes through this, uh, I it 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 feels great from the uh, from the player side. Points of damage. All right. <laughs> These like holes are beginning to appear in its body, where there's the bits of fiery flesh being blasted away from the impacts of your your weapon. Um, all right, that brings us to Scamble. Oh, I didn't kill her. Nope. Wow. No, but I'm, he's, he's a he's a sieve now, but he's yeah. You guys you guys held him. 
Hey, that ion, ion stone that I have, yeah. does that allow me to cast a fourth level three? Yeah, anticlimactic. Yeah, anticlimactic deadly. Yeah, it, and it's, it's, it is really dependent on if the combat was always going to be anticlimactic or if it is only that way because of player actions and very specific player actions. Like this result is what Scanlan intended. Like, let's, let's, let, you know, let's be honest. This is exactly what Scanlan wanted to happen. And so I think it's going to feel great for them. Um, if it was, if they hadn't done anything to make the combat ro roll this way, and this is just like how it ended up, that I think is very anticlimactic. But essentially for this one, the combat's already ended. Like they already beat the combat and that was hard. And now... This is just a victory lap. And maybe that's the better way to put it is if it's anticlimactic because it's a victory lap versus if it's anticlimactic because the entire thing was too easy. Very different from player perspective, even though they feel similar on the DM end, you know? When a combat ends with some stragglers or veers into anticlimactic territory, I sometimes try to ask my players if they want to keep playing it out because I know sometimes they just enjoy that, but I feel like it's hard to do uh, that check uh, in without potentially making the moment fizzle further. I agree, Ink Charm. It's very difficult. It is why, especially uh, as players get higher and higher level, I, and you know, I can't always do this, but I try to work in um, reasons for, like, like points at which the combat will end without them necessarily killing everyone. Because oftentimes killing everyone does lead to stragglers. And, you know, if the stragglers are there, again, because, you know, uh, it's like a victory lap, that can feel good. Um, but sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it just feels boring and anticlimactic. And so a lot of times I do try to work in. And I think that's what people are going after when they introduce, like, morale checks or something like that, is it's like, okay, at this point, the, if 3D's pretty fucked, should probably try to bounce, which I think is what Matt was trying to do when he cast Invis. Maybe not, maybe he was just trying to reposition. Um, but I think that the Ifriti just bouncing at this point, going into the plane of fire or something, um, is a totally fair move that would essentially end the combat. Um, and it would end it earlier where they still get their victory lap. They still like get all of these rewards. They still feel great, but we don't have to drag it out. And that's like an in the moment call that you have to like be like really like honest with yourself as a DM of like, am I just getting impatient and are they still having fun? Or has this edged into boring territory where wailing on this guy is not fun anymore and I just need to cut the combat it's something that requires a lot of feeling out your players like feeling out the like the tone in the room it's very hard um but it's it, it's sometimes the players do like this sort of thing uh and one of my bbgs get absolutely destroyed due to great planning was lucky it had a second phase but even then the second phase was dealt with relatively quickly normally my group isn't that effective <laughs> I feel that. Sometimes they just fucking surprise you out of nowhere. And you're like, where has this been the entire campaign? What are you doing? <laughs> Free spell? If, uh, if, you, if the spell you put into it was a fourth, third level spell, yeah. It was a third level spell, so it's like an extra third level spell. Right, then you... Then I you, maxed out on third level spells, but I have, still have that thing. So yeah, so it wouldn't be a fourth level spell because you didn't cast any of No, I mean, I mean uh, the fourth time I've cast a third level spell. Oh, gotcha. It wouldn't count against your daily... Oh, okay. it's, it's in addition to that. So I will, for the first time, ever use that stupid ion, ion spell. <laughs> uh, and cast Lightning Bolt again. I'm just stick, sticking with my method here. All right, all right. Uh, with a five, it does not make it saving throw. Go ahead and roll damage. 8d6. Six. Oh, do it. Thank you. Okay. Well, here comes the cube. Uh, Thank you. Uh, uh, did you do this one too? Yeah, 2028. 20, 20, 20. How do you want to do this? Oh! 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 O
Uh, I'd like to have, uh, angle it somehow so that he will drop right on top of Grog. <laughs> I feel like Grog can do something uh, to a falling behemoth. Uh, it's hard pressed from this angle, unfortunately. Grog's at an angle. We wouldn't really do that. Uh, uh, when, you, when you blast him, he'll plummet to his close to his feet if you wanted to. Uh, all right, yes, let's let's do that. So Grog can feel like he gets part of this too. Okay. So. Um, and uh, if I can, uh, I'd like to burn a big S in his chest. <laughs> <laughs> so as you charge up and blast the lightning bolt from your crotch region, you then do like a little dance maneuver with your waist, causing it to <laughs> carve a Scamlet S into the torso <laughs> of the uh, afraid as it plummets to the ground, slamming into where the lava would be. While the fire doesn't hurt its form, you can see Grog. As it stands in the ground, uh, its form's turning to ash around you. Like it's actually just dissipating and turning to ash as its eyes kind of roll up and meet with yours. Uh, I'll run over in the lava and I go, I'd like to cast Beheading! <laughs> <laughs> All right. Dude, I. Oh, my brain, my thoughts. Ah. Uh... It's, it's an S for Scanlan Short Hall. That's, that's, that's why it's an S. That's why it's an S. I did a little bit of an eye roll, um, because when I heard that, my mind immediately went to S for semen. Uh, <laughs> oh, man, because that is just, that is, that is the impression and it came out of his crotch, and it's an impression that scant he's wormed his way into my brain, dude. I, I, I'm, uh, d d yeah, Mega Sam. Moving on. Hey, you suffer, uh, oh, Jesus. uh, 26 points of fire damage, reduced to 13. Oh, no, so take another round in there. Totally worth it for the spell. <laughs> as you take it, just take the head off as the head rolls away. Oh, grab it. You grab it. Turns to ash. <laughs> right you get out of the lava, stand on the side, ah, 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 and look over, and just as the rest of the head just kind of turns to ashes. Oh, shit. I walk up to Grog. You did it again. And I pat him on the shoulder and say, that was so impressive. Oh, focus, focus, focus. A genuine <laughs> And I use, um, sleight of hand okay. to shove the, um, flying broom into the bag of holding. Okay, roll sleight of hand. Whoa. Yeah, girl. Mm. Can I, am I allowed to roll a perception? Yes, you can. Come on, Dex. Come on, sister. Come on. 18? Get it. 16 plus no no total 16 18 plus one yeah yeah uh as you're kind of dealing with this you have no notice of this i mean you may question it later if you like but you have no idea where it went and didn't see any of this transaction happen mm. oh no oh no what what is it your broom fell in the lava what i saw it i, I just turned it. around for I a moment i back to you and it fell in the lava you yeah, sure yeah. you shouldn't have looked at me when i cast my spell this is why i never looked at you ah, i was wrong to doubt you <laughs> no no you're, you're a constant source of disappointment 18. where's okay. my fucking broom make an insight check now <laughs> Insights. Uh, 13. 13. She's telling the truth, man. That broom, <laughs> that broom just went oh straight God, You're a horrible person. <laughs> you know, I'm really good at reading people, and I know that you're telling me the truth right now. <laughs> I'm so sorry. No, I feel your sorrow. I feel it. Deception, lies, deceit. <laughs> That's hilarious. Uh, <laughs> that is hilarious. The GM has to be careful about the magic items that he gives to guest players because the party will rob the guest players. <laughs> I just have to respect it. I got. I, <laughs> I have nothing else I can say. I just have to give them full respect on that. <laughs> also, Theshel, I think it's not exactly the same, but I actually think we have a decent idea of how that would go, uh, because that would be very similar to Witch Bolt. <laughs> I think uh, even you know, like, th and. and which bolt is not well loved. <laughs> I think that's partially because it's other damage, you know, doesn't doesn't scale. Um but even then, I think you would have to make constant a lot you would have to rebalance a lot of things and I don't know that it would um I don't know that it would it would uh super um what what do you call it? I don't know that it would have too many upsides. Like I can think of a couple that like you know that that are that are that would be decent, um, but I I think that concentration in general is a mechanic that I don't love. <laughs> I don't love I don't love uh, concentration. I have a few other ideas of things that I would prefer instead, um, but yeah, I, I don't know that that would that that would. I don't know. I don't know that we would see too much benefit from that. Um, uh, I only started watching you recently. How do you feel about Matt taking a lot of liberties with narrating how his players act in combat? I think that it spices up the combat a lot for them. I think that they like that very... Um, that very free-flowing combat style. I think Matt's entire style in general 
is very fluid, very free Warning. flowy. Uh, Add incoming. Oh. Take cover. Add incoming. Take shelter now. Okay, I'll go faster. Uh, I think that Matt's entire style is 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 pretty free flowy, um, and I think that gives him a lot of opportunities to make his players feel very cool. I think that how do you want to do this is pretty a pretty definitional example of like it's it it, it kind of removes all of the rails you know, from how you need to describe magic or, or whatever um, and allows them to just feel very fun and cool and, and what have you. Um, and I think he does it in generally a way uh, that is not detrimental. Uh, I think that his removal of the rails is very targeted. Like, I, I think he, he doesn't do it willy-nilly. He doesn't do it without thought. I think he thinks about it pretty well. Um, but I do think it's hard. I think if you're a DM at home trying to emulate that style, I think he makes it look easier than it is. I think it's a very hard style to get right um, and could lead to unexpected consequences or people attempting things um, that don't work always like a lot of Matt's like rulings that he made really only or has made really only work in the moment they're not things that are repeatable he has sometimes not allowed them to repeat um so I think in general he has a really good sense of timing on when it's okay and when it's not to take those liberties uh but I don't I think it's a tough style to emulate um because it's you can get into some bad situations with it. Um, so, uh, the ad's incoming. We gotta take shelter. We gotta go. <laughs> I will be back in three minutes, and we can talk more. Uh, I don't even have the ad pulled up. No. All right, goodbye. Thirty seconds. All right, man. It is. It is maybe one of the harder things for me. I have to hold myself back from talking while folks aren't here. At least about interesting stuff, you know. Um. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. 
Uh, how much we got? We got ten more seconds. I did think of some other things though, Lockfin, that I that I wanted to say. Um, because I was thinking more about it. And we are back. We're back. Um, so the other thing that I thought about while I was in the bathroom, Lockfin, is I do think that that not just uh, you know. I think that it is a challenging DMing style um, and that, you know, that is that is one reason to be critical about it and think about it um, a lot before you do it. But in terms of the benefits and negatives, I think that he has a... I think that the effect of the, you know, taking liberties um, really solidifies a more... Um, narrative tone and i'll explain what i mean uh by by that i think that a lot of like like there is a when you play a ttrpg right there's the kind of game aspect and there's the storytelling aspect i think that the liberties pretty clearly are geared towards that storytelling aspect right they're they're much more directed towards there and they're less about the game uh, and that has a lot of positives and negatives. I think you can tell uh, stories that your players might be more invested in because they feel like they have more freedom with how they affect the story. On the other hand, it does restrict some of the stories you can tell and how you tell them as a DM. Because, I mean, I'll say it, I, I haven't... Uh, really seen many combats at least where I am like, oh, Vox Machina did everything right. <laughs> and this is gonna be really, really, really close. They like they are this is really risky. Uh the most, you know, risk that anyone has been under was the Deathwalker's uh ward trap in the Sunken Temple. Um or the Briarwood fight uh when Vex died. Or when, sorry, when, when, not when Vex died, when uh, I think Keyleth went down. And I think that the players played that really well. But, and I could be wrong about this. I didn't feel as though Keyleth was that in danger of dying. Um, I could be wrong about that, though. Um, so the reason I bring this up, this, uh, how, how I haven't really had a sense of Vox Machina being in huge amounts of, or, I, sorry. I feel like they've either been in massive amounts of peril where there is no way they will ever even come close to scratching the surface of this combat, uh, like with the Chroma Conclave in Iman, uh, or just Vorugal individually, right? It's either been that sort of combat where, it, where it's just how do we survive? Um, and it didn't really feel like, you know, they had they had any sort of chance of winning or it has been combats where I feel like they were solidly going to win as long as they didn't actively fuck things up, i.e. the Windwalk incident during uh, the um, uh, worm fight. Um, so I do think that that is... And that's not just because of the liberties that he takes within combat, right? That, that's not the only reason um, that I think that. But I do think that if you aim a lot of your tone towards the story um, rather than the game, right? If you, if you aim more of your stuff and your styles towards the story, you have to make sure that the combats are impactful for other reasons. Like the Briarwood combat was impactful not because it really felt like they were going to lose or that there was a chance they were going to lose, um, but because of what it represented within Percy's story. Um, same thing, even you could argue with the Beholder fight in the Sunken Temple. There's sort of a meta story there of it being the anniversary monster. Um, so I think that that is more of Matt's priority on how he designs things, as opposed to maybe more pitched, contentious uh, combats where it feels like you know, they might legitimately lose. Uh, I think that it is harder to attain that sort of feel within Matt's style. 
within the taking a ton of liberties, uh, within focusing a lot of your stuff on the story, I think it's harder to attain those really, really challenging but doable uh, combats. So I think that is maybe a downside, depending on your priorities, though. Depending on if you have a different set of priorities, that could be an absolute win. Uh, <laughs> if you don't want to spend a ton of time, you know, constructing a, a, a combat like it's a puzzle, then I would go after Matt's style there. Um, I personally think that I like, and I think that D&D is good for constructing um, combat puzzles, like combats as if they were a puzzle. Uh, and making them very difficult and challenging. Um, so I don't think that Matt's style is great for that, but it's great at a lot of other things. So, yeah. <laughs> um, or pre-stream when Pike died. We don't, uh, yeah, it's hard to say for that one because we don't really know the a huge amount of details around that. There could have been a Windwalk incident involved <laughs> that maybe they don't talk about. Um but it, it does seem like that maybe was the most risky combat that they've engaged in yet. Um, and that was in Pathfinder, which is a slightly crunchier, more gamey type system. Um, so I think it's very reasonable that even with Matt's style, he would have had a bit more game, a bit more of that sort of thing in Pathfinder. And when he transitioned over to D and D, he felt like he maybe had a little bit more freedom or a little bit more potential uh, to go for a more story focused style. Do 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 do. Yeah. I feel bad for you that I you have to experience that. To... It's just a broom, right? It's just a flying broom. It's very difficult to find. No big deal. I don't know. I don't know. That's all right. You know, serious. It actually it sterilized me. Actually, I'm quite glad it has very dirty properties. Oh. Anyone that would put it between their legs to fly around and be in horrible danger, <laughs> horrible danger. So it's actually probably for the better. Diseases? Yeah, so many STDs, it's uh, really just like a, well, it's, it's a really just like a disease tampon. <laughs> That's really what it is. A what? A what? Is that like a magic candle? <laughs> it's sort of like a magic candle. Yeah, a tragedy candle. Right, it's a tragedy candle. Yeah. A Blanston candle. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I don't understand sorcery at all. At this point, you hear the flickering of flame and the portal itself has begun to expand even further. Kayla <laughs> <laughs> throws up a skyrite spell and then says, you know, we're taking the portal. Okay, as, um, as, as this is happening, uh, the flames themselves grow higher and higher. Um, the lava begins to boil and roil. As, as you guys move, all move up to kind of the side, you see the lava begin to kind of like whoosh, splash out and spray bits are starting to scatter. As some of the nearby trees tumble over, and you can see uh, the four fire Shari as well as Corrin come across one of the clearings. Uh, the other way, you see what looks to be another salamander gets thrown about 15 feet from the trees, hits the ground, skids, and is motionless. As you see uh, Sarkonos with the rest of the Pyra, uh, the uh, fire Shari stepping through. Keyleth, we saw your symbol. Is it time? Yes. All right. Just try to close this rift. And the rest of the druids all begin to gather around the outside of this portal. As it's flickering, you can see, piercing into the extremely blinding light, Keyleth, you take a moment and using your, your attachment to the, the fire shari and the fire elemental plane from your last passage through it, uh, you can see past the brightness and see beyond the doorway. And you can see on the other side, there appears to be uh, probably another half dozen or a dozen or so of another of a few other elemental salamanders that are now making their way towards the portal. So. I uh, stand next to my father and join the rest of the druids. Grog, well, you should probably help them with all of your magic powers. Do you think so? It feels like it's a Just hold your hands up, hold your hands up. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, as, as the rest of the Ashari begin to gather around the portal and concentrate, they're managing to hold the rift in its current size. Uh, you see as Kor is beats the sweat begin to pour down Korn's face, not used to this type of terrain, goes, ah, We need more power! Okay. <laughs> if you can aid, whatever you have to bring to this, please! Now's the time! Uh, so no much to help the ritual. Uh, oh, yeah. I'll help. Alright, how would you wish to help? What a nice guy he is. Certainly not someone we should swindle. <laughs> Well, so, I'm strange that you would I would that. know I if know. someone were trying to swindle me, That's believe true. me. That is true. You all have honest faces, particularly her over there. Very honest face. <laughs> what, what, what can I do to help? What, what do you think would lend itself to a fire a, a fire gate sealing ritual? It could be a spell, it could be a use of a skill. How would you like to? Candle? Do you have any candles they can aid? Like fiery candles, maybe? I have a... No, this one casts... A, this is bright light. There's a thunder candle. A blink candle. Destroying... No, that destroys dexterity. I have a thunder candle. I don't know if that would work. Um, 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 um. Make an arcana check. 19. 19. Uh, the Blink uh, candle, which you crafted from uh, various parts from Blink dogs and other creatures that have natural translocation capabilities, uh, might have the capability, as this is a doorway between planes, and teleportation magic is based on creating short form doorways between similar spaces, Whoa. might have some impact on the ritual if used properly. I have this Blink candle. It's formed from various animals at Blink. <laughs> and if I. That has trans. D dimensional properties, very good properties, <laughs> the best kind of robust properties that I can throw it in, and it might help. Stop the from that all of that. Yeah, yes. Yes. Right. <laughs> like, right, so we're all in agreement. Yes, yes. Yep. Well yes, explained. All right, so I, I'm going to hand I'm going to hand blink candle to Coral, and I'm gonna have Coral walk into the portal. Brave Coral. Brave Coral. <laughs> Fuck! I've lost two in my broom. What a fucking terrible day. <laughs> <laughs> as, 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 as Coral takes the candle, it kind of <sighs> turns around and then begins to just slowly melt. Oh steps into the lava. Come on, Coral, run. One, seven. Come on, Coral. 
Uh, nine points of fire damage to Coral, who is already sitting at. Uh, Coral was at six. Uh, I've taken six damage, right? Oh. Yes. Yeah, so that brings to 15 from 33. Coral's at half health. Oh. Coral, at, as this is rough terrain, gets most of gets half, part of the way there, then continues walking forward. The rest of the way takes an additional. Eight, ten. It's going to be 17 points of damage. Oh no. Uh, that's one point left. Uh, that's 30. Uh, that's 20, 32. 32 points of damage. What's, what's close to points? 33 to max. What didn't you just say that? That's what you said. Yep, on the sheet right there. <laughs> Every mound text. Right. Three hit points. Coral at one hit point, gets up to the lava, takes the coral, and <laughs> as the energy expands from it, you can see like a, like a ripple, like a, like a heat wave ripple that just boom, billows outward. Coral vanishes entirely, and the portal sh- shrinks down by about five to six feet, <laughs> actually closing its space. Over Coral, I forgot to taste it! Fuck! <laughs> <laughs> Suddenly you're, you're a <laughs> and Coral appears about 10, 15 feet in the air. Oh good, there you are, listen! Have you seen my broom? <laughs> Smack! Coral falls those 15 feet. Taking six points of bludgeoning damage. Oh, Coral. Away from Schmack. Um, let's see if uh, Coral survives this with undead fortitude. That is. Nope. Uh, <laughs> that, that is a roll of eight versus a total of a uh, DC of 11 with the damage taken. And Coral just splat. Like a, like, a, like a really, really old orange just slammed into the concrete. Just <laughs> shoot. One, one, really one, one, one of the fire shards goes. <laughs> uh, concentrating on holding the gate. I'm sorry to think you're all very bad luck. <laughs> oh, I did aid the ritual. All right, we have two more folks who can aid in this ritual. Um, I can use. I don't know if it'll help, but I have um, a really great diamond of awesomeness. That's precious. How would that help? I don't know. Am I part of the people who can be included yeah. as the two? Okay. 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 okay, I'm going to cast a 7th level, level plane shift to help smush it through this. All right, go ahead and make a nature roll with advantage. Nature roll. That's is your understanding of the natural elements of the world around you and the connection you have with the promised plane. Please, magic stuff. Whoops. Please, magic stuff. Oh, I'll count six times. Oh, with advantage. Yeah, okay. Um, uh, uh, 23. 23. As you begin to uh, concentrate your hands, it simply bursts into flames to uh, coalesce your connection to the fire element plane. As you complete this, the plane shift spell, your form shimmers for a second, and for a moment it looks like she's only partially there. She's actually translucent as flames begin to lick up the sides of her body. At this point, you can see the lava flow in the mountain begins to slow and the bubbling begins to come to a stillness. Uh, the portal itself shivers again and then sh- shrinks down to the size of a normal doorway, about five foot by ten foot tall, and it's just barely holding on. As you're concentrating and holding it in its place now, you can see now the rest of the druids around are sweating profusely. Who wishes to take on the last part of this ritual? I have a firebrand war hammer. I can hit it. Anybody else got anything better? Do you have any magic stuff, Scanlan? I, I can inspire them. I mean... You have dimension door? Yeah, dimension door. A dimension door what? A door. I, I did planar binding, which technically wasn't really supposed to be what I just did. But planar shift, you said, right? Planar shift, I mean, yes. Seven level planar shift. Funny ways to tailor magic essences into this type of a uh, ritual. I can, uh, I can, I will that, will my, will, do I know that that will work or help? You don't know, you'll, you'll find out. However you wish to aid this ritual and, and justify how it would be helpful in this instance. Uh, I, uh... That's something I could do. Oh! Yeah, I whip the cape of the mountebank out of my pocket and run at that door and jump off the edge and just try to balloon umbrella it down over with that red cape. Hmm. Okay. Matador it. I'm doing it. I'm matadoring it. <laughs> okay. I will say. Hmm. How do I make this work? I want you to go ahead and make a an acrobatics check. Okay. That is a twenty-five. All right. You rush up, leaping off the side, spinning in the air. As you do, you unfurl the cape and turn it into a limited parachute type, uh, projection. And as you slam it down towards, I need you to go ahead and make a wisdom check Uh-oh. <laughs> to see if you have the capability of uh, triggering this, the magic of the item at the right time yeah. to be impacted. Cross your fingers, everybody. Come on, Vexy. Oh, come on, no actual bonuses here. No whammies. We don't still have our mm-hmm. fancy feet. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, are we yeah, still we feasting? Do we still have our fancy feet? Oh. Yeah. <gasps> so what does that mean? Advantage. Advantage on oh. oh my god. That's better. Uh, that is 13. 13? Uh, yeah, I, that's uh, better. As you come down, you know take the cape and encase it and trigger the magic. At which point, the remainder of this doorway just sh- <laughs> blinks out entirely. The cape gone. The doorway gone. Hot, 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 so you sh- <laughs> sh- in the lava. All of a sudden, images flash in your head at the time that you lost most of your foot in the Underdark. And you go, no, 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 no. Before you can even react, all of a sudden, something wraps around your waist and yanks you <laughs> out as a, a vine pulls you in an arc and slams you into the heart of Obsidian Floor on the outside of the lava flow. The rest of you gather there as the rest of the druids finish their concentration. The uh, the lava pools themselves have gone still, and you can see part elements beginning to cool, and there's currently no sign of a tear between the elemental planes that is currently nice bursting through. Nice job, Vex. Where am I? Am I near her? On the ground? Uh, you're, you're currently, she was. She would be back here. You're on the ground right next to a dancing skeleton. Well, I moved oh. up. I moved up. Okay. I'm, I would be yeah, you would be part of the ritual, but you, are, you fell next to the dancing skeleton. Okay, I look at the skeleton. I look at her. I look at the skeleton. <laughs> I look at her. I'm an, I'm, an, I'm an idiot. I'm an idiot. Yeah, no, we are, I, I already knew that. Yeah. That's fine. You did good. You good. I, I reach down and I, I help him up. Okay. How how bad are you? <laughs> I'm pretty bad. I I cure wounds level four. Okay, yeah, cool. Do that. I'm gonna walk out of the lava now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, taking another uh, 21 points of fire damage. Reduced to 10. <laughs> <laughs> 
the druids all kind of look around and get, give a nod of acceptance. All of them acknowledge you, who they have not met and don't understand quite where you came from or why you're here, but uh, one of them, who is currently missing an arm on one hand, uh, dark, uh, weathered skin, long, jet-black hair cruising down to the middle of his back, um, approaches you and his one right arm he puts on the shoulder and says into your eyes, I do not know you, friend, but you have come to our aid at an hour we've ne- really required it. Great, sure. I just thought I'd come and lose a couple of thralls in my fucking broom, but uh, great to be here. Everyone seems nice, especially uh, her. She's great. He removes his hand very well. Let me know if I can do anything else. Do you want a candle? Candle? Oh, I, yeah, I make candles, just various candles. He does this and his finger bursts into flame and you can see a flame flickering. We do not need candles here in Pyra, but thank you. Is that the finger? Or is that the finger? <laughs> Insinuating. Actual finger. Um, at this point, uh, Corin, your father, approaches you and places his hand on your shoulder and turns you around to look you in the face. Okay, it's 3.10. What's the next time code? Oh, new time code is 3.21. Okay, I have so much to say about the combat, obviously. I've been taking notes the whole time as things have evolved. Uh, not to alarm anyone, was that buffering? Okay. Oh, good. Okay, I don't have any drop friends, frames on my end either. All right, thank God. Um, <laughs> scaring me, Ink Charm. Uh, <laughs> but, okay, cool. Just you. Um, but I'm gonna, I'll let the, I'll let the entire session play out because we're, we're so close to the end, uh, that yeah, we'll, we'll let the session play out and then we'll, uh, we'll talk about the combat. And you can see there's, there's smears of dirt and he's still glistening from sweat from the whole ritual and he kind of looks a bit weathered and, and winded from the experience and Keyleth, I'm proud of you. Thank you, brother. I think we will stay here and help the Pyra try to rebuild. Mm. Oh, okay. He kind of takes your chin and pulls it up and looks you in the face with a a broad smile on his face. He says, the road before you, Keyleth, is hard and fraught with loss and sadness. To live is to struggle against the void, but it's those moments of darkness that define the joy of the world around them. Learn from the loss, and push forward as a beacon of perseverance, of hope for life after pain. This is one of the pillars of strength of a leader, one that I've learned with the loss of your mother. But you are my beacon of hope, and to many more than you even expect, and he looks back towards the four other members of the Zephyr tribe that are all just looking at you, and they nod. I do not fail you, Father. I trust you will not. Now go forth. While we stay here, I want you to grasp your destiny. Vanquish this terrible beast that lies on the shores of Taldore. Complete your armamente. How do you know that this is my destiny? Whatever your destiny is, grasp it. But you've chosen this path. And all destiny really is is the choices you make leading towards a goal that perhaps you do not yet understand. When you've returned, I wish for you to teach us the wisdom you've gained on this journey. Katiake, Father. Katiake, Gilith. Did you see a broom lying around anywhere? (laughs) No. Sorry. That's all right. We will keep an eye out for it, though. Please. And tell everyone, hashtag feel the gurn. <laughs> They'll know what it means. What is the hashtag? I'll explain later. <laughs> um, well, unless there's anything else, we have business to attend to and restore. I will say, I think that a lot of people would be pretty harsh on that moment of him kind of breaking that there with you know the 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 comedic moment but i will say grog has done a lot of similar shit and that is also one of the issue or one of the potential risks of having guest players just like flat out they're not living in this campaign. They don't have all of the experiences before, and they won't have all of the experiences after. Uh, so it is 
and they don't have the uh, a- a- any sort of I don't know what you may call it like timing or, or like they haven't like been used to like traveling and interacting with these uh with these other players. Um, Laura got so much flack. We'll have to talk about that afterwards. Why did Laura get flack? I didn't really identify her doing anything crazy. Um, weird. Um, context. Yeah, context. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, but it wasn't Chris. Interesting. Yeah, maybe we'll, if, uh, if that, you know, stuff happened like right after the episode, we're almost there. It's my fault for talking about it right now. I said we were going to finish it. Let's finish it. Um, interesting. Interesting. Storing this area. I wish you all great luck. Corey. Oh, but to wrap up that thought, that it's, I think it's just a risk of having guest players is that they might accidentally ruin moments because naturally they just don't care as much as your other players. And that's not their fault. They just don't have the experiences built up to care. Um, it gets addressed at the beginning of next step. So maybe your call, if you want to know, post this app or wait till Monday, let me know, post this app so that I can form an opinion before I see the addressment. I'd be really, I'd actually be really interested because it sounds like, you know, uh, if I was all active on Twitter, I would have seen whatever was going on. Um, so yeah, we'll talk about it after the app. Yeah. If we should ever need you, I should ever need you, or the assistance of the Ashari. What is the best way to get a hold of you? Call to Zephra. Come home, and we will come with you. As he looks over all of you, kind of giving each a look of nod of respect and appreciation. (laughs) (laughs) Wow. Stop it coming. Glances past to Grog, Vex. Lingers a very long look on Vax. Oh. It just gives you a nod. His diamond earring is listening, listening in the light, yeah. <laughs> Did I stutter? <laughs> Stay safe. For her sake. And Corrin turns around and walks back as the rest of the Zephyr Ashari walk along with him. You, through all this chaos, kind of get a little bored and frustrated with all this weird, nonsensical stuff, look to the ground and realize there's there's a lot of hidden treasures scattered oh, among shit, I didn't even vicinity. think about demonstration. Probably, probably so. You know, I might stay behind a bit and uh, dig around for, for a little while. You know. Might unironically have to mute that part of the stream. Fuck. I didn't even think about that. Candle making's a difficult business. Is it now? Aye. Well, if you ever are looking for more customers, you will always find them in Whitestone. So, if you make your way Step north. Excellent. You're always welcome. Thank you. Uh, could someone heal me a bit before you leave? <laughs> I'm quite singed. Oh my. I'm just going to turn on my own music. It's going to make this very difficult to listen to, but I'll be able to pierce through the noise. If you have issues with a lot of overlapping sounds, maybe mute until we get to the end. Yeah, yeah, I'm and I'm gonna add even more sound to it. Uh, so I will mostly be watching the subtitles because I don't want to get the stream taken down because I just saw a warning. So I'm just gonna turn this up a little bit. Unfortunately, I walk up and I cast cure wounds on him. I've got jack shit. About She's him. so nice. She's great. At a the level nicest. three. At a level three for you. Wow, you, 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 yeah. That's really nice of you. You're a really good person. I am. I am. <laughs> 20 points. Holy shit. Um, Vex. Yes? This ja- Just gotta wait until the song loops. This is great. Gentleman has done nothing but aid us. I know, and it's so he's kind He's suffered of the him. loss of three of and his And look at all of these balls. treasures he's gonna find here for is his Is there candles? anything we can do make to inv- repay you? Make an investigation check. Did that centaur the genie handed that one the number? Yes. Uh, 18. 18. Uh, as you look down and see all these treasures around, you get a better closer look. You know, the ground here is rugged rock and black ash and dust and, and pieces of charred and burnt, petrified wood. And right around the outskirts. 
turned it off yet? I can't tell. Of where the lava pool is, you can see what looked to be broken slivers of soot-covered dragon scale. <gasps> Just kind of peppered throughout the landscape. Okay, I, I think it might still be playing, but I can't really hear it, so we're gonna see. Barely visible until you look real close, thanks to the constant barrage of... Make an investigation check. Nope. Did that centaur the genie hand? Did that fall in the lava? Oh my god, yes. and for some reason my browser rewound. Uh, you know, the ground here is rugged rock and black ash and dust. Where the lava pool is, you can see what looked to be broken slivers of soot-covered dragon scale. <gasps> Just kind of peppered throughout the landscape. Barely visible until you look real close, thanks to the constant barrage of black soot and dust that falls from the nearby area. Do you collect dragon scales for your candles? Oh, I forgot to tell you, I've sold out my own kind because I was enslaved by dragons who had tails who consider themselves royalty and therefore better than me, and I don't have a tail. And so I spent my whole life trying to figure out how to turn scales into weaponized candles. Anyway, gotta go. Everyone have a great time. <laughs> Thank you. You just leave? I leave. <laughs> and, and, and Scoop up some of the few scales right, and piss off. Oh. <laughs> you guys watch as Gurn Manston begins walking around and like like a gutter snipe or one of the people on the beach with a metal detector just starts combing through. You know, Don't Gern, you forget you... about me. Gurn, before you leave. Hi. You know, we're killing a very, very large dragon. Hopefully rather soon. Very interesting. Where would that be? Well, he's in a mon now, but we're gathering our forces in Whitestone. Good to know. I might catch up with you later on. All right. Goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> Which he says with a strange Doppler effect, even though he's but 20 feet away from you and has chosen now to ignore the rest of the party to go about his business. <laughs> no, no, just like an NPC and yeah. <laughs> just Skyrim. Yep. As your skeletons in the background, just kind of dancing dance along. Like, there's only one left. Yeah, only one, one left. Skeletons. He's free. He's free. Uh, it's okay, there's, there's, there's plenty of charred corpses littered all over this mountaintop you could make him dead from. Yeah, see you later, Does Michelle. the skeleton go with him, or does it stay? It follows him. It's two of them. <laughs> I think he might have turned it off. I think I think he might have turned it off just now. <laughs> all right, so the rest of you, what is your next course of action? I sidle up next to my sister and just stand there for a moment and deadpan and say, uh, all right, the more things change, the more they stay the same. And then I walk away. <laughs> <laughs> Caleb, why don't we head home? How? Home. How do we do White, that? Whitestone. Oh, can we get to Whitestone? Can you um, I can. bamf us? Let's, I can. Yeah. Let's, Let's go, go there and rest up. And rest up. Yeah. Hey. Thank, thank you guys. Thanks for coming. Helping. Your dad is very um, noble. Your uh, your nice homeland point. is. Uh, you know, I mean, Charming. the volcano, the magma, the monsters, the fire torn in the sky. I, it's, it's lovely, it's charming, really. Thank you, Scanlan. This isn't my homeland, but oh, I, I oh, appreciate it's not? how well you know me. I'm oh, <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, I thought you lived here. No, this is the fire Ashari's kind of You're camp. not a fire Ashari? I'm an air Ashari. Oh. <laughs> it's all right, it's only it's been so a crazy year. <laughs> Aren't all the Ashari the same? You know what, Scanlan? That might be the most questions you've ever asked me about myself. Uh, I don't even know your last name. <laughs> I don't have one, but thank you. Hey, what's, <laughs> what's a, uh, what's a hashtag? Hey, good. Good, good, oh, we do, good. Actually. Hello? <laughs> is it just dragon scales or is it any dragon parts you, you use? You know, mainly dragon scales, but I do like to see. Oh no, I'm. I'm with you, Ink Charm. Look. I'm, I'm, I'm a patient guy. I try to give as much grace as I can. I'm a content creator, or at least I want to be one, so I can't get on someone too much for attention hogging. But that doesn't mean it doesn't bug me. <laughs> See them blown apart, so that part's merely for pleasure. Got it. Bye bye. Let's go home. <laughs> All right, I pick a tree that's big enough to fit all of our. I'll make your tree. You've already cast transport via plants to the stands. How you got here? <laughs> we need a. We need. Maybe we should rest. Wait, wait. Do you, do you need me to help you with the tree spell? Uh... Maybe we should just sleep here and rest up and we'll spend the night. Out. Wake up in the morning. Head back to Whitestone. She's gonna still, gonna still be there next week, by the way. <laughs> Look, honestly, until about the last ten minutes, I was like, ah, like Chris Hardwick was like a a pretty fine guest player. Like maybe maybe like last 20, 30 minutes. Like he ended the combat 
with like a lot of levity, but also again, I think that that's not necessarily his fault. Could just be a misreading of the room, which is a risk with guest players. Um, but uh, yeah, man, I don't know this this last little bit. Um, uh, my opinion is steadily dropping. <laughs> And with that, Vox Machina leaves Gurn to his business as they go and camp out at the base of the mountain, knowing that. Did someone lose an orb! <laughs> and with that, we're going to finish tonight's game. <laughs> can, I just, can I say something from this this realm? Yeah. I'm delighted we showed a thing and I'm in. You know, uh, you know during the uh, Vasselheim Tavern sequence when I was like, man, it's like, whose line is it, anyways? <laughs> I did not know what I was in for. <laughs> I did not know what I was saying. Night tonight of someone lounge singing "Stand by Me" to Donald Trump and putting the name Donald in there. All right, we got we we have one post session time code. Just goes until like forty two, so pretty short. Um, but we'll we'll do, watch that now, and then we will talk about everything. So I told everyone, please tweet that to at Will W, and people are fucking doing it. Wait, I need to, I need to go back one one skosh. Delighted, we showed a thing on at midnight tonight of someone lounge singing "Stand by Me" to Donald Trump and putting the name Donald in there. So I told everyone, please tweet that to at Will W, and people are fucking doing it. Yeah, it's amazing. So if you find the guy singing a very poor rendition of "Stand by Me" to Donald Trump, please send it to Will Wheaton. He'll love it. It's his favorite thing in the world. Beautiful. It's his favorite thing in the world. You heard it, guys. Critters called action. Oh, Make no. it happen. Oh, no. Hashtag feel the gurn. Critters strong. Feel the gurn. Put strong. Mm. All right, well, guys, uh, Chris, oh, thank wait, you. it's until 22.42. We got more. Thank so much for coming thank in. Thank you, this was so much fun. Oh, yes, 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 yes. 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 Hey. Hey. Feel the gurn. Feel the best damn in the world. This is a wonderful party, and you're all fantastic. Thank you so much. Aww, I'm not beautiful. even upset that you stole my broom. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> everyone can uh, pick apart there. I, I think I got mine. <laughs> and don't judge me, Scanlon. You didn't see me do it. I didn't. I didn't. He just Sam's assumed. just judging. Laura. I'm judging you, Laura <laughs> Bailey. <laughs> <laughs> there, is, there is a definite Wait, everyone distinction. Everyone will judge you when you take it out and use it. Oh, Vex is fine. Vex is fine. Laura Bailey got it. That's amazing. She's why the fly is so much. Oh, man. Eat him by one. I'll tell you why. Yeah, they're kind of congealed. Well, guys, thank you all so very much for watching tonight. Hope you enjoyed tonight's episode. We return next Thursday, 7 p.m. Pacific Time, Wednesday. All right. Okay. I'm trying to think of what order to talk about things in. Kind of already pinned the button up. The ending was annoying. Uh, I'm sure we will talk more about Chris in a second when I look up whatever there is to look up. Before that, though, uh, in case people don't, especially in case people don't want to stick around for the Hardwick discussion, totally get it. Um, so I want to talk about the combat first. Um, so a lot of things going on here. A lot of things going on here. This is, oh, <laughs> that's wrong. There we go. Here we are. Okay. So, I had kind of forgotten at the beginning what the actual, also maybe post-up drama before uh, CH talk. Oh, yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah, that's a good. So, we'll do combat, post-up drama, then CH. I think that's a good ordering charm. Um, oh, I need to... I need to move this. Actually, I might. Uh, well, hmm. wait one second. Let me let me rearrange some stuff. Uh, just because I need to be able to see the combined chat. There we go. Um, yeah, there we go. Uh, that way people can tune out for the non CR. Yeah, I absolutely agree. I absolutely agree. Um, okay. So I'd kind of forgotten, and I wasn't totally sure if there was an objective besides get close and don't die in retrospect doesn't seem like there was but i will say like i don't think there was anything i would say explicitly wrong with this combat or with the previous combat um but i do think that there was maybe some rooms for improvement and maybe some room to do some interesting stuff that you can't do in every combat. Like, I think that that combat had a lot of interesting opportunities that weren't really gone after. And not just in a, oh, Matt didn't think of them sort of, sort of way, but in like a, it seemed like Matt did think of some of them. Um, but, uh, yeah, I'm not sure. I don't know. I don't know. It was, it was interesting. 
Uh, like, so the, the first note that I took that I, I still agree with, I think this combat is absolutely dripping with potential for an end switch where the combat essentially continues forever. Like enemies keep coming out of the rift until they complete some sort of objective. Uh, so think, uh, fucking the oblivion gates from, from oblivion. Like you have to get into the oblivion gate, do some objective until you do that. Enemies keep spawning. I'm not saying they need to go into the, the plane of fire, but maybe they need to do something around the portal and enemies will continue to spawn until they do so. Uh, maybe the fucking fire Ashari gave them like a little stabilization ball or something that they have to touch. They can't throw it. They have to touch it to the portal. Something like that. And I definitely thought that that's what was happening, and I just missed the objective when a new enemy spawned from the portal. But it was the only enemy that ever spawned. <laughs> so I don't know. My other theory, which could have been um, decent, uh, it, it, like as an alternate type of combat you could have run uh, within this general um, setup, is that one of the enemies say, like, the Fire Genie or the Salamander, like, one of those enemies has a enemy spawning ability that allows them to spawn enemies out of the, the portal. And so the objective is we need to kill everyone here because then enemies will stop spawning. But that also didn't seem like it was the case. <laughs> That also did not seem to be the thing. It, it, and if you're kind of confused about what I mean, think um, like the, the enemy drops from like Hell Divers, uh, the last combat in Dagger Heart, that sort of thing, where like enemies continue spawning throughout the course of the combat. Those types of combats, especially if it's like a summoning type thing where like existing enemies summon weaker enemies. So like maybe the salamander can summon fire elementals and the genie can summon salamanders. Maybe that might be a little bit too extreme, um, but something like that. Those combats are really interesting because a lot of times they stay very contentious the entire way through because essentially once you defeat, uh, until you defeat the summoners, the combat is going to be very risky, like you're constantly trying to keep the non-summoner enemies whittled down. There's a lot to do. And then the moment you kill the summoners, the combat basically stops. Because <laughs> you like the, uh, the summons will die so easily. Um, so it's a type of combat conceit that you can set up where the combat feels very, very contentious and then will just abruptly end. And sometimes that can be very much the type of tone that you're going after. Um, it can also make the combat, I think, feel good. Like there's a big kind of climactic moment when you kill the last summoner and then it's very easy, very quick cleanup. Um, sort of victory lap sort of, sort of thing. Um, so I thought that might have been what was going on. And to be entirely fair to Matt... That still might have been what was going on. Uh, it is very possible that that is absolutely what was going on and that the genie was the summoner, but they locked him inside of the orb. <laughs> and so he couldn't. Um, so that is that, that absolutely could have been the conceit of the combat, and it just doesn't seem like it because of, you know, how they addressed it. Um, so... Um, and then the portal started to expand. We went into a phase two. Very interesting. The phase two is another one. And I think what was, what, what may have gone on here is that Matt may have wanted to make the phase two a little bit faster so that they didn't go super over. You know, I know they always aim for two hours and, or three hours and they almost exactly hit it. Um, so maybe there was a bit more planned because Matt narrated two things where I was like, oh my God, that's such a cool idea. <laughs> and it was not like an idea that came from my head. It was an idea that like, it was like stuff that Matt said where I was just like, oh my gosh, that's so exciting. Um, where Matt narrated enemies, adversaries, I believe, like salamanders coming towards the portal 
And he also was like, um, he narrated like, hey, Keyleth, like you are participating in this. Essentially like taking up her action and her focus as a spellcaster. And I absolutely thought that the conceit of that second part of the combat might have been that the spellcasters maybe have to like dump slots, have to have to do some sort of ability checks. Like the spellcasters were going to go towards um, closing the portal, and then the marshals were gonna have to like form a ring around them and do a defense sort of style second phase where the salamanders are coming up. They're trying to interrupt the ritual. Um, sort of, again, sort of uh, the last combat in Daggerheart-esque um, where the spellcasters are, you know, making checks, dumping slots, trying to get the, uh, the portal closed and the marshals have to defend them. And something that, again, Matt narrated is the lava cooling up as the rift closed. He didn't have any sort of, you know, mechanical consequence. Like, it didn't matter that that was happening. But if you were in the middle of a defense-style combat and every time the portal, like, closes, another lava pool dries up. Or a fucking lava line, like, shortens in half or it gets, like, spots where you can cross or it just cools slightly to make it just, like, normal difficult terrain. That not only is interesting because you're progressively changing the battle arena, but it also makes the area harder to defend uh, from, you know, maybe enemies that can't as easily cross the lava. So, I mean, just such a cool idea for a second phase two of, like, this defense-style combat that gets progressively harder the closer they get to winning, like, the closer they get to, like, closing the actual portal... Super cool idea that I think was unfortunately like, you know, maybe if you're at home and you can keep going for an hour, maybe you can you can do that. But, you know, you got a guest, you're aiming for this three hours, it's a broadcast. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of, I think, factors that I don't know if that was Matt's plan, but even if it was probably, you know, need to make it shorter because of all those meta factors. Uh, the unfortunate reality of DMing is that super cool ideas sometimes fall super flat. I think this uh, fight falls into that category. Potentially, yeah. I think, um, and to, you know, wrap it back to the Frozen Sphere, I think to the players, honestly, that part of it, maybe didn't fall as flat as you might think as a viewer or as a DM. Again, when players use their resources and a fight feels easy after they very clearly use their resources, a lot of players dig that. So I don't even want to criticize Matt too much for that. And I think that the second battle arena was interesting. I think he had a good array of enemies. Like, and and I do I do think that you're right to a degree, Mister Stake, of like even the even a well designed combat can sometimes feel flat to watch. Sometimes it can feel flat to play. To defend Matt, I think that that combat was probably pretty fun to play. Ultimately, uh, the one before it, the the one before like they got close to the rift, like before they got to the fire genie. I think that one was probably not the most interesting, but also it was really fast. Um, it introduces Chris Hardwick's uh, class and what he can do. Uh, and I think that that's good. Having a tiny little small combat uh, so that the other players going into the larger combat know what Chris Hardwick does. Um, I think that's totally fair. Um, maybe you could have done some more with the battle arena, but it's not overly necessary. Um, and then I, I think that the phase two unfortunately, was probably a victim of time. Like, I think that there was a lot of missed potential in that combat, and it, or in that entire, like, combat, like, sequence of, com of, of things. Um, but honestly, I really, I don't blame Matt for any of it. And you guys know, if you've been watching me, I know some people are new, if you've been watching me, I am not always charitable to Matt. <laughs> there are many, many times where I've been like, nope, Matt should have done that better. Uh, <laughs> like, no, really, very few excuses. 
Um, but here, a lot of the stuff that I would classify as bad, I think we're ultimately out of Matt's control. Uh, Mega hates Matt confirmed. It's true. That's the title of the next episode. Um, <laughs> but yeah, ultimately, yeah, ultimately, I think that may have been one of the episodes where I'm like, wow, I think that Matt made consistently what I think are maybe some of the best decisions. Like maybe on average, I think that may have been a session where I can't think of anything I would have changed about the way that Matt ran it. <laughs> I I think he did really fucking good that entire session. Uh, and I can't think off the top of my head of, of any other sessions like that. <laughs> yeah. Which is so crazy. I know this is probably like a, it's a very weird episode with Chris and everything, but yeah, I, I just, I can't disagree with any way that he ran things. Hell hath frozen over. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's crazy. It's crazy. Uh, well, I guess with that um, positive note, we will uh, we'll end the uh, CR talk there. And um, let's talk about some context. Let's talk about maybe the um, uh, not so fun uh, things behind the seat. The, behind the seat. Behind the scenes. Uh, that might have been going on. So, I mean, first things first, I would I would assume, I would bet, uh, that if I just search Chris Hardwick controversy, I'll probably find that one pretty quickly. Let's see. Chris Hardwick uh, controversy. Uh, AMC suspends. Ooh, not a good one. Ah. I see. Uh, oh, the oh, right, right, right. Post session stuff. Post session stuff. Well, I guess we'll we'll get the headline and we'll dive into it later. So you're right. Post session stuff. Post session stuff. Uh, so what what was up with uh, what was post session stuff? Yeah, yeah. Very true. Very true. I guess it'll probably be pretty hard for me to research. So I'm just gonna go to this one. Let me know what's up. What happened? Uh, let me get the chat. Do, 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 do. There we go. Uh, Laura stole the broom and people came after her hard. Oh, wait, really? Why did people come after her hard? He's a guest player. She broke d, &D etiquette by stealing from another player. Ah, uh, that is, I don't know about that. I, like, people called it Broomgate? Dude. I mean, I am very against stealing from players. But Chris Hardwick isn't, isn't a player. He's a guest player. Like, very, and like, I guess... The line between that is, I guess, not there for some people, but like that's a that's a huge line. That's a that is a massive line of difference between like the things like how you have to operate with a guest player and how you have to operate with a with a guest player or with with, with a player versus a guest player. The 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 lines are hugely different. I thought it was funny more than anything. Uh, the drama was wild. Laura still gets shit for it for some from some circles. Dude, that's crazy. Man, I uh I mean, I'll say two things to that. Both in defense of Laura Bailey. Um Yeah, and and very weird considering, yeah, he seems very fine with it. Two things in defense of Laura Bailey. Number one, some player some tables are down with that. Like, I don't, I don't recommend it. I think it's, like, probably unlikely that if you, do, if you go to your home table and try to steal from another player, I think it's very unlikely that your fellow players are going to be down with that. But some tables are. So it's not like... But I can still hear an argument that, like, CR has, like, some manner of responsibility to not do things that, like is uh, are super super niche and probably won't work at most tables like probably aren't good at most tables um and second 
Yeah, he's a guest player. I don't know. That's the yeah. That's he, he's just a guest player. Like that's that's my long and short of it. Is like maybe you could argue that like you need an amount of like like you need an amount of um like ground rules when it comes to that sort of thing. But yeah, really, just not a big deal to me. Because it's not like he's coming back. It's not like it matters that he doesn't have that anymore. And if Matt doesn't want her to have it, then they can have a conversation about that off off table and be like, hey, he was a guest player. I didn't really expect you to steal from him. I don't blame you, but like, I'm not really prepped for you to have this item. It, it doesn't really work with some of my future plans. Like, maybe work in a scene where you give it back to him next session and we'll and we'll run that like i think if matt had a problem with it they absolutely could have just talked about it off table i do not think that it's something that i don't i don't even honestly i don't even really think that laura needed to run it by anyone first like maybe that's the most polite thing to do is to try to set up those ground rules ahead of time but no one was seemed uncomfortable with it which and this is a good example, again, of why having a safe word or the little red X card is important at tables is because if Chris was uncomfortable with that or if Matt was uncomfortable with that or if another player was uncomfortable with that, that's a good example of like something that may not go well at other tables that a red X is absolutely, like, that might have been a very appropriate use of the Red X. But I don't, <laughs> based on everything I've seen, I, I don't get any sort of sense that that was the case at this table. Um, and if it was, it is absolutely not something that people on Twitter needed to, uh, needed to yell at her about. Um, that is absolutely, like, an off-table discussion between her and Matt. Yeah. Uh, let's see. It was for sure funny, and the table was chill with it, but the internet tore her up. I am, a, I mean, I've said it before, and I, I want to stay consistent. We can't necessarily know that just based on the way that people react on screen is the way that they actually feel. I've, I've said this in the past for when the players uh, seem cool with things. Um, that I that I disagree with, and in this case, like we can't use the way that they look on camera or if they seem to be down with it um, as like a point of evidence. What we can do is say, "Hey, this is a pretty fucking minor thing," <laughs> and if someone did have a problem with it, they could easily talk to Laura off table and rectify it, like. I would I would understand if someone had did have a problem with it, didn't feel comfortable expressing that on camera, and they talked to her off table about it. You definitely need don't need to give uh the Laura shit for it. Like if someone had a problem, I think to a degree this is relatively benign in my book, and um they can talk to her about it off table. Um uh, I'm of the internet also attacks Kiki. So CR community has an unhealthy desire for IRL drama because there's so much game drama. I mean, I think that's fair. I, yeah, I, I sort of see that argument, but it's first and foremost, their game that we get to look into. Yeah, absolutely. Deadly. Uh, CR does lots of stuff that's niche that doesn't work at other tables. Also true. <laughs> also absolutely true. They shouldn't have to change for us unless it's blatantly problematic. And then it would uh, have already been bad to begin with. Yeah. I'm trying to look at every argument I can. I agree with your guys' rebuttals. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Matt actually made a comment on Reddit on Thursday night saying the hate was overblown. Great. It was either Thursday night or Friday night. Okay. Yeah, I mean, good. Uh, people also should have given her some grace considering she had no clue about it being a thing and this being her first campaign. Absolutely. That's why it's like, even even if... Even if this was something that was problematic and you 
I, I, somehow you felt like it was like irresponsible to display this behavior on stream. You say that to Matt and Matt handles it. You don't need to direct hate at a person for doing something that you disagree with or you think is irresponsible. You message the other people and say that. Or you even if you say it to her, you say it kindly. You give her grace. It is her first campaign. It's not like this is a repeated behavior. I mean, yeah. I think Warning. I think we're mostly Ad on incoming. the same page. Or not, not even cover. mostly. I think we're all probably on the same page. Yeah. Typically not typically proper etiquette, but I chalk it up to the reaction up to the internet needing something to rage against. I don't fully I don't disagree. Um, also, I think we just got an ad warning. Yeah, we have about 40 seconds left. Uh, I think we also have to consider that this is a table where people have done opposed checks for a variety of things. Absolutely. Yeah. They do opposed checks all the time. I, I totally agree. So to me, this always felt like a very minor thing, and I was shocked at how old school D&D bros reacted. Yeah, I mean, this is a table where they constantly incite each other or decept each other. Like, Grog and Vax have the whole prank war thing. Like them doing things to each other is not without precedent. Yes, no one's ever done this before, but it's not a huge leap. And and I think that she very reasonably could have assumed that it would be okay. And I think it probably was. But we don't know that. Uh, if your biggest career drama is being an adult taking an imaginary item from another adult, you're fine, champ. <laughs> She's fine. She's fine. All of the people who directed hate towards her suck. Suck eggs. <laughs> But yeah, no, she's awesome. <laughs> uh, there will be more about the situation next step. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm sure we'll talk about it more. Yeah. Uh, we're not sure to tell you more. Yeah, we can we can wait till next step. We can wait till next step. So yeah, we'll we'll close it out for now. That's ridiculous. That's stupid. Um, I I hope that they shut it down. I'm glad to hear that Matt did shut it down in the interim, or at least tried to. Uh, and we will see how they respond to it. We're going to take a quick ad break, and then uh, we're going to come back and talk about Chris Hardwick, Hardwick really quick, and then that'll be it. See you later. Do, do, do. I could link the video in the Discord. Oh, that'd be great, Theshel. That'd be great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's do that. Let's do that, Theshel. That'd be awesome. Yeah. All right. Ad time. I'm not.
All right, we are back. We are back. What's up, everybody? Um, yeah, let's uh, let's hear what good old Mike has to say. For uh, and uh, you said it's just the first two minutes, right? Uh, literally just the first two minutes. All right, sick. Um, oh yeah, I mean, I see, I see the, uh, disclaimer about Chris Hardwick. Yeah, 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 I see that. Okay, perfect. Interesting. Um, okay, cool. Let's do it. I'm Mike Christensen, and this is the series where we break down the lessons we can learn as GMs and as players. Also, if you are watching, <laughs> no unfortunate freeze frame. If you're watching and you somehow don't know, uh, Super GM, uh, friend of the channel, very cool dude. Uh, and, uh, also if, if this is a, any sort of concern, uh, has given me blanket, um, permission to react to any and all of his videos. Um, so, uh, oh, I spared him. Well, I have to spare my friends. Come on. Have to spare my friends. <laughs> Look, I'll leave Liam on a funny, uh, on a funny pause frame. I don't know the dude, but I, I've DM'd with Mike. We've done stuff together. I can't do it like that. Come on. <laughs> Mike Christensen, and this is the series where we break down the lessons we can learn as GMs and as players from episodes of Critical Role. Today we're tackling episode 46, Cinder Grove Revisited. This episode features a guest star, Chris Hardwick, the comedian, TV host, and founder of Nerdist, which at the time of this episode was basically a partner with Geek & Sundry. I think it was officially like a sister network. On a serious note, I would like to offer a disclaimer. As I mentioned at the end of the last episode, back in 2018, there was a Me Too allegation against Chris Hardwick, but considering that the accuser didn't identify him by name in her blog post and other people linked him to the story and he was briefly fired from everything, investigated and rehired when nothing could be proven, but that's primarily because the accuser didn't want to participate in the investigation because she wasn't actually interested in reprisal. That's why she didn't name him in the first place. Look, it's clearly a complicated situation with some lingering question marks left over. There are still episodes of another actual play show with Matt Mercer and Chris Hardwick that are not online anymore. So clearly someone at some point in that process felt the situation was still murky. To be completely candid, I don't know the truth. None of us do. And I don't bring this up to trash Chris Hardwick. We're not going to discuss these accusations in any depth today because it's not the subject of this video, but it is worth this disclaimer. I am going to include clips of Chris Hardwick throughout the episode and I have several positive things to say about his performance in this episode. Not completely uncritical, but some praise to give. Obviously, this is not in any way intended to excuse the sort of personal behavior he was accused of, and I certainly don't mean to imply that no one could justifiably feel that he caused them any harm or emotional distress, directly or indirectly. But I just wanted you to be aware of this topic in case it's a deal breaker for you for any reason. My philosophy is that I think we can and should learn whatever lessons we can from anyone, even potentially problematic people, because it helps avoid putting people on pedestals if we can demystify what makes them good at something. That's a core philosophy of my channel. But I can't draw that line for you as an individual. So if seeing him in this episode will put you off, or if you don't like the fact that I'm going to draw positive lessons from him, I understand if this video is not something you're going to be able to engage with or willing to watch, and that's okay. I think there are valuable lessons here, but again, my philosophy does not have to be yours. Now, with all that said, let's get on with the show. Well, damn, I got about nothing else to say. All right. That that uh, makes sense. Yeah, I'm not sure if there's anything to discuss. Yeah, I don't know that there is. Um, yeah, it's that his ex-girlfriend wasn't interested in going at him in an eye for an eye, according to herself. Yeah, yeah. It, it's, yeah. Yeah. I I think it is it is good to have the disclaimer. Obviously, I think it's I think it's better for Mike to put it at the beginning because he knows everything. He's you know got all of the context. So you know like any potential type of spoiler isn't bad for him or anything like that. Um, but yeah, I I don't have a ton to say. I I generally agree with everything that Mike said. I think it's very fair if uh, you don't, you know, want to engage with content that he's in, even though, you know, it's like, you know, nothing can be proven, whatever. It is it is obviously still murky. There's some amount of murk there. Um, and it is very fair to draw that line for yourself. Um, 
Okay. Yeah. That is uh Yeah. Ah shit. I think I mean Mike pretty much covered all of it. This is something that me and Mike have talked about offline is that we <laughs> so often uh even on things like he'll he'll sometimes message me uh and I'm I'm definitely not going to name specifics, but sometimes he'll message me and uh he'll be like, "Oh, I just watched X." Uh it was it was funny that you know chat didn't really get what you mean or they were arguing uh, because I instantly got what you meant and totally agreed. Um, me and him are just very often on the exact same wavelength, um, <laughs> and I think uh, I think I, I very much agree with his general philosophy. Um, concise, respectful, gives context. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I, I I really don't have anything else to add. I think that's a, that's a fair fair disclaimer. And I'll have to think uh, Mega's regular meetings with his patron confirmed. We DM, not as much since he had a baby, but <laughs> we chat, we talk. Um, how else would Mega get his powers? I see him in my dreams. We do dream sequences every night. Uh, <laughs> um, but uh, yeah. I think I think in future I'm trying to think of how I want to handle that in future because even like thinking about it and watching it I don't know that that would have well would that have biased my cuz I knew that something was up but I didn't know how serious or not serious it was so I think it did help not bias my perception of his play as much as if I would have known. But is it that much of a difference? I don't know. I'll have to think about it. I may or may not, um, if there's ever like another potentially controversial uh, guest player on, I might look uh, to see if like, you know, if, if Mike has any sort of disclaimer ahead of time, I might play that at the beginning of stream in future. I mean, fuck, maybe I'll even just leave the room uh, and play it for stream, and then, I don't know. I'll admit, it did bias me slightly, but I also generally found him annoying. I definitely, I could see it going either way with, with what, it, it's hard, it's, it's impossible to know how it would have affected me, because um, I honestly didn't find him that annoying until the very end. I think up until the end, I was I was pretty pretty neutral the positive on him um and then the very end did dip me into the negative um yeah i don't know i'll have to think about it i'll 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 probably have to um i might i might honestly talk to mike about it i don't know we'll see i used to watch talking dead so i was used to ch yeah there's i think there's a bit different i think he has a very different vibe as a host versus a guest because I also used to watch him on Talking Dead. Um, see, for me, it was the other way around. I watched this long before the situation broke, and I can honestly say that he just gave me gave me the ick. I get that. I very much get that, yeah. Uh, no bias, no real prior knowledge of him other than that Nerdist guy. Yeah. Yeah. I can see it. I, I can very much see. Yeah, like I said, he didn't give me any sort of ick until the end, and then he very much did. But, uh, yeah, I don't know. Hopefully this situation doesn't arise again too soon. Crossing my fingers. They're this sort of situation. Um, so hopefully I don't need to make a decision too quickly. Um, but I'm going to be thinking on this as to how I want to handle that. I've thought about a similar thing in reference uh, to like the sun tree scene. But it's a big one. Ew, fun. <laughs> I, I've thought about it in reference to, like, the sun tree scene of, like, I don't personally want to see any trigger warnings um, because I think I'll, I, I, I think I'll be, I'll be good. Uh, I don't have that many extreme triggers. Um, but the sun tree scene included, like, I mean, straight up child, like, hanging a child in effigy. Um, and so I am, 
And I know that even though it's a low percentage, there are people that watch this for the first time with me. It's not all people that are rewatching or that have seen it. I even got a comment uh, the other day that was like, oh, uh, my wife has watched C2, but she never got around to rewatching C1 or to, to watching C1 for the first time and she's watching it with you. So I know that there are absolutely people that have not seen C1 where a trigger warning might be a useful thing, but I don't want to see it. So I'll have to think about it more. I I'll have to I'll have to give this some more thought, especially now that it's, you know, maybe maybe come up again. Um, yeah, I'll think about it more. I'll think about it more. Uh, I'll, it'll it'll be on my mind. But with that, uh, you know, you could give a, us a list of CWs you think should be warned for. Maybe that pass that on to the disco, potentially. Yeah, I'm not gonna make a decision right now, but I've I've got a few things that I'm thinking about. And hey, this is the era of of uh, quality of life changes, of solidifying things. So I am the. This is exactly the sort of thing that I wanted to address in the next uh, week, two weeks, three weeks. Um, yeah. Okay. I think uh, I think that'll be about it. Good to have the context. I am very interested to see how they handle responding next week. Um, tomorrow is Daggerheart. Uh, tomorrow, Daggerheart 1.3. And Friday is finally finishing uh, Baldur's Gate. I swear, I promise, unless I get sick again. But crossing our fingers that we don't. Uh, so Daggerheart tomorrow, Baldur's Gate. And then back to Critical Role on Monday. All righty, everyone. Hey, two full episodes. Two full episodes. We did it. No dropped frames, I think. Uh, yup. Look at that. No dropped frames. I think we figured it out. I'm feeling more and more confident that we figured it out. So have a good night. I know I'm going to sleep like a baby knowing we didn't drop any frames. Knock that wood. <laughs> Big win. Uh, and I will see you all maybe tomorrow, maybe Friday, maybe next week. Have a good one. Goodbye.